Preface to A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Preface to A Student's History of American Literature. In the preparation of this book, the author has followed, in the main, the principles embodied in A Student's History of English Literature, published in 1902. Less reference has been made, however, to the historical setting, it being assumed that the student is well acquainted with the history of his own country. The author has tried to present the story with directness, omitting what seemed unessential or of minor importance avoiding the technical both in criticism and in vocabulary, and attempting in the arrangement of material to find a plan as simple and clear as possible, believing most emphatically that a course in the history of our literature should in no degree supplant the study of its masterpieces, but contribute rather to the enjoyment and correct appreciation of them, he has sought not only to interest his readers in the personal narratives of men and women who have created our literature, and are still creating it, but through the suggestions for study or reading, also to encourage actual acquaintance with the works that compose that literature. Many of the reference books mentioned in the text will be of more value to the teacher than to the pupil, and the experienced instructor will make more frequent use of illustration than of critical comment. It would be gratifying if our principal authors were represented in every school library, and if one such author could be read entire by each student in the course. At all events, the library habit should be cultivated and the search for illustrative selections encouraged. Stedman and Hutchinson's Library of American Literature, Stedman's An American Anthology, and similar collections are of the greatest value. Whitcomb's chronological outlines of American literature can be used to excellent advantage in noting the productions of specific years. The current volume of Who's Who in America is our one reliable source of information concerning living writers. Especially to be commended are the chief American poets and American songs and lyrics, both edited by Curtis Hidden Page. The former book, which contains in a single volume the great body of our best American verse, ought to be in continuous use throughout the course. Finally, let no teacher of American literature consider it a part of his professional duty to depreciate or deprecate the work of our American writers. It represents a substantial and respectable achievement it may well inspire a reasonable patriotic pride in the minds of our youth. It is, at the present time, as full of promise for literary art in the future as is the national literature of any land. End of Preface Part 1 of Chapter 1 of a Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 1. Early Colonial Literature, 1607-1700. Part 1. The English in Virginia. Captain John Smith, William Strachey, George Sandys. The story of a nation's literature ordinarily has its beginning far back in the remoter history of that nation, obscured by the uncertainties of an age of which no trustworthy records have been preserved. The earliest writings of a people are usually the first efforts at literary production of a race in its childhood, and as these compositions develop, they record the intellectual and artistic growth of the race. The conditions which attended the development of literature in America, therefore, are peculiar. At the very time when Sir Walter Raleigh, a type of the great and splendid men of action 
who made such glorious history for england in the days of elizabeth was organizing the first feudal efforts to colonize the new world english literature which is the joint possession of the whole english-speaking race was rapidly developing sir philip sidney had written his arcadia first of the great prose romances and enriched english poetry with his sonnets edmund spencer had composed the shepherd's calendar christopher marlowe had established the drama upon heroic lines and shakespeare had just entered on the first flights of his fancy when in sixteen o six king james granted to a company of london merchants the first charter of virginia sydney and spencer and marlowe were dead shakespeare had produced some of his greatest plays the name of ben johnson along with other notable names had been added to the list of our great dramatists and the philosopher francis bacon had published the first of his essays these are the familiar names which represent the climax of literary achievement in the elizabethan age and this brilliant epoch had reached its full height when the first permanent english settlement in america was made at jamestown in sixteen o seven on new year's day the little fleet commanded by captain newport sailed forth on its venturesome and romantic enterprise the significance of which was not altogether unsuspected by those who saw it depart michael drayton one of the most popular poets of his day later poet laureate of the kingdom sang in quaint prophetic verses a cheery farewell you brave heroic minds worthy your country's name that honors still pursue go and subdue while loitering hinds lurk here at home with shame and in regions far such heroes bring ye forth as those from whom we came and plant our name under that star not known unto our north and as there plenty grows of laurel everywhere apollo's sacred tree you it may see a poet's brows to crown that may sing there this little band of adventurers in regions far disembarked from the ship's discovery good speed and susan constant upon the site of a town yet to be built fifty miles inland on the shore of a stream as yet unexplored in the heart of a vast green wilderness the home of savage tribes who were none too friendly it was hardly to be expected that the ripe seeds of literary culture should be found in such a company or should germinate under such conditions in any notable luxuriance the surprising fact however is that in this group of gentlemen adventurers there was one man of some literary craft who while leading the most strenuous life of all efficiently protecting and heartening his less courageous comrades in all manner of perilous experiences compiled and wrote with much literary skill the picturesque chronicles of the settlement captain john smith the mainstay of the jamestown colony in the critical period of its early existence was a true soldier of fortune venturesome resolute self-reliant resourceful withal a man of great good sense and with the grasp on circumstances which belongs to the men of power his life since leaving his home on a lincolnshire farm at sixteen years of age had been replete with romantic adventure he had been a soldier in the french army and had served in that of holland he had wandered through italy and greece into the countries of eastern europe and had lived for a year in turkey and tartary he had been in russia in germany in spain and in africa and was familiar with the islands of the mediterranean and those of the eastern atlantic smith afterward wrote a narrative of his singularly full and adventurous life not sparing apparently the embellishment which in his time seems to have been reckoned a natural feature of narrative art the honesty of his statements has been doubted perhaps to the point of injustice and at the present time a reaction is to be seen which presents the writings of the sturdy old adventurer in a more favorable light it was natural enough that such a daring rover 
should catch the spirit of enthusiasm with which the exploration and settlement of the new world had inflamed englishmen of his time and type and it was a recognition of his experience and practical sagacity which led to his appointment as a member of the council at the head of affairs in the jamestown colony in so far as the literary accomplishments of captain john smith have any immediate connection with american history our interest centers upon his true relation of such occurrences and accidents of note as hath happened in virginia since the first planting of that colony which is now resident in the south part thereof till the last return from thence london 1608 smith's writings are plain blunt narratives which please by their rough vigor and the breezy picturesqueness of his rugged unaffected style hardly to be accounted literature except by way of compliment the true relation is not unworthy of its place in our literary record as the first english book produced in america it supplies our earliest chronicle of the perils and hardships of our american pioneers the romantic story of pocahontas is found in its pages briefly recounted by the writer in terms which hardly warrant its dismissal as a myth and many another thrilling incident of that distressing struggle with the wilderness which makes a genuine appeal to the reader now as it undoubtedly did to the kinsmen of the colonists in england for whom the book was originally prepared smith was the author of several other narrative and descriptive pamphlets in which he recounted the early history of the colonies at plymouth and on massachusetts bay indeed it was the redoubtable captain who first gave to that part of the country the name new england and to the little harbor on cape cod before the coming of the puritans smith had already given the name of plymouth in sixteen twenty four he published a general history of virginia a compilation edited in england from the reports of various writers another interesting chronicle of this perilous time was written in the summer of sixteen ten by a gentleman recently arrived at jamestown after a stormy and eventful voyage this vivid narrative called a true repertory of the rack and redemption of sir thomas gates knight upon and from the islands of the bermudas is coming to virginia and the estate of that colony was written by william strachey of whose personality little is known the tremendous picture of shipwreck and disaster is presented in a masterly style the clouds gathering thick upon us and the wind singing and whistling most unusually a dreadful storm and hideous began to blow from out the northeast which swelling and roaring as it were by fits some hours with more violence than others at length did beat all light from heaven which like an hall of darkness turned black upon us prayers might well be in the heart and lips but drowned in the arteries of the officers nothing heard that could give comfort nothing seen that might encourage hope the sea swelled above the clouds and gave battle unto heaven sir george somers being upon the watch had an apparition of a little round light like a faint star trembling and streaming along with a sparkling blaze half the height from the mainmast and shooting sometimes from shroud to shroud tempting to settle as it were upon any of the four shrouds and for three or four hours together or rather more half the night it kept with us running sometimes along the main yard to the very end and then returning it being now friday the fourth morning it wanted little but that there had been a general determination to have shut up hatches and commending our sinful souls to god committed the ship to the mercy of the sea no wonder that when strachey's little book printed in london fell into the hands of william shakespeare this dramatic recital of the furious storm which drove the virginia fleet on the reefs of the still vexed bermuths should have inspired the poet in his description of the tempest evoked 
by prospero of his enchanted island so other narratives were written and other chronicles compiled by these industrious jamestown settlers but their chronicles and reports were largely official documents prepared for the guidance of the company's officers in london and for the general enlightenment of englishmen at home nowhere among them do we find the ring of that resounding style which makes literature of strachey's prose it did not seem likely that thus early in virginia history any laurels would be gathered from apollo's sacred tree to crown a poet's brow as drayton had pleasantly predicted in his lines of farewell yet after all among these gentlemen adventurers who continued to come from england in increasing numbers there arrived in sixteen twenty one as treasurer of the virginia company one who was recognized as a poet of considerable rank george sandys author of an excellent metrical translation of the first five books of ovid to Sandus also, Drayton, now laureate, had imparted a professional benediction, exhorting his friend with appreciative words. Let's see what line Virginia will produce. Go on with Ovid. Entice the muses thither to repair, and treat them gently, train them to that air, and amid the exacting duties of his position, in a most discouraging time, in experiences of privation and distress amid the terrors of indian uprising and massacre he went on with ovid after four years of strenuous life in the new america sandys went home to england with his translation of the metamorphosis completed and in sixteen twenty six presented his finished work to the king it was a notable poem was so accepted by contemporaries and afterward elicited the admiration of dryden and of pope thus came the first expression of the poetic art in the new world the first utterance of the conscious literary spirit articulated in america we record with interest these few literary appearances in the annals of our early history but we can in no sense claim these writers as representatives of our native american literature smith strachey and sandys were englishmen temporarily interested in a great scheme of colonization after a brief sojourn in the colony they returned to england they were not colonists they were travelers and while their compositions have a peculiar interest and are not without significance for us they cannot be accounted american works the record of virginia's early struggles its difficulties with the indians its depletion by illness and famine its losses due to the incapacity of leaders and policies ill adapted to the conditions of a true colonial life its reinforcements its acquisitions of colonists its advancement in wealth and importance this is familiar history the remarkable fact is the rapidity with which the colony developed in sixteen nineteen twelve hundred settlers arrived along with them were sent one hundred convicts to become servants boys and girls picked up in the london streets were shipped to virginia to be bound during their minority to the planters in the same year a dutch man-of-war landed twenty negroes at jamestown who were sold as slaves the first in america the cultivation of tobacco became profitable the plantations were extended and new colonists were brought over in large numbers following the execution of charles i and the establishment of the puritan protectorate hundreds of the exiled cavaliers migrated to virginia with their families and traditions these new colonists stamped the character of the dominion that was to be the best blood of england was thus infused into the new enterprise and the spirit of the south was determined in sixteen fifty the population of virginia was fifteen thousand twenty years later it was forty thousand yet the southern soil did not prove favorable to literary growth english books were of course 
brought into the colony and private libraries were to be found here and there in the homes of the wealthy there were no free schools in virginia and but few private schools the children of the planters received instruction under tutors in their own homes or were sent to england for their education for fear of seditious literature printing presses were forbidden by the king in sixteen seventy one governor berkeley declared i thank god there are no free schools nor printing and i hope we shall not have these hundred years for learning has brought disobedience into the world and printing has divulged them and libels against the best of governments god keep us from both of original literary accomplishment there was little or no thought until well on in the eighteenth century two or three vigorous pamphlets published in england not long after sixteen fifty are interesting as voicing the first decided utterances of a genuine american spirit in the southern settlements john hammond a resident in the newer colony of maryland visiting his old home in sixteen fifty six became homesick for the one he had left in america it is not long since i came from thence he said nor do i intend by god's assistance to be long out of it again it is that country in which i desire to spend the remnant of my days in which i covet to make my grave his little work entitled leah and rachel the two fruitful sisters virginia and maryland was written with a purpose to show what boundless opportunity was afforded in these two colonies to those who in england had no opportunity at all End of Part 1 of Chapter 12 of chapter one of a student's history of american literature by william simons this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter one early colonial literature sixteen o seven to seventeen hundred part two pilgrims and puritans in new england historical and descriptive writers william bradford john winthrop francis higginson william wood thomas morton in the northern settlements conditions socially and intellectually were very different from those existing in the south the men who colonized new england represented a unique type their ideals their purpose were essentially other than those which inspired the settlers at jamestown and the later colonizers of virginia the band of pilgrims who landed from the mayflower at plymouth in december sixteen twenty were not bent on mere commercial adventure lured to the shores of the new world by tales of its fabulous wealth they were not in search of gold they were looking for a permanent home and had brought their wives and children with them their ideals were of the most serious sort their deep religious feeling colored all their plans and habits of life the pilgrims were a congregation of separatists or nonconformists who had already endured hardness for conscience sake before they had ever left the old home under the leadership of the rev john robinson and elder william brewster they had fled to holland in sixteen o eight for ten years this community of englishmen had lived peacefully in the dutch city of leiden earning their own living and enjoying the religious liberty they craved but they felt themselves aliens in a foreign land and saw that their children were destined to lose their english birthright after long deliberation they determined as pilgrims to seek in the new continent a home where they might still possess their cherished freedom of worship while living under english laws and following the customs and traditions of their motherland this company of men obtained a grant from the london company under the same charter as that which had been given to the virginia colony they finally set sail from plymouth in england september sixteenth sixteen twenty it was in the early winter when the mayflower sighted the shores of cape cod the story of new england's trials 
first told in the narrative of Captain John Smith, is as romantic as that of the Jamestown colony, and even more impressive. Of the forty-one adult males who signed the famous compact on board the Mayflower, only twelve bore the title of gentlemen. They were a sober-minded, sturdy band of true colonizers, familiar with labor, and inspired with the conviction that God was leading them in their difficult way. Although half the colony perished in the rigor of that first winter, for which they had been wholly unprepared, the spirit of the pilgrims spoke in the remarkable words of their leader, Brewster. It is not with us as with men whom small things can discourage or small discontentments cause to wish themselves at home again the companies of settlers who followed the pilgrims within the next few years were composed of the same sturdy independent class of thoughtful high-minded men they were puritans for the most part well-to-do prosperous people Many of them had been educated in the universities and brought the reverence for education with them. If God make thee a good Christian and a good scholar, thou hast all that thy mother ever asked for thee, said a Puritan matron to her son. The colonists, who within the next fifty years dotted the New England coastline with their thrifty settlements, were idealists. As Professor Tyler puts it, they established not an agricultural community, nor a manufacturing community, nor a trading community. It was a thinking community. Moral earnestness characterized every action. In 1636, the General Court of Massachusetts voted to establish a college at Newtown. John Harvard, dying two years later, bequeathed his library and half his estate to the school which was then named Harvard College, in his honor. In 1639, the first printing press in America was set up at Cambridge, as Newtown was then named out of compliment to the numerous graduates of the English university, then settled in this vicinity. The colonists had their grammar schools, which prepared for college, and by 1650 public instruction was compulsory in four of the five New England colonies, Rhode Island being the exception. The earliest literary efforts among the New England colonists, like the beginnings in Virginia, were historical and narrative writings, some in the form of journals, a few more ambitious, representing real attempts at formal history. William Bradford, for whom the title Father of American History may well be claimed, was a native of Yorkshire, and at seventeen, a member of the Reverend John Robinson's famous congregation, fled with his brethren into Holland. He was prominent among the pilgrims at the time of their arrival in America, and at thirty-two was elected governor of Plymouth. Until his death, he continued to fill this honorable office, except as he was permitted to break the period of his service for intervals at five several times. Bradford was a plain, sensible, truthful man, an able leader under severe conditions. He felt the immense significance of what was then taking place, and sought to provide a record which should preserve a faithful picture of the settlement. No sooner had the Mayflower sighted land than Bradford began conjointly with Edward Winslow to keep a journal of all occurrences. This journal was carefully continued to the end of the first year. Ten years after the arrival, Governor Bradford began his notable History of the Plymouth Plantation, on which he labored for twenty years. His purpose, as he avowed, was to write in a plain style, with singular regard unto the simple truth in all things. His story goes back to the persecutions in England, and details the causes of the flight into Holland describes the sojourn there, and explains the reasons for the second exodus to the shores of the New World. What follows consists of a contemporaneous narrative of the experiences of the colony. Set down in simple chronicle, without much regard to proportion or unity, 
but the unmistakable touch of his own homely, honest personality and the vigor of his blunt, realistic style impart a distinct literary flavor to this primitive history of Plymouth, which adds to its obvious value as the first detailed report of the New England settlements. An illustration is found in the writer's account of the pilgrims and their perilous situation upon their arrival in the new world being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land they fell upon their knees and blessed the god of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth their proper element but here i cannot but stay and make a pause and stand half amazed at this poor people's present condition and so i think will the reader too when he well considers the same being thus past the vast ocean and a sea of troubles before in their preparation they had now no friends to welcome them nor ends to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies no houses or much less towns to repair to to seek for succor it is recorded in scripture as a mercy to the apostle and his shipwrecked company that the barbarians showed them no small kindness in refreshing them but these savage barbarians when they met with them were readier to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise and for the season it was winter and they that know the winters of that country know them to be sharp and violent and subject to cruel and fierce storms dangerous to travel to known places much more to search an unknown coast besides what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men and what multitudes there might be of them they knew not neither could they as it were go up to the top of pisgah to view from this wilderness a more goodly country to feed their hopes for which way soever they turned their eyes save upward to the heavens they could have little solace or content in respect of any outward objects for summer being done all things stared upon them with a weather-beaten face and the whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage hue if they looked behind them there was the mighty ocean which they had passed and was now a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world may not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say our fathers were englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness but they cried unto the lord and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity let them therefore praise the lord because he is good and his mercies endure forever the manuscript of bradford's history has itself had a rather interesting story at the death of its author it fell to the possession of his nephew edward morton who made liberal use of it in his own new england's memorial sixteen sixty nine it then came into the hands of rev thomas prince who wrote a chronological history of new england seventeen thirty six during the occupation of boston by the british troops in seventeen seventy five through seventy six the manuscript was lost with many other valuable documents preserved in prince's library which was in the tower of the old south church in eighteen fifty five this valuable document was discovered in the library of the bishop of london was copied and published in this country and in eighteen ninety seven the original itself was restored to america it is kept in the massachusetts state library at the state house in boston among the company of english puritans who in sixteen thirty settled on the shore of massachusetts bay the foremost figure was that of john winthrop already appointed governor of the colony his family was well known in his hometown of suffolk a family of property and position winthrop himself was a man of noble character a conscientious puritan yet catholic in spirit beyond some of his associates 
possessing the tastes and accomplishments of culture during his voyage to america he had busied himself in the composition of a little treatise which was characteristic of this broad-minded man a model of christian charity is the title of his essay and in it he presents a plea for the exercise of an unselfish spirit on the part of all the members of this devoted band now standing on the threshold of an experience which could not but be trying in the extreme on the nerves and temper of all we must be knit together in this work as one man was his cry john winthrop's history of new england is the contemporaneous record preserved in his journal of occurrences in the colony observed by him or reported to him the busy governor made a brave effort to keep up with the march of events notwithstanding the press of official duties which more than filled his days he persevered with his journal which commences with the beginning of the voyage and comes down to a date only some few weeks previous to his death in sixteen forty nine there are gaps in the chronicle and a significant brevity in the records of particular incidents some of these records passing from the trivial to the pathetic with ludicrous conciseness a cow died at plymouth and a goat at boston with eating indian corn the fact is recorded as faithfully as a previous item mentioned with spartan brevity my son henry winthrop was drowned at salem in the following passage we get a curious glimpse into the puritan mind the pathos of the original note is almost lost in the unconscious humor of the historian's wise deductions mr hopkins the governor of hartford upon connecticut came to boston and brought his wife with him a godly young woman and of special parts who was fallen into a sad infirmity the loss of her understanding and reason which had been growing upon her diverse years by occasion of her giving herself wholly to reading and writing and had written many books her husband being very loving and tender of her was loath to grieve her but he saw his error when it was too late for if she had attended her household affairs and such things as belonged to women and not gone out of her way and calling to meddle in such things as are proper for men whose minds are stronger etc she had kept her wits and might have improved them usefully and honorably in the place god had set her he brought her to boston and left her with her brother one mr yale a merchant to try what means might be had here for her but no help could be had there are more momentous records than these in the annals and winthrop's history shares with that of bradford in interest and in importance through these straightforward plain-spoken men we get our clearest vision of the rugged hazardous pioneer life its heroism its fortitude its romance its curiously contradictory display of self-sacrificing sympathy and fanatical intolerance its superstition and narrowness its petty trials and large tribulations its splendid faith its aggressive energy of zeal it is well for the student of literature as for the student of history to feel the spirit of these early new england histories just as the virginia settlers developed on the fertile plantations of the south a civilization which reflected the aristocratic traditions of the cavaliers so on the rock-bound coasts of massachusetts bay these northern colonists stamped their descendants with the grave stern persistent type of puritan character there were not wanting in the colony those who found delight in studying and describing the natural wonders of this new land the impressive grandeur of the forest the fertility of the virgin soil nature's luxuriant abundance redeemed from the wilderness the strange picturesqueness of the savage natives the wild things of the woods so much that was new and wonderful in their environment all this made its appeal to the imagination of some among these hard-headed practical pioneers such an one was reverend francis higginson fifteen sixty seven to sixteen thirty 
a gifted and eloquent man who came from england in sixteen twenty nine to serve the community at salem as its minister it was in june that the voyagers landed and the glories of a new england summer colored the impressions of the newly arrived clergyman with a primeval splendor he had written a narrative of his voyage and now he began a description of the country itself his little book of observations is a bright and genial picture under the title new england's plantation it was published in london in sixteen thirty a sup of new england's air is better than a whole draught of old england's ale declares its author the woods the flowers the plants delighted him here are also abundance of other sweet herbs he wrote delightful to the smell whose names i know not and plenty of single damask roses very sweet even the stern rigidity of the puritans could bend above the beauty of the sweetbriar and gratefully inhale its fragrance the chill breath of the new england winter does not blight his enthusiasm the great hearth fires in the cabins and the inexhaustible supply of wood to feed the flames rejoice his heart there is good living for those who love good fires he exclaims something of a naturalist was william wood who published in sixteen thirty four his new england's prospect an interesting description of the country in which he had made his home a little of a poet also he enlivened his account by putting some of his observations into verse as for example the beasts be as followeth the kingly lion and the strong-armed bear the large-limbed mooses with the tripping deer quill-darting porcupines and raccoons be castled in the hollow of an aged tree the skipping squirrel rabbit purblind hare immured in the self-named castle are concerning lions i will not say that i ever saw any myself but some affirm that they have seen a lion at cape ann which is not above six leagues from boston some likewise being lost in woods have heard such terrible roarings as have made them much aghast which must either be devils or lions there being no other creatures which used to roar saving bears which have not such a terrible kind of roaring no record of early new england life can fail to take account of the experiences of thomas morton a royalist who in sixteen twenty six established himself with some thirty boon companions on an estate not far from the plymouth settlement the presence of this lively neighbor proved anything but agreeable to the strict and godly residents of plymouth and of boston who were scandalized by the goings-on at marymount here were sports and revelings which were viewed by the puritans with consternation and then with righteous indignation when morton's little company had increased to a considerable number for varied congenial spirits had been added to the group these stern moralists rose in their wrath hewed down with axe and sword the lofty maypole around which their rollicking neighbors had rehearsed the dances and revels of merry england and banished morton with his followers from the country back in his native land he wrote his new english canon sixteen thirty seven turning the shafts of ridicule upon his victorious enemies while the work in itself is of slight importance the incident is a diverting one and gives a humorous glow to the sober-hued picture of this sombre puritan age end of part two chapter one part three of chapter one of a student's history of american literature by william simons this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter one early colonial literature sixteen o seven to seventeen hundred part three the new england clergy thomas hooker thomas shepherd john cotton nathaniel ward roger williams john elliot the mathers among a people constituted in temper like the puritans a people with whom religion was life and whose life 
even on its temporal side, was closely identified with religion, it was natural that religious ideas should find constant expression in literature. This we have seen to be true in the historical narratives of Bradford and Winthrop. The Puritan writers are always impressed with the spiritual significance of their conquests in this new canon. Even the most casual accidents of pioneer experience are interpreted as filled with divine purpose. John Winthrop soberly records the fact that in his son's library of a thousand volumes, one which contained the Greek Testament, the Psalms, and the Book of Common Prayer, bound up together, was found injured by mice. Every leaf of the common prayer was eaten through, not a leaf of the other portions was touched, nor one of the other volumes injured. A marvelous providence, this, clear enough in its indications. So Edward Johnson, not an educated man, but a farmer and a ship carpenter, who had been active in the founding of Woburn in 1640, wrote his wonder-working providence of Zion's Savior in New England. 1654. For the Lord Christ intends to achieve greater matters by this little handful than the world is aware of. The colonists are soldiers under the divine leader. They must not tolerate the existence among them of a single disbeliever. They must take up their arms and march manfully on till all opposers of Christ's kingly power be abolished. Thus spake Puritanism on the side of its austerity and fanaticism. There was in New England one class of men who, by natural aptitude and by training, were well fitted to be heard from on religious topics. These were the ministers. As the village church, or meeting-house, was the center geographically, morally, and socially of every New England community, so the minister was, usually, the dominating force among his townspeople, maintaining the high dignity of the sacred calling with a manner which commanded a deference amounting to awe. Not only was his authority recognized on the purely religious questions of daily life, not only was his voice reverently heard as he preached for hours from the high pulpit on Sunday, but the New England minister was the natural leader of his flock in every field. He gave counsel in town affairs. He directed the political policy of his people. In cases of disagreement, the minister was usually the mediator and the final court of appeal. The greater part of the New England ministry were educated men of noteworthy gifts. The majority were graduates of the English universities. Many of them had been distinguished for their eloquence and piety, before the religious persecution of Charles and his ministers had driven them forth to find religious liberty elsewhere. Three strong thinkers and eloquent preachers are usually mentioned as conspicuous among these early colonial ministers. Thomas Hooker, Thomas Shepard, and John Cotton, all three were graduates of the same college at Cambridge. All were Puritan preachers in England until compelled to flee for their lives because of the hostility of Bishop Land. Hooker had escaped into Holland, and in 1633 followed in the track of those who had crossed the ocean before him. He became the minister at Cambridge. Three years later, he led a colony of 100 families through the wilderness into the beautiful Connecticut Valley and founded the town of Hartford, 1636. Here, until his death in 1647, Hooker wrote and preached and molded the life of his parish. His power in the pulpit is said to have been wonderful. Many of his sermons were published. He wrote numerous treatises on theological and spiritual themes. It is significant of the impression left by Hooker on his contemporaries that an English clergyman affirmed that to praise the writings of Hooker would be to lay paint upon burnished marble or add light unto the sun. Rev. Thomas Shepard arrived in America in 1635, succeeding Hooker in Cambridge, where he preached until his death in 1649. Unlike the stalwart Hooker, whose physical strength and bodily energy matched his intellectual stature, Shepard was an invalid 
He was, however, a profound scholar and a soul-melting preacher. His writings are not voluminous, but they exercised a strong influence even after his death. His diction is imaginative and forceful, with a rugged force of Puritan vigor. God heweth thee by sermons, sicknesses, losses, and crosses, sudden death, mercies, and miseries, yet nothing makes thee better. Death cometh hissing, like a fiery dragon, with the sting of vengeance in the mouth of it. Then shall God surrender up thy forsaken soul into the hands of devils, who, being thy jailers, must keep thee till the great day of account, so that as thy friends are scrambling for thy gods and worms for thy body, so devils shall scramble for thy soul. On the same ship which brought Thomas Hooker to America came John Cotton, most noted of these three men. For nearly twenty years he had served the parish of St. Bottles in Boston in Lincolnshire, and was known far and wide for his aggressive spirituality. In 1633 he discovered that he was no longer safe in his native land. The principal colony on Massachusetts Bay had longed for him. In compliment to him, its members adopted the name of Boston, and John Cotton became the foremost minister in New England. A most universal scholar, a living system of the liberal arts, and a walking library, as his grandson, Cotton Mather, described him. John Cotton wrote many theological treatises, and engaged in bitter controversies. He was a laborious student. Near him, as he studied, stood a sand glass, which would run four hours. This glass, thrice turned, was the measure of his day's work. This he called a scholar's day. His writings lacked the picturesque imagery of Hooker and Shepherd. His style is lifeless now, but he carried prodigious weight among his contemporaries and was the foremost champion in the theological battles of his age. Among the more noteworthy publications of these scholastic writers was a singular book which appeared in London in 1647. Its author was Nathaniel Ward, a Cambridge graduate and retired minister who lived at what is now the town of Ipswich in eastern Massachusetts. His work is quaintly addressed under the title of The Simple Cobbler of Agawam in America. Upon the title page, in accordance with seventeenth-century custom, the author explains his purpose at considerable length as, Willing to help mend his native country, lamentably tattered both in the upper leather and sole, with all the honest stitches he can take and as willing never to be paid for his work by old english wanted pay it is his trade to patch all the year long gratis therefore i pray gentlemen keep your purses by theodore de la garde this picturesque book full of pungent wit directs its satire at what its author deemed the follies and perversions of his day the allegory of the cobbler is not maintained much beyond the title page himself a refugee from religious persecution he expresses the usual puritan intolerance of all independent opinion the state that will give liberty of conscience in matters of religion must give liberty of conscience and conversation in their moral laws or else the fiddle will be out of tune and some of the strings crack nathaniel ward's simple cobbler voices with characteristic fervor the utterance of puritan bigotry but there was in the colony one powerful champion of religious tolerance who constitutes one of its most attractive figures. This was Roger Williams, an independent among the independents. Born in Wales, a university man and a clergyman in the Church of England, he had turned nonconformist and appeared in Plymouth Colony in the usual way. In 1633, two years after his arrival at Plymouth, Williams went to Salem to be the minister there, but his teachings were altogether too radical to suit his stern and narrow-minded Puritan brethren. He preached a real liberty of thought and worship, even for Baptists and Quakers. 
taught that it was unrighteous to rob the Indian of his land and to treat captives with cruelty, and maintained that the state's authority did not extend over the individual conscience or opinion. Roger Williams was one of those who proclaimed the truth so far in advance of the conceptions held by those about them that they seemed to be living years before their proper time. He was banished from Massachusetts in 1636, and making friends with the Pequot Indians, he planted on Narragansett Bay the settlement of Providence. Williams revisited England several times, and was no inconspicuous figure there. He knew Milton, and had the friendship of Cromwell. It was on one of these visits that he wrote his first important treatise on soul liberty the bloody tenant of persecution for cause of conscience this was published at london in 1644 the year in which milton's areo pagitica a plea for the freedom of the press appeared williams bloody tenant was the beginning of a famous literary battle between himself and that belligerent puritan defender john cotton who in 1647 published his reply in the bloody tenet washed and made white in the blood of the lamb the final rejoinder came from roger williams in the bloody tenet yet more bloody by mr cotton's endeavor to wash it white in the blood of the lamb and with this brief summary of the encounter between these two keen-minded argument-loving minds their blows delivered in what williams called a sharp scripture language, we may well afford to take our leave of Puritan controversy. The attitude of the Englishman toward the native inhabitants of America has long been marked with injustice and dishonor. The precarious situation of the colonists, surrounded by fierce and savage tribes, naturally produced occasion for the display of savage passions on the part of the white man as well as on that of the Indian. The horrors of war and massacre that redden the early annals of colonial history were, no doubt, due in part to the indiscretions and encroachments of the superior race. Someone has said of the Puritan pioneers that, first they fell upon their knees, and then they fell on the aborigines. As we have seen, Roger Williams declared boldly for a different policy and his own methods with the savage peoples were well illustrated in the comparative peace and prosperity of his settlement in rhode island another peacemaker is discovered in the gentle personality of john elliot the apostle to the indians who came to boston in sixteen thirty one and devoted his life to the conversion of the children of the forest whom he regarded as descendants of the lost tribes of israel he studied their native tongue, preached to them, converted many, and organized his converts in little churches of their own. He wrote several books of minor importance, but he is to be remembered as a translator of the entire Bible into the Algonquin tongue. It was a tremendous task, and a remarkable achievement. He published the New Testament in 1661, and the Old Testament in 1663. It was the first Bible in any language printed in British America. This translation of the scriptures into the vernacular of a people who had no written language, done largely by candlelight after days devoted to exacting work in his Roxbury parish, is a most remarkable monument to Apostle Eliot's laborious industry and his missionary zeal. The scholarly attainments of colonial Puritanism have been amply shown by this record of the new england ministry in the literature of the time the history of a single family furnishes our most conspicuous and most curiously interesting illustration of scholastic eminence and its position in popular regard through three generations the mathers in grandfather son and grandson appear as brilliant intellectual leaders of the massachusetts clergy the first of the dynasty richard mather an oxford graduate who arrived in boston in sixteen thirty five was one of that conscientious puritan brotherhood that of necessity sought a refuge and a field for spiritual conquest in the new world 
he became the minister at Dorchester. My brother Mather is a mighty man, Thomas Hooker said of him. Although he was a prolific writer, it is sufficient here to recall the fact that Richard Mather's name was the one appended to the preface of the old Bay Psalm book. Four of Richard Mather's six sons became ministers. It was, however, through increase Mather that the chief inheritance of scholarly gifts was transmitted. The father's eloquence was more than equaled by the son's. His Puritan zeal, his love of learning, his industry in the production of pamphlets and books, brought the name of Increase Mather into greater prominence than Richard Mather's vigorous quill had done. For fifty-nine years he served as minister of the North Church in Boston. He added some ninety titles to the list of colonial publications, the majority representing discourses prepared for his congregation. Perhaps the only one of his books, sufficiently vitalized by human interest to be noted today, is An Essay for the Recording of Illustrious Providences, 1684, in which the piety, pedantry, and superstition characteristic of the religious scholar in that age are curiously mingled. This collection of strange visitations and marvelous deliverances was designed for the pious entertainment and spiritual comfort of its readers. It is one of the most interesting of these early American classics, and like so many of the works previously cited, affords a vivid glimpse into the Puritan mind. For sixteen years, Increase Mather served as president of Harvard College. The clerical succession of this remarkable family was continued in the third generation by the most illustrious representative of the line. Under this stone lies Richard Mather, who had a son greater than his father, and eke a grandson greater than either. Thus ran a quasi-epitaph, composed after the death of Cotton Mather, with intent to honor his achievements. Nor was this paternal relationship the only source of hereditary influence. The famous John Cotton, contemporary of Hooker and Shepherd, was his grandfather on his mother's side. It was in memory of that stalwart champion that Cotton Mather received his baptismal name. All the accumulated piety and learning of his distinguished ancestry seemed to reside in this extraordinary man. His intellectuality was abnormal. He has been not inappropriately termed the literary Vienna of New England. He had read Homer at ten years of age, and at eleven was admitted to Harvard College. He took his first degree at fifteen. At seventeen he began to preach, and soon afterward became associate with his father in the pastorate of the North Church in Boston, a connection which lasted for forty years. In his religious life he became abnormal also. At times he lay for hours on the floor of his study in spiritual agony. He fortified himself for the conflict with error by fasts and vigils. His speech was full of pious ejaculations. When he saw a tall man, he prayed, Lord, give that man high attainments in Christianity. Let him fear God above many. And each trivial act was the source of some devout meditation. Unhappily, Cotton Mather is most often remembered as a leader in the pitiful persecution of the unfortunate people accused of witchcraft at Salem in the last decade of the century. His memorable providences relating to witchcrafts is 1691, and Wonders of the Invisible World, 1693, contain curious records and much interesting matter relative to satanic possession, ideas which were firmly believed at the time not only in New England, but very generally throughout Europe also. The most remarkable thing about Cotton Mather's literary career is the number of his writings. Four hundred or more titles are included in the catalogue of his works. Many of them are fantastic treatises, grotesquely named, representing the vagaries of Puritan thought. Many are sermons delivered on special occasions. Three or four are interesting little books. One familiarly known under the title Essays to Do Good, was cordially praised by Benjamin Franklin. 
who declared to the son of the writer that as a youth he had derived great benefit and inspiration from the book. But the great work, the magnum opus of Cotton Mather's prolific industry, was the famous Magnalia Christi Americana, or Ecclesiastical History of New England, from its first planting in the year 1620 unto the year of our Lord, 1698. Something over a thousand pages of closely printed matter is included in the seven parts or volumes of this monumental work. The planting of New England and its growth, the lives of its governors and its famous divines, a history of Harvard College, the organization of the churches, a faithful record of many wonderful providences, and an account of the wars of the Lord, being in a history of the manifold afflictions and disturbances of the churches in New England. Such is the scope of the Magnalia Christi Americana, or the great acts of Christ in America. It begins like an epic. I write the wonders of the Christian religion, flying from the deprivations of Europe to the American strand, and, assisted by the holy author of that religion, I do, with all conscience, of truth, required therein by him, who is the truth itself, report this wonderful displays of this infinite power. Wisdom, goodness, and faithfulness, where, with his divine providence, hath irradiated an Indian wilderness. The style is pedantic and artificial, but the spirit of the writer is perfectly sincere. Now and then the narrative grows simple and strong, there is a frequent use of Old Testament phraseology, which indicates a clear perception of its poetical value. Such, for example, is the account of Hannah Dustin's thrilling experiences among the Indians at Haverhill in 1697. This is the story of the woman's daring escape from captivity. She heartened the nurse and the youth to assist her in this enterprise, and all furnishing themselves with hatchets for the purpose, they struck such home blows upon the heads of their sleeping oppressors that or they could any of them struggle into any effectual resistance. At their feet they bowed, they fell. Where they bowed, there they fell down, dead. The Magnalia, completed in December 1697, was published at London in 1702. It stands fitly enough as the last important literary effort of 17th century colonial Puritanism. Already there were indications of a change in the current of New England religious life. The old extreme Puritan doctrines were in a decline, and Mather's huge volume was a final utterance in defense of the Father's faith. Not only had there come a change in the form of thought, in the style of literary expression the change was as notable. English writers no longer followed the models of the later Elizabethan essayists. Their fantastic phraseology had been displaced by the direct and forceful diction of Bunyan and Dryden. The easy, natural style of Addison, Steele, and Swift was giving a new charm to English prose. Cotton Mather lived throughout the first quarter of the eighteenth century, but in all essential respects in personality and in utterance. He belongs wholly to the seventeenth, the consummate product of the old Puritan theology. He stands as the last important representative of the type in American literature. End of Part 3, Chapter 1《A Student's History of American Literature》by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 4. Puritan Poetry in New England. Bay Psalm Book. Anne Bradstreet. Michael Wigglesworth. The Puritans were not susceptible to the charms of poetry. The strenuous life of the pioneer left little time for cultivating any of the arts, and the spirit of New England was too serious and too stern to permit indulgences in what was merely pleasant or beautiful. Even after the first critical years of danger and struggle were past, the intellectual life of the people was bounded by the narrow limits of religious discussion 
in theological debate. That the Puritan was not without imagination, however, is abundantly proved by the forceful figures and impassioned rhetoric of the prose writers whom we have been considering. Moreover, some of these same men did occasionally slip into rhyme. William Wood has been quoted. Even John Cotton was the author of verses, halting and rough-hewn, and full of the queer conceits which were common at the time. It is significant that this pious man wrote much of his verse in the pages of the household almanac, where it remained hidden from the public eye, and sometimes he disguised its metrical character by inscribing it in Greek. Much ingenuity was expended upon epitaphs and obituary tributes, so solemn a theme as that of death justifying poetical expression. If there were any opportunity to play upon the name of the deceased, the opportunity was gracefully seized. When the Reverend Samuel Stone, the successor of Thomas Hooker at Hartford, died in 1663, his colleagues vied with one another in their fervid appreciations of his virtues. He was compared to the stone which Jacob set up and called Ebenezer, and also to the stone with which David slew Goliath. He was termed whetstone that edified the obtusest mind, lodestone that drew the iron heart unkind. And this within the compass of a single epitaph. One quotation will serve to show the skill with which these versifiers were sometimes able to conquer the difficulties of rhyme. Here lies the darling of his time. Mitchell expired in his prime, was four years short of forty-seven, was found full ripe, and plucked for heaven. If poetry be rare among our forefathers, it is nevertheless true that the first English book printed in America passed for poetry with them and for poetry of an edifying and noble type. The whole book of Psalms, commonly known as the Bay Psalm Book, was printed on the new press at Cambridge in 1640. This work, designed to provide a metrical version of the Psalms of David to be used in the churches, contains the joint efforts of three New England ministers, the chief divines in the country, Richard Mather of Dorchester, Thomas Weld, and John Eliot of Roxbury. The preface, written by Mather, declares that, It hath been one part of our religious care and faithful endeavor to keep close to the original text. If, therefore, the verses are not always so smooth and elegant as some may desire or expect, let them consider that God's altar needs not our polishings, for we have respected rather a plain translation than to smooth our verses with the sweetness of any paraphrase, and so have attended conscience rather than elegance, fidelity rather than poetry. In illustration of the art displayed by these divines in their paraphrase, historians have invariably cited some of the most atrocious of the compositions. This seems hardly fair. The following examples are sufficient to show the average result of the sad mechanic exercise of these godly men. I in the Lord do trust. How then to my soul do ye say, as doth a little bird unto your mountain fly away? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, their arrows they prepare on string to shoot in dark at them, in heart that upright are. From paraphrase of Psalm 11. Praise ye the Lord, praise God, in a place of holiness. O praise him in the firmament of his great mightiness. O praise him for his acts that be magnificent. And praise ye him according to his greatness excellent. With trumpet praise ye him. That gives a sound so high. And do ye praise him with the harp and sounding psalteries. Psalm C. 1 the student may be sure that he will find many worse compositions in this collection. It is doubtful if he will find smoother. And yet the Bay Psalm book served its sacred purpose in the New England churches for more than a century. 
It was even used to some extent by Puritan worshippers in England and Scotland until after 1750. At the Old South Church in Boston, the Bay Psalm Book, although it has been revised, was not displayed until 1786. From the midst of the crude and somber compositions of Puritan verse-makers, there arose one writer for whom, in some measure, the poetical gift may be claimed. This was Anne Bradstreet. In 1650, the first volume of her poems was published in London. Upon the title page of this volume, the author was rather extravagantly introduced as the Tenth Muse lately sprung up in America. Anne Bradstreet, a really gifted woman, was the daughter of Thomas Dudley, a Puritan soldier and scholar, who had been described as a typical narrow-minded straight-laced Calvinist, for whom it is so much easier to entertain respect than affection. Nevertheless, Anne Dudley was reared in comfort and enjoyed especially the dear delight of books. She was married at sixteen to Simon Bradstreet, a Puritan gentleman who afterward became a leader in colonial affairs and a governor of massachusetts in sixteen thirty the entire family joined the company of immigrants to america thomas dudley holding the position of deputy governor under winthrop the bradstreets settled near the present town of andover not far from the beautiful merrimack for this young wife accustomed to an atmosphere of comfort and refinement the experiences of pioneer life must have been trying in the extreme yet in the wilderness amid its threatening perils superintending the work which falls to the mistress of a farm rearing and educating her eight children mrs bradstreet found comfort in literary occupation and both time and spirit to write the quality of her mind is shown in her prose but it was as a poet that she found fame in her verse she is influenced by the work of such of the english poets as would naturally have impressed her the devotional poems of john donne of francis quarles author of the divine emblems of the puritan poet george wither and the deeply spiritual poetry of the saintly george herbert the verse of these minor english poets who flourished in the time of james and charles i the period of anne bradstreet's girlhood and early womanhood was characterized by an unusual and fantastic style of thought and diction these men are sometimes called the metaphysical poets because of this artificial quality and on account of their grotesque conceits the crude rhymes of the colonial epitaphs already quoted with their incongruous puns are rather extreme examples of this fantastic style the work of the tenth muse shows the influence of this taste for a strained and laborious ingenuity of expression her longer works are didactic so filled with the eager purpose to instruct and edify that the natural puritan scruples regarding a woman's practice of the literary art were in large degree forgotten the four elements and the four seasons are in the form of dialogue wherein the speakers individually maintain their claims to preeminence these poems are mechanical and heavy compositions but show a facility of phrase and rhythm quite new to the readers of colonial verse the four monarchies her most ambitious poem is a rhyming chronicle based upon sir walter raleigh's history of the world when anne bradstreet's poems were published in sixteen fifty they were received with extravagant praise in america and following her death not a few of her admirers essayed to express their appreciation in flattering verse john rogers who before his death became president of harvard college paid his tribute to the genius of anne bradstreet in quite exalted utterance one stanza of his composition may be quoted in testimony to the effect produced in contemporary minds of literary taste by this gifted woman's work twice have i drunk the nectar of your lines which highly sublimed my mean-born fantasy flushed with these streams of your moronian wines above myself rapt to an ecstasy methought i was upon mount hybla's top there where i might those fragrant flowers lop whence did sweet odours flow and honey spangles drop 
Let us now read a few stanzas written by Anne Bradstreet herself, taken from her best-known and most attractive poem, Contemplations. It was written late in her life, at her home in Andover, and is properly described as a genuine expression of poetic feeling in the presence of nature. I heard the merry grasshopper then sing, the black-clad cricket bear a second part, they kept one tune and played on the same string, seeming to glory in their little art. Shall creatures object thus their voices raise, and in their kind resound their makers praise, while I, as mute, can warble forth no higher lays? Under the cooling shadow of a stately elm, close sate I by a goodly river's side, where gliding streams the rocks did overwhelm, a lonely place with pleasures dignified. I, once that loved the shady woods so well, now thought the rivers did the trees excel, and if the sun would ever shine, there would I dwell. While musing thus with contemplation fed, and thousand fancies buzzing in my brain, the sweet-tongued Philomel perched o'er my head, and chanted forth a most melodious strain, which racked me so with wonder and delight, I judged my hearing better than my sight, and wished me wings with her a while to take my flight. A few months before Anne Bradstreet's death, she composed the following lines, which illustrate the aspirations of Puritanism in their noblest form. As weary pilgrim now at rest, hugs with delight his silent nest, his wasted limbs now lie full soft that miry steps have trodden oft pleases him to think upon his dangers past and travails done as pilgrim i in earth perplexed with sins with cares and sorrows vexed by age and pains brought to decay and on and my clay house mouldering away oh how i long to be at rest and soar on high among the blessed. While well, Mrs. Bradstreet's verse, at its best, exhibits the highest poetical accomplishment of seventeenth-century Puritanism in New England, there was one other Puritan versifier whose inspiration appealed yet more strongly to contemporary minds. This most popular of early American poets was Reverend Michael Wigglesworth, minister at Malden, Massachusetts, author of a tremendous and dismal epic, surcharged with the extreme Calvinism of the time. This masterpiece of Puritan theological belief is entitled The Day of Doom. It was published in 1662, and for a hundred years remained, as Lowell expresses it, the solace of every fireside in the northern colonies. This long and desolate composition is an imaginative account of the last judgment. The voice of the trumpet is heard summoning the living and the dead before the dreadful bar. Some hide themselves in caves and dells and places underground. Some rashly leap into the deep to escape by being drowned. Some to the rocks, oh, senseless blocks, and woody mountains run, that there they might this fearful sight and dreaded presence shun. In this jingling ballad measure, so strangely inappropriate to a solemn theme, the reverend author pursues his gloomy way. It is not well to linger over this grotesque presentation of medieval art and logic. Yet it is through these crude expressions of the early literature that we are brought in closest touch with some phases of the Puritan mind. First we are given the appeals of the condemned, the children argue with reference to Adam's fall. Not we, but he ate of the tree, whose fruit was interdicted, yet on us all of his sad fall, the punishments inflicted. How could we sin that had not been, or how it is his sin without consent, which to prevent we never had a power? The reply is heard that Adam stood not for himself alone, but for all mankind, that had he done well instead of ill, all would have shared in his benefits, nor would they have then protested that they deserved not to share therein, on the ground now urged. The inexorable judge 
does, however, yield a point in mercy to the children and infants. Yet, to compare your sin with their who lived a long time, I do confess yours in much less, though every sin's a crime. A crime it is, therefore, in bliss you may not hope to dwell, but unto you I shall allow the easiest room in hell. The glorious king thus answering, they cease and plead no longer. Their consciences must needs confess his reasons are the stronger. Much of Wiggleworth's vision is too lurid to be described here. Such raw strength as he applied in painting the details of his fiery picture but intensifies the horror of it, and increases our wonder that such conceptions could have prevailed. It is interesting to remember that at the very time when the Malden minister was writing his day of doom, John Milton was engaged upon the real epic of Puritan faith, one of the masterpieces of all literature. Paradise Lost was published in 1667. It was but a decade thereafter that John Bunyan completed his beautiful religious allegory pilgrim's progress but the puritanism of new england its narrowness and hardness no doubt intensified by the isolation and perhaps the depression incident to life in a comparatively rude and struggling colony was represented by the zealot michael wigglesworth with his sing-song verse and the stern ascetic cotton mather with his laborious and often fantastic prose it was eminently fitting that when Wigglesworth died in 1705, the author of the Magnalia should have preached his funeral sermon. The two stand appropriately together. They taught the same doctrine, and in their two great representative works, they exhibit the literary attainment of colonial America in the 17th century. The following books will be found especially helpful for reference and for supplementary reading. John Fiske's Old Virginia and Her Neighbors, Beginnings of New England, George P. Fisher's The Colonial Era, American History Series, R. G. Thwaites' The Colonies, Epics of American History. The one authoritative work on early American literature is Moses Coit Tyler's Monumental History of American Literature During the Colonial Time, two volumes. For teachers and advanced students of the subject, Professor Tyler's books are invaluable. In Stedman and Hutchinson's Library of American Literature are to be found extended selections from the works of all these early writers. This excellent library should be in every school and in constant use for illustration during the course. The series of Old South leaflets published by the Old South Historical Society, Boston, Massachusetts, contains reprints of various papers of interest notably a description of new england by john smith number one hundred twenty one manners and customs of the indians from the new england canaan by thomas morton number eighty seven the lives of bradford and winthrop by cotton mather number seventy seven bradford's memoir of brewster number forty eight roger williams letters to winthrop number fifty four Bradford's History of the Plymouth Plantation, with a report of the proceedings incident to the return of the manuscript to Massachusetts, was printed and published by the State at Boston in 1901. The Lives and Times of Francis Higginson and Bradstreet and Cotton Mather have been presented in recent interesting biographies. The Scarlet Letter by Hawthorne, F. J. Stimson's King Noant, Mary Johnston's To Have and to Hold, with other standard works of fiction dealing with this colonial period, may be read with great advantage also. End of Part 4 Chapter 1this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter 2. The Eighteenth Century. Part 1. The First Half of the Century. The Personal Touch. Samuel Sewall. Mrs. Knight. Ebenezer Cook. William Byrd. Jonathan Edwards.
in the study of literature there is nothing more gratifying than the discovery of an author who has unconsciously put himself visibly into his book two or three american writers wrote thus amiably at this period of our colonial history and their works form an interesting and welcome group the most prominent of these was judge samuel sewall who arrived in america in sixteen sixty one and settled at newbury he was a conspicuous man in the massachusetts colony and became the chief justice of massachusetts like his friend cotton mather he was involved in the witchcraft delusion and was one of the judges who condemned the victims to death his repentance his dramatic confession of error and his annual fast are familiar tradition it should be remembered also that in a little book the selling of joseph seventeen hundred judge sewell wrote the first published argument against slavery from sixteen seventy three to seventeen twenty nine samuel sewell kept a diary and thereby left for generations of readers to come one of the most frank and unconventional records of the time the publication of this journal shows that it is worthy of a place with that of samuel pepys pronounced pepys of london whose celebrated diary covers the decade of sixteen fifty nine to sixty nine the social life of colonial new england is most happily illustrated in sewall's memoranda and the stiff stateliness of the stern old puritan type loses at least its solemnity when we read the judge's record of his unavailing suit for the hand of madame winthrop october sixth seventeen twenty a little after six p m i went to madame winthrop's she was not within i gave sarah chickering the maid two pence juno who brought in wood one pence afterward the nurse came in i gave her eighteen pence having no other small bill after a while dr noyes came in with his mother mrs winthrop and after his wife came in they sat talking i think till eight o'clock i said i feared i might be some interruption to their business dr noyes replied pleasantly he feared they might be an interruption to me and went away madame seemed to harp upon the same string she had previously declared that she could not break up her present home must take care of her children could not leave that house and neighborhood where she had dwelt so long i told her she might do her children as much or more good by bestowing what she laid out in housekeeping upon them said her son would be of age the seventh of august i said it might be inconvenient for her to dwell with her daughter-in-law who must be mistress of the house i gave her a piece of mr belcher's cake and gingerbread wrapped up in a clean sheet of paper told her of her father's kindness to me when treasurer and i constable my daughter judith was gone from me and i was more lonesome might help to forward one another in our journey to Kennan. mr eyre came within the door i saluted him asked how mr clark did and he went away i took leave about nine o'clock the judge's suit did not prosper october twenty one friday my son the minister came to me p m by appointment and we prayed for one another in the old chamber more especially respecting my courtship about six o'clock i go to madame winthrop's sarah told me her mistress was gone out but did not tell me whither she went she presently ordered me a fire so i went in having dr sibbs bowels with me to read i read the first two sermons still nobody came in at last about nine o'clock mr john eyre came in i took the opportunity to say to him as i had done to mrs noyes before that i hoped my visiting his mother would not be disagreeable to him he answered me with much respect when twas after nine o'clock he of himself 
said he would go and call her. She was but at one of his brothers. A while after, I heard Madame Winthrop's voice inquiring something about John. After a good while and clapping the garden door twice or thrice, she came in. I mentioned something of the lateness. She bantered me and said I was later. She received me courteously. I asked when our proceedings should be made public. She said they were like to be no more public than they were already. Offered me no wine that I remember. I rose up at eleven o'clock to come away, saying I would put on my coat. She offered not to help me. I prayed her that Juno might light me home, also opened the shutter, and said twas pretty light abroad. Juno was weary and gone to bed. So I came home by starlight as well as I could. At my first coming in, I gave Sarah five shillings. I writ Mr. Eyre his name in his book, with the date October twenty first, 1720. It cost me eight pence. Jehovah Jireh. Among the most interesting personal narratives of this period is the journal of Sarah K. Knight, which contains a lively account of a journey from Boston to New York made by this adventurous lady in 1704. Madame Knight was thirty-eight years of age, a native of Boston. She made the trip on horseback and was five days on the way between Boston and New Haven. The distance between New Haven and New York occupied two days. The story is eloquent of the inconvenience and peril to which colonial travelers were subject, but the charm of the narrative is due to the vivacious personality of its author and to her abounding sense of humor, which broadly illuminates the oddities of human nature encountered in the wilderness. To the student, as to the general reader, these bright and lively narratives of actual life are far more attractive than essays in more formal history. In their power to revive the past, they are far superior. The South as well as the North is represented thus in the same period. Born on a beautiful estate at Westover, Virginia, William Byrd became one of the most prominent and useful of those who served that colony at the beginning of the 18th century. He was also its wittiest writer, if not its most accomplished scholar his education he received in england as was customary with the youth of the south and he was admitted to the english bar after further travel in europe he returned to virginia he filled various official positions and became famed as the master of westover where he maintained a princely hospitality in seventeen twenty nine his duties assigned him to an expedition which fixed the boundary between Virginia and North Carolina, and a narrative of this expedition Byrd wrote in the form of a journal. It was not until 1841, however, that the Westover manuscripts were published. The history of the dividing line, as its author called it, is a picturesque and racy account of an interesting experience. It was a laborious task, this of running the line of division from a point on the coast six hundred miles westward through a country wild and almost unknown and which traversed the great dismal swamp in the gayest of spirits the journal records the daily experiences of the expedition vivaciously describing the locality with its denizens both wild and tame an historical sketch of virginia is included in the narrative wherein Byrd humorously sets off the shortcomings of the first colonists. About a hundred men, most of them reprobates of good families. Another journal, entitled A Progress to the Mines, contains the account of a trip taken in 1733. There was no lack of historical writings in the colonies during this period of their growth. A young Virginian, Robert Beverly, studying in london was shown the text of a work upon the british empire in america and was so disturbed by its inaccuracies that he himself prepared a history of virginia which was honest and readable beverley's history was published in london in seventeen o five and again 
enlarged and revised in 1722. Reverend William Stitt, 1689 to 1755, president of William and Mary College, published in 1747 his first part of the history of the first discovery and settlement of Virginia, bringing his narrative down only to 1624. He never carried the work further. It is based directly upon, quote, the excellent but confused materials, unquote, of Captain John Smith, of whom Stith adds loyally, I take him to have been a very honest man and a strenuous lover of truth. One other book dealing with the picturesque aspect of Southern life at this time is worthy of notice. It was one entitled The Sought Weed Factor, or A Voyage to Maryland, published at London in 1708. The name of its author, Ebenezer Coke, appears on the title page, but of him we know nothing. He may have been an American. He may have been merely an English visitor to our shores. However, his work is a lively contribution to the literature of the period, and presents in rough and ready rhyme a coarse but realistic satire of the writer's adventures among the tobacco agents, the saltweed factors of Maryland. He asserts his purpose to describe the laws, governments, courts, and constitutions of the country, and also the buildings, feasts, frolics, entertainments, and drunken humors of the inhabitants. His style may be inferred from these opening lines, condemned by fate to wayward curse, old friends unkind and empty purse, plagues worse than filled Pandora's box, I took my leave of Albion's rocks, with heavy heart concerned that I was forced my native soil to fly, and the old world must bid good-bye. Freighted with fools, from Plymouth Sound to Maryland, our ship was bound. Returning to New England, we find once more the intellectual leader of his age among the ministers. Jonathan Edwards was not only a great scholar and one of the most noted theologians of the century in which he lived, but one of the most brilliant logicians that our country has ever produced and in the literature of philosophical study he is still a commanding figure edwards was born in connecticut and was graduated from yale college at seventeen after a brief connection with that institution as a tutor he became pastor of the church in northampton massachusetts where he remained until seventeen fifty when he resigned his charge and engaged in missionary work among the indians in the western part of the colony. In 1758, he was called to the presidency of Princeton College and died within a few weeks after his installation. In the records of Edward's precocious childhood, in the breadth of his interests, and in the scope and energy of his scholastic labors, there is much that recalls the phenomenal career of Cotton Mather, but there was no real resemblance in the men. Mather was ponderous, Edwards was profound. When a boy of twelve, Jonathan Edwards was an acute observer of nature, and wrote for a naturalist in England an account of his observations on spiders. This interest in natural science he maintained in mature years. He advanced a theory of atoms. He demonstrated that the fixed stars are suns, he made interesting studies on the growth of trees and on the formation of river channels. He studied the principles of sound, the cause of colors, and the tendencies of winds, and anticipated Franklin's discovery of the nature of the lightning. Edward's sermons have acquired a fame not altogether desirable, perhaps, but almost unique in the recognition of their power. His most noted sermon, preached at Enfield, massachusetts in seventeen forty one on the theme sinners in the hands of an angry god was so terrifying in its immediate effect that the people bowed in agony and the noise of their weeping and their cries obliged him to call for silence that he might be heard edwards became recognized as a defender of calvinism 
at a time when strong opposition was developing against it. He was one of the conspicuous leaders in the great revival movement in the forties, known as the Great Awakening, the religious movement in which the famed English preacher George Whitfield was a prominent figure. It is, however, as the author of an extraordinary book entitled An Inquiry into the Freedom of the Will, the Jonathan Edwards holds his position in American letters. This work is a defense of the Calvinistic doctrines of for ordination, original sin, and eternal punishment. It is a masterpiece of philosophical reasoning, and although in the broadening of men's minds the old theological ideas have been greatly modified, the freedom of the will is still recognized as a profound work and has a definite place in the literature of theological discussion. It has been called the one large contribution which America has made to the deeper philosophic thought of the world. Jonathan Edwards was intensely spiritual, an intellectual saint. The presence of an inner light glows in his refined and delicate features. A deep poetical temperament underlies his spiritual thought. His imagination revels in beautiful figures. Holiness makes, quote, the soul like a field or garden of God, with all manner of pleasant flowers, enjoying a sweet calm and the gently vivifying beams of the sun. The soul of a true Christian appears like such a little white flower as we see in the spring of the year, low and humble on the ground, opening its bosom to receive the pleasant beams of the sun's glory, rejoicing as it were in a calm rapture diffusing around a sweet fragrancy standing peacefully and lovingly in the midst of other flowers round about all in like manner opening their bosoms to drink in the light of the sun so that when we are delighted with flowers meadows and gentle breezes of wind we may consider that we see only the emanation of the sweet benevolence of jesus christ when we behold the fragrant rose and lily, we see his love and purity. So the green trees and fields and singing of birds are the emanation of his infinite joy in benignity. The easiness and naturalness of trees and vines are shadows of his beauty and loveliness. The crystal rivers and murmuring streams are the footsteps of his favor, grace, and beauty. When we behold the light and brightness of the sun, the golden edges of an evening cloud, or the beauteous bough, we behold the adumbrations of his glory and goodness. And in the blue sky of his mildness and gentleness, there are also many things wherein we may behold his awful majesty. In the sun, in his strength, in comets, in thunder, in the hovering thunder cloud, in rugged rocks, and the brows of mountains. That beauteous light with which the world is filled in a clear day is a lively shadow of his spotless holiness and happiness and delight in communicating himself. Unquote. End of part one of chapter two. Part Two, Chapter Two of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Two, Part Two Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790. Next to Washington, the most conspicuous and widely useful of Americans throughout the eighteenth century, was Benjamin Franklin. He was perhaps the most typical American of his time. Certainly he was the most versatile man of affairs, and the most picturesque in personality of all that distinguished group who helped to guide the nation in that troubled age. Through the second quarter of the century he lived the quiet life of a thrifty, sagacious man of business, 
at the same time taking a practical interest in matters of public moment and presenting the most original model of good citizenship that can be found his contribution to american literature the larger portion of which belongs to this earlier period of his career is not great but it is noteworthy benjamin franklin was born in boston in seventeen o six of typical puritan stock his father josiah franklin who had come from england in sixteen eighty five was a soap boiler and candle maker at the sign of the blue ball near the south meeting house he had his little shop where he sold his soap and candles benjamin was the fifteenth in a family of seventeen children and while the opportunities for formal education were not promising josiah franklin a man of sound understanding was ingenious in providing means to improve the minds of his children at table he discussed useful topics for their benefit benjamin he designed for the ministry and at eight years of age he sent him to school within the year however he was compelled to withdraw his boy from the school and soon after set him to work in the shop cutting wicks for the candles filling the molds and running errands this work proved distasteful and after some efforts to find a trade that the boy would like ben was apprenticed to his brother james who owned a printing business it was a fortunate choice and here for a time he throve from his earliest childhood franklin had a passion for books so soon as he could read he had waded through the small library a musty collection of treatises on divinity which he found on his father's shelves with his first spending money he bought the works of john bunyan in separate little volumes and these he later sold in order to buy richard burton's historical collections small and cheap in forty volumes among his father's books he discovered a copy of plutarch's lives which he read abundantly a volume of defoe an essay on projects and that little work by cotton mather known as essays to do good franklin afterward recalled as having given a turn to his thinking which directly influenced him in the principal events of his later life he now obtained other books and by chance secured an odd volume of the spectator this became not only a source of delight but by an ingenious system of his own devising it also became a means of instruction and the art of expression and in no small degree helped him to acquire a sound literary style in seventeen twenty one james franklin the brother to whom benjamin had been apprenticed began to publish a newspaper the new england current one of the first in the colonies to this paper articles were sometimes contributed by acquaintances who were interested in the project it was not long before the printer's apprentice got the idea that he too could write readable articles but suspecting that if he were known to be their author his brother would refuse to print his pieces ben wrote the papers in a disguised hand and slipped them under the door of the printing office at night when these articles were read the boy had the pleasure of hearing them approved by gentlemen who visited the office and guesses made as to their authorship once when james franklin was arrested on account of some indiscreet utterance regarding public affairs in his newspaper and compelled to undergo brief imprisonment the conduct of the paper was turned over to benjamin who managed it alone and with success however the brothers did not get along well together there were differences and disputes and in seventeen twenty three when seventeen ben ran away to raise a little money he sold his books slipped secretly aboard a sloop and after three days sail found himself in new york he was without acquaintance recommendations or resources other than the knowledge of his trade his shrewd practical sense and the sturdy self-reliance developed by his experience in the past franklin did not secure employment in new york but hearing that printers were needed in philadelphia he proceeded to that city the familiar sketch of franklin as an awkward youth 
trudging along Market Street, a large roll under each arm and hungrily devouring a third, dates from this period. He describes the scene himself, and says that a Miss Reed, his future wife, who was standing in her father's doorway, saw him pass in this guise, and commented on the uncouth appearance. In Philadelphia, Franklin soon found work at one of the two printing shops then established in the town, and before long received some flattering notice from the governor of the colony, Sir William Keith. This gentleman proposed that Franklin set up business for himself, promising him the government printing, and suggesting that he go to England to secure equipment for the office on the governor's endorsement. Highly elated, Franklin set out on his errand, but only to find that he had been grossly deceived. His supposed patron was discovered to be without credit or other means to fulfill his promise of assistance, and thus again thrown on his own resources, this time in the city of London, the young American settled down to work at his trade. Eighteen months Franklin now spent in London, accumulating experience, some of which he afterward deplored, and all the while establishing himself in habits of study, industry, and thrift. He returned to Pennsylvania in 1726, as yet but twenty years of age and not inadequately prepared for a picturesque and important career. The story of Franklin's life as a citizen of Philadelphia is a record of successful enterprise and practical philanthropy. Again engaged in printing, he developed a profitable business and, in 1729, purchased a newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette recently established by a business rival. Just previous to this transaction, Franklin had written a series of humorous and satirical sketches, which he called the Busybody Papers. These appeared in the issues of another Philadelphia paper, which preceded the Gazette. Soon after his return from England, Franklin organized an association, which he called the Junto. It was composed of a few earnest young men of serious purpose and literary tastes who met regularly to discuss important themes debate public questions and in a general way to seek means of self-improvement out of this society grew several interesting developments in time similar clubs were organized each presided over by one of the original members of the junto the existence of which was to some extent a secret. The usefulness of the institution was thus extended, and at the same time a means of influence was established, which under the shrewd management of its founder materially helped Franklin in the furtherance of his ideas. While his private interests prospered as a result of his shrewd practical policy, Franklin's activity was by no means restricted to these. The same principles of industry thrift and common sense he applied as opportunity offered in matters affecting the comfort and common good of all it was at his instance that the first organized system of police protection displaced the old method of the city watch he organized the first volunteer fire department and by his efforts the service of a state militia was inaugurated at his suggestion the members of the junto joined in buying books for their use in common and established a library which was the beginning of the circulating library system in america in seventeen forty four franklin organized the philosophical society of philadelphia and five years later succeeded after considerable effort in founding an academy for the education of the youth of the state out of this academy grew the university of pennsylvania many minor improvements in municipal methods also came through his suggestion and persistent advocacy thus the philadelphia markets were paved and then all the city streets and provision was made for keeping them clean the invention of an open stove still used and known as the franklin stove he gave freely to the public refusing to accept a patent thereof when one was offered him by the governor. In 
such a record speaks eloquently not only of franklin's sagacity but also of his genuine benevolence although it was his policy to keep his own personality in the background it is no wonder that his services were recognized and that he was now regarded as the leading citizen in philadelphia he was able to retire from active business in seventeen forty eight and was henceforward wholly employed in matters of public welfare since seventeen thirty seven he had been postmaster of philadelphia in seventeen fifty he was elected a member of the general assembly we have already noted the modest beginnings of Franklin's literary work in the contributions made anonymously, while an apprentice, to his brother's paper in Boston. These articles, signed with the pen name, Silence, Do Good, inspired by Cotton Mather's essays, To Do Good, and formed on the style of Addison, were merely experimental. The busybody papers, contributed to the philadelphia mercury in seventeen twenty eight to twenty nine are not notable except for their well-developed sense of humor but in seventeen thirty two franklin published the first issue of his famous almanac which for a quarter of a century appeared annually exercising no small influence on habits and morals throughout the colonies to appreciate the popularity of Franklin's annual, it is necessary to recall the lack of original literature in America at that time. Among the common people, except the Bible, the printed sermons of the New England clergy and their theological pamphlets, there was little, if any, reading matter of any sort. The almanac, however, was an established and cherished institution. It was as universal as the Bible itself. Various printers issued almanacs. Peddlers carried them about in their packs. One hung in every chimney corner. Their owners used them as receptacles for their memoranda and accounts. Such crude paragraphs and wise saws as might be found inserted among the calculations supplied about everything in the way of profane literature which was accessible to the people at large. No less than seven of these annual publications were appearing regularly in Philadelphia when Franklin's first issue appeared. Their predictions were vague and unsatisfying. Rain here or in South Carolina, said one. Cold to the northward, warm to the southward, it declared. The editors, however, prided themselves on the fact that if they missed the mark in their weather forecasts, they were usually correct in placing the day of the week on its proper date in the month, and that, after all, was the most useful thing in an almanac. The new publication, by Richard Saunders, Philomath, was different from its predecessors. Franklin created a character, Poor Richard, in whose name the work appeared, and whose real existence was debated humorously and seriously. Seated among the calculations were many crisp sayings introduced by the phrase, as poor Richard says, sayings which have taken their place among the maxims of the world. Keep thy shop, and thy shop will keep thee. One today is worth two tomorrows. Plow deep while sluggards sleep. An empty sack cannot stand upright. Fools make feasts and wise men eat them. He that by the plough would thrive, himself must either hold or drive. These and scores of similar homely proverbs were incorporated in the almanac. It was Franklin's idea to teach lessons of thrift to his countrymen. Some of the sayings he coined entire, others he quoted from various sources. They were finally sifted and collected in permanent form in a lengthy discourse called Father Abraham's Speech, which was included in the Almanac of 1758 and found its way thus into well-nigh every home in America. Father Abraham's Speech was translated into every European language, and even to this day continues to teach its useful lesson of industry, frugality, and honesty the world over.
Franklin's other literary success was his famous autobiography, which he began to write in 1771, resumed in 1788, and left incomplete at his death. The purpose of its author was to make the experiences of his own career the conduct and habit of life which had led to success in his own case a source of help and inspiration to others he therefore tells the story of his struggles his errors his experiments with himself his accomplishment with wonderful frankness and extreme simplicity take for example the following passage the objections and reluctances I met with in soliciting the subscriptions made me soon feel the impropriety of presenting oneself as the proposer of any useful project that might be supposed to raise one's reputation in the smallest degree above that of one's neighbors, when one has need of their assistance to accomplish that project. I therefore put myself as much as I could out of sight and stated it to be a scheme of a number of friends, who had requested me to go about and propose it to such as they thought lovers of reading. In this way, my affairs went on more smoothly, and I ever after practiced it on such occasions, and from my frequent successes can heartily recommend it. The present little sacrifice of your vanity will afterwards be amply repaid. If it remains a while uncertain to whom the merit belongs, someone more vain than yourself may be encouraged to claim it, and then even envy will be disposed to do you justice by plucking those assumed feathers and restoring them to their right owner. This library afforded me the means of improvement by constant study, for which I set apart an hour or two each day and thus repaired in some degree the loss of the learned education my father once intended for me reading was the only amusement i allowed myself i spent no time in taverns games or frolics of any kind and my industry in my business continued as indefatigable as it was necessary i was indebted for my printing-house i had a young family coming on to be educated and I had two competitors to contend with for business who were established in the place before me. My circumstances, however, grew daily easier. My original habits of frugality continuing, and my father having among his instructions to me when a boy, frequently repeated a proverb of Solomon. Seest thou a man diligent in his calling, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. I thence considered industry as a means of obtaining wealth and distinction, which encouraged me, though I did not think that I should ever literally stand before kings, which, however, has since happened, for I have stood before five, and even had the honor of sitting down with one, the King of Denmark, to dinner. The predominant quality in all of Franklin's writing is its genuine humanness. This is what brought the almanac into instant popularity, and what makes the autobiography an enduring American classic. It is a quality that had been extremely rare in the earlier colonial literature, a keen sense of humor, also, homely and blunt, but true, is constant in Franklin's work and one of the essential factors in its success. Noted examples of his wit are found in his anecdote of the whistle, and the dialogue between Dr. Franklin and the gout, which are among the papers entitled Bagatelles, written when Franklin was in France. Franklin's literary work was thoroughly typical of himself. Honest, plain, democratic, clear-headed, shrewd, worldly-wise, he was interested in the practical side of life. To him the matter of getting on in the world was a duty and to enable others to see the advantages of integrity application and thrift was his self-appointed task his influence in this direction was immense the absence of ideality is obvious in all his compositions he never reached the high levels of imaginative art but on this lower plane of material interest and everyday life 
He was, and is, without a peer among writers. The works which have been mentioned possess a universal charm. I will disinherit you, said Sidney Smith to his daughter, if you do not admire everything written by Franklin. Of Franklin's later life, his large usefulness to this country throughout the revolutionary period, his distinctions and his honors, only a bare summary can be given here. In 1753, he was appointed postmaster general and established the postal system on a paying basis. In 1757, he was sent to England as the representative of Pennsylvania, his duties keeping him there for the ensuing five years. From 1764 to 1775, he was again in England, the official representative of four of the colonies, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Georgia. The day after his landing again in America, he was appointed a member of the Second Continental Congress, where he was conspicuous for the next fourteen months. It was he who, with characteristic humor, declared, after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Yes, we must all hang together, or, assuredly, we shall all hang separately. In September 1776, Franklin was sent to France as a special envoy to win the sympathy and assistance of that country for the new nation. How well he succeeded in his mission, and what enthusiasm of popular admiration was aroused by his homely, benevolent personality are matters of familiar history. On his return, after having been relieved by Jefferson in 1785, he was at once made a member of the Constitutional Convention, which finally adopted the Constitution of the United States. I seem to have intruded myself into the company of posterity, he said, when I ought to have been abed and asleep. He was seventy-nine years old. He had seen the development of his country from ten disunited colonies with a population of four hundred thousand into a nation of thirteen United States with a population of four million. In the making of that nation, no American had borne a more useful or more conspicuous part. His place in our political history is emphasized by the fact that his signature is found appended to four great documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Alliance with France, the Treaty of Peace with England, and the Constitution. Of no other American can this be declared. But this record of Franklin's versatility is by no means complete. The final word must be concerning his services to science. Throughout his life, he was an eager searcher after truth, an ardent student of nature. His private correspondence is full of the matter of his investigations, which he prosecuted with great intelligence and with remarkable results. As Mr. Franklin, the philosopher, he was renowned among contemporary scholars. That famous experiment with the kite and key which identified electricity with the lightning was only one of many which brought him fame. The colleges of Yale and Harvard conferred on the soap boiler son the degree of M.A. He was honored by the scientific scholars of St. Petersburg, London, and Paris. He was a member of the Royal Society. When his death occurred in 1790, it was a French scholar who wrote the epitaph so often quoted, Herpui coelo fomen se trunc tyrannis. Such is, in outline, the record of this remarkable man, the many-sided Franklin, as he is appropriately called, our first great American. It was in keeping with his intensely practical nature that Franklin should devise a peculiar, a unique plan of beneficence for the good of posterity. In his will, he bequeathed to the city of Philadelphia and to the city of Boston, each, the sum of one thousand pounds. These funds were to be used in loans under restrictions to young tradesmen in small amounts. Principal and interest were to 
be allowed to accumulate in each case for one hundred years when as franklin calculated each fund should amount to one hundred and thirty one thousand pounds a division was then to be made one hundred thousand to be withdrawn and be applied by each city upon public works and the remainder be placed again in service for a second hundred years at the expiration of that period the donor thought that each fund would aggregate something over four million pounds and devised that in each instance the sum should then be divided between the city and the commonwealth to be applied in any form that should be thought best unfortunately in the face of changed conditions franklin's idea proved impracticable however the city of boston did possess in this fund at the end of the period stipulated by the will the sum of four hundred thousand dollars the city appropriated one hundred thousand dollars additional which was used in buying land and the entire amount of the franklin fund was applied in building and equipping a great evening technical school to be known as the franklin union mr andrew carnegie has given the sum of four hundred thousand dollars which has been set aside as an endowment fund the income from which provides for the running expenses of the institution end of part two of chapter two part three of chapter two of a student's history of american literature by william simons this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part three second half of the eighteenth century the revolutionary period speeches argumentative essays state papers in the second half of the eighteenth century our literature presents the vivid reflection of that momentous struggle for independence upon which the american colonies had entered fiery speeches able arguments set forth in newspapers and in pamphlets sharp and bitter satire served to give utterance to the thought and passion of men's minds one feature of this activity must be emphasized geographical lines were now forgotten the literature of this period is no longer local essayists versifiers orators were inspired by a common purpose and by a devotion to the interests of the country at large greatest of the massachusetts orators and conspicuous at the beginning of the struggle was james otis he was a graduate of harvard and a prominent lawyer in boston in seventeen sixty one following the accession of george the third in the previous year there arose in massachusetts a debate over granting the new writs of assistance to officers of the customs in that colony in february of that year otis in the council chamber of boston delivered an argument against the legality of these writs which is sometimes described as the prologue of the revolution of this passionate address no complete record exists but john adams who reported it declares that american independence was then and there born otis was a flame of fire adams declares such a profusion of learning such convincing argument and such a torrent of sublime and pathetic eloquence that a great crowd of spectators and auditors went away absolutely electrified three years later otis published a pamphlet the rights of the british colonies asserted and proved one of the most acute and powerful among the many political papers of these years the historic events of the period came in quick succession the stamp act passed in seventeen sixty five was repealed in the following year but taxes on tea paper glass paints and other articles were levied in seventeen sixty seven petitions appeals and resolutions were numerous 
pamphlets and essays appeared in great numbers to these years belong the political papers of franklin who contributed vigorously to these discussions samuel adams seventeen twenty two to eighteen o three tax collector of the town of boston was a voluminous essayist of whom a tory governor declared every dip of his pen stings like a horned snake both sides participated in this fierce debate for there were not a few in the colonies who remained loyal to england throughout the struggle following the assemblage of the first continental congress in seventeen seventy four there appeared in new york a series of four pamphlets dealing with the great questions of the time from the tory standpoint these were signed westchester farmer they were incisive picturesque witty and readable if i must be devoured let me be devoured by the jaws of a lion and not gnawed to death by rats and vermin declared the audacious pamphleteer these papers aroused a storm of patriotic protest in the midst of which it is interesting to find a pamphlet entitled the farmer refuted the essay of a youth of eighteen young alexander hamilton then a student in king's college the farmer was identified with the reverend samuel seabury an episcopal clergyman of westchester new york and was made to pay dearly for his bold utterances by some of the excitable patriots in his vicinity he suffered many indignities but after the close of the conflict resumed his position and ended his life in peace honored by many of his former foes chief among the orators of the south was patrick henry seventeen thirty six to seventeen ninety nine of whom jefferson said he appeared to me to speak as homer wrote it was he who in the opening speech of the first congress uttered the ringing declaration i am not a virginian but an american and he who in the virginia assembly march twenty third seventeen seventy five delivered the address which ranks as one of the classics of american eloquence along with otis in the north stands the familiar figure of john hancock seventeen thirty seven to seventeen ninety three in the speech which he delivered in seventeen seventy four on the anniversary of the boston massacre he expressed in characteristic phrases the fervor of the time burn boston and make john hancock a beggar if the public good requires joseph warren seventeen forty one to seventeen seventy five a boston physician in his address on the next anniversary of the massacre exclaimed these fellows say we won't fight by heavens i hope i shall die up to my knees in blood it was but a few weeks thereafter that the unconscious prophecy was realized at bunker hill if much of this oratory was turgid it nevertheless expressed the sincere sentiment of those who gave it voice such was the spirit of the time josiah quincy seventeen forty four to seventeen seventy five spoke for many another as well as for himself when he declared if to appear for my country is treason and to arm for her defence is rebellion like my father's i will glory in the name of rebel and traitor as they did in that of puritan and enthusiast the newspapers teemed with articles signed with symbolic names popelius vindex candidus novanglus etc in the flood of political papers with which patriotic writers deluged the colonies there was none which wrought such effect as the pamphlet entitled common sense published by thomas paine paine was an englishman of radical mind who after an unpretentious career in his own country came to america in seventeen seventy four equipped only with a note of introduction from benjamin franklin catching the spirit of the hour and seeing the logical issue of events as few if any of the colonists had done in seventeen seventy six he sent forth his epoch-making work 
he first pointed out that the present struggle must lead to national independence his literary style was not impressive the logic of his argument was not invincible but the effect of his paper was electric one hundred and twenty thousand copies were sold within three months in france and even in england its power was felt the authorship of the pamphlet which was anonymous was ascribed to franklin it carried conviction in america and made the issues of the conflict clear during the war Paine published a series of papers called the crisis the opening sentence of which these are the times that try men's souls became a proverbial phrase later he went to france and in his enthusiasm for the cause of revolution there wrote the rights of man seventeen ninety one to ninety two a reply to burke's reflections on the french revolution in the age of reason seventeen ninety four to ninety six a bitter attack on christianity Paine's radicalism appears in its extreme form it is an unpleasant work and does not discover the earlier power or skill of its author after the conclusion of the war during that critical period which preceded the adoption of a constitution there appeared at intervals a very notable series of papers which were designed in their entirety to set forth the fundamental principles of government these appeared as articles contributed to various new york newspapers there were eighty-five in all and their authorship was concealed under the pseudonym of publius in seventeen eighty eight these papers were collected and published under the name of the federalist a collection which ranks as our chief political classic of these famous papers five are attributed to john jay twenty nine to james madison and fifty one to alexander hamilton two other great state documents eloquent products of this exalted time demand a place in the record of our nation's literature the declaration of independence was drafted by thomas jefferson seventeen forty three to eighteen twenty six a virginian its sonorous sentences need not be subjected to depreciation by the colder literary criticism of to-day its lines were written by men who were intensely stirred by the spirit of their deeds we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness thomas jefferson was a fluent writer and a statesman who left a lasting impress on the political thought of his country an exponent of the principles of popular government and a champion of individual freedom he is the great representative of democracy in america and is looked upon as father of the ideas embodied in the democratic party he published notes on virginia wrote a compact autobiography founded the university of virginia and established in that institution a chair of english the first in america the constitution of the united states adopted in seventeen eighty eight which was described by gladstone as the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man owed its precise formulation largely to the labors of alexander hamilton seventeen fifty seven to eighteen o four the brilliant champion of the federal principle in national government which insists upon the centralization of authority and the unity of the federal relation hamilton therefore is recognized as the first exponent of those ideas which are now represented theoretically in the present republican party these men the orators the pamphleteers the statesmen of that generation were not unworthy contemporaries of fox chatham and burke the great english parliamentarians whose eloquence and statesmanship were matched with theirs when your lordships look at the papers transmitted to us from america 
when you consider their decency firmness and wisdom you cannot but respect their cause said the earl of chatham in seventeen seventy five and edmund burke in his remarkable speech on conciliation with america pays a notable tribute to the legal knowledge of the colonists not to be overlooked by the student of this period are a few productions which are not so deeply colored by the political spirit of the time such are the collected letters of washington of jefferson of john adams and his wife abigail the farewell address of washington to his troops and the journal of john woolman a quaker which was beloved of whittier and received the praises of charles lamb End of part three of chapter two. Part four of chapter two of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part four Poetry of the Revolution Satires, Epics, and Ballads the revolutionary period was not without its poets from the beginning of the conflict in seventeen seventy five to the end there was a copious flow of verse which sprang naturally enough from the turbulence of popular excitement and emotion here and there among the crude productions of these unschooled rhymers one comes upon compositions which show an unexpected strength of feeling expressed with considerable literary art this is especially true of the political satires and the ballads which are conspicuous in revolutionary literature foremost among the tory versifiers for both parties in the contest had their literary champions in metre as in prose was jonathan odell who invoked the muse thus grant me for a time some deleterious powers of acrid rhyme some arsenic verse to poison with the pen these rats who nestle in the lion's den odell came of pioneer puritan stock and was himself a native of new jersey he was a graduate of princeton and became a surgeon in the british army he later went to england where he took orders for the church returning to new jersey he became rector of the parish in burlington with the outbreak of hostilities and the development of violence against all suspected royalist sympathies the clergyman was forced to take flight and as a refugee he remained in new york until the evacuation of the british troops odell's literary talent was soon engaged in the composition of satiric poems modelled on the satires of dryden and pope they show considerable merit odell wrote with a trenchant pen there is no humor in his satire it is wit caustic biting the tone of his verse is the tone of bitter, implacable, invective. Four satires, all written in 1779, furnish the best examples of his verse. The Word of Congress, The Congratulation, The Fou de Joie, and The American Times. The following lines from the last of his satires are sufficient to exhibit his skill in satire and in verse. What cannot ceaseless impudence produce old franklin knows its value and its use he caught at pain relieved his wretched plight and gave him notes and set him down to write fire from the doctor's hints the miscreant took discarded truth and soon produced a book a pamphlet which without the least pretence to reason bore the name of common sense the work like wildfire through the country ran and folly bowed the knee to franklin's plan sense reason judgment were abashed and fled and congress reigned triumphant in their stead persistent in his attitude irreconcilable and belligerent still jonathan odell forsook the colonies at the close of the contest and migrated to nova scotia where he lived to old age unconvinced and unrelenting to the last three revolutionary poets of large and serious purpose and widely famed in their generation 
may be grouped together, not only because of some similarity in their verse, but also because they were all Connecticut men. Two were conspicuous members of a coterie noted as the Hartford Wits. That Connecticut town, indeed, enjoyed a reputation as a literary center through the exploits of this group. The two Hartford poets were John Trumbull and Joel Barlow. The third of this group was Timothy Dwight. Trumbull's contribution was a long satire, a burlesque epic, entitled Macfingal. It was modeled on Butler's Hudibras, a famous English satire of the 17th century directed at the Puritans. The Yankee poet, borrowing the rollicking measure of the earlier satirist, narrates the misadventures of his hero, a Tory squire in the midst of patriots. The poem first appeared in January 1776, was afterward expanded and reappeared in four cantos in 1782. McFingal is full of native Yankee wit and humor, and contains many clever couplets, couplets which have passed for butlers. No man e'er felt the halter draw with good opinion of the law, or held in method orthodox his love of justice in the stocks, or failed to lose by sheriff's shears at once his loyalty and ears. So popular was this merry epic, McFingal, that it ran to thirty editions. It was a source of joy in the camps of the Continentals, and nerved the arm of many a tired soldier in the ranks. Still more ambitious was the effort of Joel Barlow, who published in 1787 his Vision of Columbus. In 1807, the completed work appeared under the epic title The Columbiad. It was a prodigious poem, intended to be a second Iliad, following a plan employed by Milton in the eleventh book of Paradise Lost, Columbus is led to the hill of vision and is shown the future greatness of the land he had discovered. The patriotic fervor of the author is intense. I sing the mariner who first unfurled an eastern banner o'er the western world and taught mankind where future empire lay in these fair confines of descending day. In 1793, Barlow composed in lighter vein another poem, which has outlived the ponderous epic. This is the happy composition in honor of Hasty Pudding, one of our best examples of light and fanciful verse. The poem was written when Barlow was abroad in Savoy, and was dedicated to no less a personage than Lady Martha Washington. The poet still uses the heroic couplet, this time in mock heroic strain, and the humorous realism of his rural scenes is no less attractive to the modern reader than it was to those who first enjoyed the poet's glorification of this homely theme. The third writer in this group, Timothy Dwight, was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, and he became, in time, the president of Yale College. The subject of his epic, for his inspiration was also epical, is religion. It was entitled The Conquest of Canon, and it appeared in 1785. It is described by its author as the first of the kind which has been published in this country. The spirit of the revolution is felt in the treatment of even this ancient theme, and the ingenious device by which the great event of American history in the latter part of the 18th century is linked with this epic recital of israelitish wars is very amusing timothy dwight was like his grandfather edwards a man of marvelous energy and of great literary productiveness he inherited however none of the genius which distinguished jonathan edwards scholarly work his theology explained and defended in five volumes does not resemble the famous treatise on the freedom of the will the most interesting example of his prose is The Travels in New England and New York, four volumes of letters fictitiously addressed to an English correspondent, and filled with observations made during his summer travels in his gig. Chapter 9 
In 1777 and 1778, Dwight served as an army chaplain and employed his lyric gifts with patriotic fervor. His best-remembered song, Columbia, Columbia, To Glory Arise, was the fruit of this period. The fact that he was the author also of the hymn, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord, should certainly not be forgotten. In Greenfield Hill, 1794, we find a very interesting attempt at a descriptive as well as didactic poem. It is in frank imitation of the English classic poets, Pope, Denham, Thompson, Goldsmith, but shows some touches distinctively American. Among the most interesting compositions of the revolutionary period are the numerous songs and ballads, hundreds of which were written during the years of the war. Many of these were mere doggerel, but some, as such songs of the people often are, were characterized by a homely, hearty strain, which in spite of crudity bears its own appeal, and stirs the passion of men without the aid of art. The names of their writers were often unknown, even in that generation. Sometimes these compositions took the form of camp songs, like that to The Volunteer Boys, 1780. Hence with a lover who sighs o'er his wine, Chloe's and Phyllis's toasting. Hence with the slave who will whimper and whine, Of ardor and constancy boasting. Hence with love's joys, follies, and noise, The toast that I give is the volunteer boys, etc. Sometimes they are religious songs, One of the best examples of which is found in the American Soldier's Hymn. Tis God that girds our armor on, and all our just designs fulfills. Through him our feet can swiftly run, and nimbly climb the steepest hills. Lessons of war from him we take, and manly weapons learn to wield. Strong bows of steel with ease we break, forced by our stronger arms to yield, etc but more numerous were the narratives in crude and vigorous verse of battle of incident and of individual exploit such as we find in an anonymous poem on the battle of trenton december twenty sixth seventeen seventy six the historic crossing of the delaware is mentioned in the opening stanza on christmas day in seventy six our ragged troops with bayonets fixed for trenton marched away the delaware sea the boats below, the light obscured by hail and snow, but no sign of dismay. In each of the six stanzas which compose the song, there is some clever touch which reveals the real poetic impulse, none the less effective because of its artlessness. Great Washington he led us on, whose streaming flag, in storm or sun, had never known disgrace. In silent march we passed the night, each soldier panting for the fight, though quite benumbed with frost. The account of the action is very brief. The surprise, the victory, the trophies of battle are tersely described, and the song closes in conventional style. Now, brothers of the patriot bands, let's sing deliverance from the hands of arbitrary sway, and as our life is but a span, let's touch the tankard while we can, in memory of that day one of the best naval ballads of the time was the yankee man of war a stirring record of an exploit in seventeen seventy eight wherein the bravery of john paul jones is enthusiastically celebrated its unknown author writes with the precision of one well versed in sea craft and like an eye-witness of the incident out booms out booms our skipper cried, and give her sheet, and the swiftest keel that was ever launched shot ahead of the British fleet, and amidst a thundering shower of shot, with stunsails hoisting away, down the north channel Paul Jones did steer, just at the break of day. Scores of these spirited little lyrics may be read in the collections of revolutionary songs, the patriotic fervor of the singer is often more impressive than the inspiration of his muse, and yet there are not a few poems in the group 
which may claim a place in our national literature. The humorous ballad on The Battle of the Kegs illustrates another phase of this patriotic activity in verse. The author of these rollicking lines was Francis Hopkinson, a man prominent in all the serious and weighty movements of these momentous times, yet full of vivacity and an irresistible humor, which frequently broke forth in trenchant satire and clever verse. In The Battle of the Kegs, his irrepressible wit runs merry riot. The incident which inspired the ballad belongs to the beginning of 1778. Some Yankee inventor, having constructed a sort of infernal machine for the purpose, a lot of kegs were equipped with the mechanism and charged with powder. These kegs were then sent floating down the Delaware toward Philadelphia, where the British force under Howe was quartered for the winter. Whether actually dangerous or not, these suspicious-looking kegs caused great excitement as they came floating by the city and provoked a general bombardment from ships and garrison. No harm resulted to the English from this fleet of Yankee invention, but Hopkinson's doggerel rhymes which followed appear to have had a most beneficent effect upon the Continentals. The ballad proved to be the most popular composition of the war period, and its influence is thus described by Tyler. It gave the weary and anxious people the luxury of genuine and hearty laughter in very scorn of the enemy. To the cause of the revolution it was perhaps worth as much just then, by way of emotional tonic and of military inspiration, as the winning of a considerable battle would have been. Francis Hopkinson's impassioned Camp Ballad 1777, exhibits the real lyric power of the poet in his serious mood. Columbia, written by Timothy Dwight, belongs to the same group of patriotic lyrics. Dwight's poem begins with the lines, Columbia, Columbia, to glory arise, the queen of the world and the child of the skies. It is not to be confused with the national song, Hail Columbia, which was written by Joseph Hopkinson, not Francis in 1798. If popularity were a standard of excellence, these fervid compositions, along with the Battle of the Kegs and the Yankees' return from camp, Yankee Doodle, would have to represent the poetic accomplishment of our revolutionary poets. Happily, this is not the case. Bold Hawthorne, the surgeon's record of the cruise of the fair American, Captain Hawthorne, 1777, has the homely flavor of an honest folk song. And so has the ballad of Brave, Polding, and the Spy, which celebrates the patriotic integrity of the captor of Major Andre. But the best of all these patriotic compositions is one entitled Hail in the Bush, a wonderfully tender and impressive tribute to the memory of Nathan Hale, captured and hanged by the British as a spy. This remarkable poem merits quotation in full. Hail in the Bush The breezes went steadily through the tall pines, a saying, Oh, hush, a saying, Oh, hush, as stilly stole by a bold legion of horse, for hail in the bush, for hail in the bush. Keep still, said the thrush, as she nestled her young, in a nest by the road, in a nest by the road, for the tyrants are near, and with them appear, what bodes us no good, what bodes us no good. The brave captain heard it, and thought of his home, in a cot by the brook, in a cot by the brook, with mother and sister and memories dear, he so gaily forsook, he so gaily forsook. Cooling shades of the night were coming apace, the tattoo had beat, the tattoo had beat, the noble one sprang from his dark lurking place to make his retreat, to make his retreat. He warily trod on the dry rustling leaves as he passed through the wood, as he passed through the wood, and silently gained his rude lunch on the shore as she played with the flood, as she played with the flood. The guards of the camp on that dark dreary night had a murderous will, had a murderous will, they took him and bore him afar from the shore, to a hut on the hill, to a hut on the hill. No mother was there, nor friend who could cheer, in that little stone cell, 
in that little stone cell, but he trusted in love from his father above, in his heart all was well, in his heart all was well. An ominous owl, with his solemn bass voice, sat moaning hard by, sat moaning hard by. The tyrant's proud minions must gladly rejoice, for he must soon die, for he must soon die. The brave fellow told them, no thing he restrained, the cruel general, the cruel general, his errand from camp of the ends to be gained, and said that was all, and said that was all. They took him and bound him and bore him away, down the hill's grassy side, down the hill's grassy side. Twas there the base hirelings in royal array, his cause did deride, his cause did deride. Five minutes were given, short moments, no more, for him to repent, for him to repent. He prayed for his mother, he asked, not another, to heaven he went, to heaven he went. The faith of a martyr the tragedy showed, as he trod the last stage, as he trod the last stage, and Britons will shudder at gallant Hale's blood, as his words do presage, as his words do presage. Thou pale king of terrors, thou life's gloomy foe, go frighten the slave, go frighten the slave, tell tyrants to you their allegiance they owe, no fears for the brave, no fears for the brave. End of part four of chapter two. Part five of chapter two of A Student's Guide to American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part five. The Close of the Eighteenth Century. Transition. Poetry, Drama, Fiction periodical literature coincidentally with the satires the epics the songs and ballads which owed their measure of inspiration immediately to the spirit of that strenuous time we note also the appearance of a different school of verse which meant infinitely more in the development of our literary art among the satirists of the revolutionary epoch there was none whose pen was readier or sharper in its thrusts than philip freneau and among the poems of the war itself none holds a firmer place in our literature than freneau's brief elegy on the valiant who died at utah springs one line of this poem was thought worthy of adaptation by the author of marmion strongest claim for remembrance lies in a few compositions which mark the beginning of nature poetry in america philip freneau owed his foreign name to huguenot ancestry but he was born in new york and was graduated in seventeen seventy one at princeton where he had been a classmate and roommate with james madison in the early part of his career freneau engaged in commercial ventures in the west indies and made frequent voyages commanding his own vessel once in seventeen eighty he was captured by the british and was for several weeks confined in an english prison ship in new york harbor the hardships of this experience are rehearsed in a poem entitled the british prison ship filled to the brim with the horror and rancor of his suffering many another fierce broadside did he hurl at the nation's foe until hostilities ceased after the war freneau entered journalism but his later years were comparatively inactive near the close of his eightieth year on a december night returning to his home from a gathering with friends he lost his way in the snow and fell by the roadside the next morning he was found dead the compositions which have done most for freneau's fame as a poet belong to his earlier years in these productions we find the beginning of genuine nature poetry in america here we have freneau's opening lines on the wild honeysuckle fair flower that dost so comely grow hid in this silent dull retreat untouched thy honey blossoms blow unseen thy little branches greet no roving foot shall crush thee here no busy hand provoke a tear to a honey-bee addressed to a wandering rover from the hive 
resting luxuriously on the rim of the poet's glass is written with the same charming simplicity of style and with a dainty touch of humor befitting the theme welcome i hail you to my glass all welcome here you will find here let the cloud of trouble pass here be all care resigned this fluid never fails to please and drown the griefs of men or bees yet take not oh too deep a drink and in this ocean die here bigger bees than you might sink even bees full six feet high like pharaoh then you would be said to perish in a sea of red do as you please your will is mine enjoy it without fear and your grave will be this glass of wine your epitaph a tear go take your seat in charon's boat we'll tell the hive you died afloat of a different tenor are two poems in pensive key the indian student and the indian burying ground to all these compositions we feel the spirit of a true poet who loves nature and responds to her appeals spontaneously and without artifice there had been a few previous attempts at this form of treatment in american verse but they had been isolated instances and had failed of the excellence attained by Frenot. these poems are therefore the more worthy of note the volume which contains these productions appeared in seventeen eighty six the same year in which the first volume of the poems of robert burns was published and twelve years before the lyrical ballads introduced william wordsworth as the first recognized champion of simplicity and naturalness in the english verse the parting glass is in the lighter mood of the old cavalier poets on the ruins of a country inn shows the influence of thomas gray in one long poem the house of night Frenot enters the weird domain afterwards so skilfully worked by edgar allan poe a singular example of precocious literary development is found in the work of a negro girl phyllis wheatley brought from africa at the age of seven or eight she became a slave in the household of a family in boston she learned rapidly under the guidance of her mistress and began to write verse in the conventional style of the english classical poets verse as good as that produced by any of their american imitators a volume of phyllis wheatley's poems was published at london in seventeen seventy three the genuineness of the work being vouched for by prominent people in boston at the appearance of this volume phyllis could have been scarcely twenty years of age her precocity marking her development phenomenal the beginnings of dramatic literature in america belong to this same period quite early in the century english plays had been acted by amateurs in new york but it was not until seventeen fifty two that a professional company had been seen in the colonies presenting standard plays in that year an english troupe of london players began a series of presentations at williamsburg virginia after playing in new york and philadelphia the merchant of venice richard III, and hamlet were included in their repertory two or three plays had been written by americans previous to the revolution for the most part so-called reading plays hugh h brackenridge seventeen forty eight to eighteen sixteen a classmate and associate of philip Freneau, afterward judge of the supreme court of pennsylvania wrote in seventeen seventy six a drama called the battle of bunker hill brackenridge was then a school teacher and the play was presented by his pupils theatres had been built in philadelphia new york annapolis and charleston previous to the war boston's earliest playhouse dates from seventeen ninety four the first american play to be performed by a professional company was the contrast written by royal tyler seventeen fifty seven to eighteen twenty six it was produced in new york april sixteenth seventeen eighty seven the theme of this comedy was patriotic a contrast is drawn between those who ape foreign fashions and those who hold to the plain but wholesome manners of home in this play the yankee jonathan is introduced effectively as a typical character 
tyler was himself a vermonter of versatile talent he produced other plays a novel and several poems in seventeen eighty nine another american comedy was produced the father or american shandyism this was the work of william dunlap seventeen sixty six to eighteen thirty nine of new jersey this play one of some sixty written by dunlap and the most worthy of them contains two characters modeled after the famous uncle toby and corporal trim of lawrence stern's whimsical novel tristram shandy dunlap became a theatrical manager and later wrote a history of the american theatre eighteen thirty two he was also the biographer of the first american novelist of note charles brockton brown contemporaneous with the appearance of the drama in our literature we have to record also the entrance of the novel the first native experiment in this form of fiction modeled very distantly after richardson's pamela was entitled the power of sympathy this work has a curious history madam sarah wentworth morton its author a member of one of new england's most aristocratic families had won provincial fame as a poetess under the sentimental name of felinia she had indeed been described by one distinguished admirer as the american sappho for her plot mrs morton utilized a miserable scandal which had blighted her own family life and made the identity of her principal characters so obvious that the persons most interested bought the entire edition from the publisher and the power of sympathy thus incontinently suppressed seventeen eighty nine was never published in that generation two other new england women appeared thus early in print with narratives of somewhat similar sort founded on fact susanna h rolson an english lady who had established a school for girls in boston was the author of a very popular novel charlotte temple a tale of truth seventeen ninety and of other novels including a sequel lucy temple which was published in eighteen twenty eight Hannah W. Foster wrote, in 1797, The Coquette, or The History of Eliza Wharton, a novel founded on fact. Mrs. Foster was the wife of a clergyman, and wrote, as did Mrs. Rowson, with a moral purpose. In both these novels, the theme of indiscretion and desertion is treated in the sentimental didactic style which characterized many of the English novelists of the same period. The popularity of these two stories outlasted their own generation. Pilgrimages were made by sentimental readers to the graves of both these heroines, and the old slate headstone in the ancient graveyard in Salem, where the real Eliza Wharton is buried, has been all but chipped away by relic hunters. Hugh H. Brackenridge, already mentioned as the author of an early American play, wrote a satirical romance called Modern Chivalry or the adventures of captain farrago and teague o'regan his servant the first part of which appeared in seventeen ninety two the second in eighteen o six and the playwright royal tyler also entered the lists with a two-volume narrative entitled the algerine captive in seventeen ninety nine neither of these works however can be regarded as possessing the interest or importance of mrs rowson's or mrs foster's tales of truth in the annals of american fiction it is with charlotte temple and the coquette that the novel of manners appears while these earliest examples of the american novel are of interest historically and interesting mainly on that ground alone there appeared before the close of the century one or two essays in prose fiction which possess decided merit on the ground of technical construction and on that of genuine narrative power these were the early romances of charles brockton brown brown was a native of philadelphia where he received his education he chose the profession of the law and prepared himself for practice but the duties of the legal calling were wholly uncongenial and the effect of this trying situation was soon apparent in depression of spirits and impaired health at last he forsook the law for the profession of literature 
and is deserving of some distinction as the first American to make deliberately so dangerous an experiment. He removed to New York and formed associations with a few men of literary tastes, comprising the members of the Friendly Club, among whom was William Dunlap, the future biographer of the novelist. It was a period of considerable mental excitement in both Europe and America. Revolutionary forces were vigorously alive. New theories affecting political and social relations were promulgated daily. As an essayist on moral as well as literary themes, Brown had written copiously before his abandonment of the law. He had been a diligent student. His mind was even abnormally active and he wrote with a style noticeably strong and vivid. In 1797, Charles Brockton Brown published his first volume, Alcuin, a dialogue on the rights of women. It did not meet with success. But following this, Brown produced in rapid succession a series of remarkable novels which won for their author contemporary distinction, and, historically regarded, hold a very notable place in American literature. The titles of these novels are Violent, or The Transformation, Armand, or The Secret Witness, Arthur Mervyn, Edgar Huntley, Clara Howard, and Jane Talbot. The first of these was published in 1798, the remainder before the end of 1801. Besides writing his novels, Brown was also conducting in Magazine, the Monthly Magazine, and American Review, which consisted almost entirely of his own contributions. Near the close of 1800, the novelist returned to Philadelphia, where he founded the Literary Magazine and American Register, and where he continued to write miscellaneous articles on political, biographical, and historical subjects, until his death at the age of thirty-nine. He suffered from the attacks of consumption due, presumably, to the early undermining of his health, and aggravated by the intensity and laboriousness of his life. The novels of Charles Brockton Brown are seldom read today, but they attracted general attention at the time of their appearance, and won the approbation of some European writers, including Scott and Shelley, who gave them a high rank. Both Poe and Hawthorne were undoubtedly influenced by them. They reflected strongly the characteristics of the romantic school of fiction that arose in Germany and England near the close of the 18th century. The plots of these stories are psychological and are based on mystery. The incomprehensible and the horrible are invoked to stimulate interest. There is a marked solemnity of diction which reinforces the peculiar style of the narrative and the emotions are played upon in the sentimental manner of the romance then in vogue abroad. The general tone of the narratives may be properly described as morbid, a tone which pervades the series as a whole. In Vieland, the principal characters are introduced under the spell of a mysterious catastrophe, suggesting the attack of some malignant force which may be the product of electricity or of spontaneous combustion mysterious voices are heard which are finally accounted for by the confession of an ill-disposed ventriloquist a dreadful crime is committed by a person insane with religious mania and disaster overwhelms an entire family through the operation of these mysterious agencies which at the last are but unsatisfactorily explained in arthur merson the scene is laid in philadelphia during an epidemic of yellow fever seventeen ninety three and the ghastly details of that visitation are faithfully reproduced in edgar huntley there is an attempt at murder committed during temporary madness the madman afterward commits suicide while the intended victim escapes the principal personage in the story is a somnambulist these novels of Charles Brockton Brown are not unimpressive in their realistic portrayal of horrible and loathsome scenes, and in their appeal to the sentiments of curiosity and terror. They fail in characterization and in lifelikeness. Yet they compare not unfavorably with contemporary English narratives like William Godwin's Caleb Williams, 1794, and Mrs. Radcliffe's 
Mysteries of Udolpho, 1794, or Matthew Lewis's The Monk, 1795. A significant feature of Brown's work is the fact that he always made use of American scenes. In Edgar Huntley, he employed the incidents of Indian warfare to good purpose. In connection with this account of our literary beginnings in the 18th century, we must not fail to note the earliest appearance of periodical literature in America, a very important phase of intellectual life. Newspapers came first, and were established in the following order. 1704. The Boston Newsletter. Continued to 1776. 1719. The Boston Gazette. First issue. December 21st. 1719. The American Weekly Mercury. Philadelphia. December 22nd. 1721. The New England Courant. Boston. 1725. The New York Gazette. 1728. The Pennsylvania Gazette. Franklin's. Before the end of 1765, there were in the colonies 43 newspapers, nearly all weeklies, and in comparison with the modern journal, very diminutive affairs. News was not abundant, and not often up to date. Prominence was given to correspondence from England, letters from local politicians, anecdotes, essays, poems, lampoons, etc., were introduced. In the latter part of the century, some literary value was claimed by the newspapers. It was not until 1784 that the daily newspaper began to appear, with the founding of the Pennsylvania Packet and Daily Advertiser at Philadelphia. Two or three literary magazines were established in the colonies previous to the Revolution. Such were the General Magazine, started in Philadelphia in 1741, and the american magazine and historical chronicle established in boston in seventeen forty three the royal american magazine started in boston in seventeen seventy four was one of the most elaborate of these publications few of them survived more than a few months one interesting periodical of the revolutionary period was the pennsylvania magazine edited by thomas paine its career began in January 1775 and ended gloriously with the printing of the Declaration of Independence in July 1776. Hugh H. Brackenridge edited the United States Magazine at Philadelphia in 1779. The Boston Magazine appeared and disappeared in 1785. But it was not until the beginning of the new century that anything like a substantial existence was enjoyed by any periodical of this class. Tyler's History of American Literature During Colonial Times and his Literary History of the American Revolution, two volumes, will serve as authoritative background for this chapter. Stedman and Hutchinson's Library of American Literature, volumes 2, 3, and 4, supplies selections from all the writers enumerated here. The period of the 18th century is admirably covered in American Literature, Literatures of the World, by W. P. Trent. For more personal reference, see the Samuel Sewall Papers, Massachusetts Historical Society Collection, 1879. Also, N. H. Chamberlain's Samuel Sewall and the World He Lived in, Boston, 1897. The Life of Jonathan Edwards, American Religious Leaders, by Alexander Allen and Austin's Philip Freneau. Brief authoritative biographies of Franklin, Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Washington, Hamilton, Jefferson, Jay, and Madison are included in the American Statesman series. Selections from the Revolutionary Orators will be found in the third volume of The Library of Oratory and in volume eight of The World's Famous Orations. Illustrations of the Revolutionary Verse are accessible in Stevenson's Poems of American History, Moore's Songs and Ballads of the American Revolution, and in American War Ballads, edited by George Carey Eggleston. The best poems of Freno are to be found in Stedman's American Anthology, Houghton Mifflin Company.
the familiar letters of john adams and his wife abigail adams edited by charles francis adams are an especially interesting record of the period also scudder's men and manners in america one hundred years ago there are numerous biographies of franklin morse's life in the american statesman series has been cited that of mcmaster in the american men of letters series is excellent a larger biography in two volumes is the life and times of benjamin franklin by james parton of course franklin's own autobiography is indispensable the most recent authoritative edition of the complete writings of franklin is that edited by albert h smythe in ten volumes now published in most convenient form for fifteen dollars the eversley edition macmillan besides cooper's the spy and the pilot there are several recent novels which may well be read as illustrating the life of the colonies in the eighteenth century among these are lewis rand by mary johnston hugh wynn by dr weir mitchell janice meredith by paul leicester ford and richard carville by winston churchill the student should include in his reading at least one of the novels of charles brockton brown reprinted in philadelphia by david mackay eighteen eighty nine chapter one of mcmaster's history of the people of the united states will be found most interesting in its discussion of social conditions in america during the century and at the close of the revolution read especially the sections upon the minister and the schoolmaster recent and important is heralds of american literature annie russell marble university of chicago press nineteen o seven it contains chapters on francis hopkinson freneau trumbull the hartford wits william dunlap and charles brockton brown also life and poems of philip freneau by f l patty princeton historical association cairns early american writers sixteen o seven to eighteen hundred macmillan is an admirable volume of selections illustrating the work of all the writers mentioned in these two chapters the poems of philip freneau are now accessible in three volumes edited by f l petty princeton historical association end of part five of chapter two end of chapter two part one of chapter three the beginning of the nineteenth century of a student's history of american literature by william simons this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter three part one the new literature new york and the knickerbocker group with the turn of the century our young republic entered upon an era of expansion and development which can be described only as marvelous the rapid progress in the settlement of the west the influx of foreign immigration the growth of the larger cities extension of transportation systems by construction of canals and government roads application of the new inventions employing the power of steam in river navigation and on railroads these features of american progress during the first fifty years in our first completed century of national existence can be here but thus briefly summarized it is unnecessary to attempt a full historical outline of that period of growth and change except to note that coincidentally with this expansive period of material prosperity and growth our national literature entered upon what we may not inaptly term its golden age the age of its best essayists novelists and poets our real american men of letters we have traced the slow steps of literary effort recorded in the several colonies to the close of their existence as colonies 
and immediately after the period of revolution we have recognized the new and fresh impulse of creative imagination in the little group of simple nature poems by philip freneau and imaginative power of somewhat differing type is the sombre but not altogether unreal romances of charles brockton brown but freneau and brown are only heralds of coming achievements of the appearance of a literature national in scope and of importance sufficient to command recognition by the people of england and the continent and possessed of an artistic excellence felt and enjoyed by all there were evidences of literary activity in boston in philadelphia and in new york little groups of literati as they like to call themselves mightily interested in the development of a national literature gave an atmosphere that was helpful to literary effort and they themselves accomplished what could be accomplished by interest patriotism and industry when joined with talent modest if not mediocre for some reason new york took precedence over boston and philadelphia in these first decades of the nineteenth century and not only sheltered a coterie of enthusiastic congenial comrades of the pen whose lively essays in both prose and verse provoked the humor of the town but pushed into the light of more than local fame the names of paulding halleck drake and dana and before the quarter mark in the century was reached had produced two of the century's greatest writers irving and cooper these are the Knickerbocker writers, so-called in deference to the old Dutch traditions of Manhattan, the spirit of which was directly inherited by most of them, and the influence of which appeared to some extent in their work. In 1825, the poet Bryant came to live in New York, and his name is therefore grouped with those already mentioned, although not a native of the state. He was, however, of their generation, and, like Halleck and Dana, an adopted son of New York. The significance of these first decades of the nineteenth century in their relation to the beginnings of the new literature will appear when we note the dates of the following events. It was in 1807 that the Irvings, together with their friend Paulding, published the first of the anonymous Salmagundi papers. In 1809 appeared the humorous masterpiece, The Knickerbocker History of New York. In 1817 it was that the editors of the North American Review, itself a publication only two years old, printed Bryant's great poem, Thanatopsis, and his inscription for the entrance to a wood. Irving's sketchbook, appearing in 1819, established that writer's place permanently in the leadership of american letters in eighteen twenty one cooper published his second novel and first success the spy and that same year was further signalized in a literary way by the printing at boston of bryant's first volume of verse by eighteen twenty five irving had added bracebridge hall and tales of a traveller to his earlier volumes cooper had written the pioneers and the pilot bryant had published among additional poems the yellow violet to a waterfall green river a winter peace and a hymn to death in comparison with the works of contemporary british writers this brief list of american publications appears modest indeed for by eighteen twenty five wordsworth coleridge and southey had produced all that was characteristic of their work keats had died in eighteen twenty one shelley in eighteen twenty two and byron in eighteen twenty four scott had written the last of the waverley novels tom moore had reached the height of his popularity charles lamb had published the first series of the essays of elia de quincey's confessions of an english opium eater had appeared in eighteen twenty one and macaulay's first essay that on milton 
was printed in 1825. And yet, although meagre when brought thus in comparison with the literature of the motherland, this beginning of our national literature is, after all, not so insignificant as it may seem. It was a beginning, and the question once derisively put in 1820 by Sidney Smith, a witty Englishman, who reads an American book, could now be answered. In 1825, affirmatively by many of his countrymen, before considering in detail the work of the three prominent Americans in this group, let us note briefly some of the minor authors who are associated with them. James Kirk Paulding was a typical member of the Knickerbocker group. He was of Dutch descent and made good use of the Dutch traditions in his most successful work, a novel published in 1831 entitled The Dutchman's Fireside. A relative by marriage of William Irving, Paulding was early associated with Washington Irving and his brother William in the production of the humorous Salmagundi papers, which appeared in 1807. Subsequently, Paulding undertook alone a new series of the Salmagundi, which came out in 1819-20. to 20. During the period of the War of 1812, he produced two clever satires directed at the British Navy, one of these, The Lay of the Scotch Fiddle, being a parody upon Scott's Lay of the Last Minstrel. In 1818, he published The Backwoodsman, a metrical narrative of frontier life in six books, not a strong performance. Paulding was altogether overshadowed in a literary way by Irving and Cooper, both of whom he attempted to follow. He wrote considerable verse, nothing of which attains to excellence, and of his novels three only call for mention. Koningsmark, The Long Finn, Dealing with the Swedish Settlements, 1823, The Dutchman's Fireside, A Study of Old Dutch Life Along the Hudson, 1831, and Westward Ho, A Tale of Kentucky, 1832. Paulding was also the author of A Popular Life of Washington, published in 1835. He served as Secretary of the Navy under Van Buren. One of the most energetic members of this New York coterie was Fitzgreen Halleck, a descendant of the Apostle John Eliot. Halleck was born in Guilford, Connecticut, and in 1811 came to New York and was employed in a banking house as clerk. He later entered the office of John Jacob Astor, who, at his death, left Halleck an annuity of forty pounds. Halleck was a poet from his youth, and three or four of his compositions are not likely to slip from the memory of American readers so long as there are schoolboys to declaim the stirring lines of his Marco Bazarus, or men to quote by the graves of their friends, his simple and tender poem on the death of Drake. Of Halleck's poems, three are considered notable. Alnwick Castle, 1827, Burns, 1827, and Marco Bosaris, 1825. The strength of the poet is in these compositions, but perhaps this is surpassed by the pathos and sincerity of the beautiful elegy on Drake green be the turf above thee friend of my better days none know thee but to love thee nor name thee but to praise a long poem fanny in the style of byron's beppo written in eighteen nineteen was popular at the time but has fallen into oblivion halleck retired on his annuity in eighteen forty nine returned to his old home in connecticut and there spent the remainder of his days upon the eightieth anniversary of his birth a monument erected by his townspeople over his grave was dedicated to his memory the first honor of the kind bestowed upon an american poet the association of halleck and drake in the most intimate of friendships is one of the pleasant incidents of our literary history. Joseph Rodman Drake was born in New York 
became a student of medicine wrote but a brief amount of verse although that was of a high quality and died at twenty-five there will be less sunshine for me here after said halleck now that joe is gone the two friends joined in contributing to the new york evening post a series of anonymous poems under the general title of the croakers these appeared in eighteen nineteen they were light satiric often personal in aim and capital examples of what is frequently called society verse they excited a great deal of comment at the time and are said to have been a subject of conversation in drawing-rooms bookstores and coffee-houses on broadway and throughout the city one of the best poems in the series was drake's the american flag of which the concluding lines forever float that standard sheet where breathes the foe but falls before us with freedom's soil beneath our feet and freedom's banner streaming o'er us were the suggestion of halleck drake's principal composition is a long but graceful poem full of charm and animated by a most poetical fancy entitled the culprit fay it was written in eighteen sixteen and grew out of a discussion in the group of poets cooper being with them at the time as to the possibility of drawing from american streams poetical inspiration like that found in the historic and legend haunted rivers of scotland drake affirmed that it could be done and in three days it is said he produced his brilliant poem the scene of which is laid in the highlands of the hudson although written previous to the appearance of irving's sketchbook the poem was not published until eighteen thirty five richard henry dana was born in boston and was one of the associate editors of the north american review when bryant's early poems were accepted for that publication in eighteen twenty one he began in new york to publish a new magazine the idle man in which bryant's poems continued to appear when bryant arrived in new york and took his first editorial position in charge of the new york review in eighteen twenty five he included dana's poem the dying raven along with halleck's marco bazaris in the first issue of that magazine mr dana did not produce many poems a volume entitled the buccaneer and other poems was published in eighteen twenty seven one lyric the little beech bird has found a permanent place it is interesting to note that the poet was one of several descendants of anne bradstreet to attain some distinction in verse the larger part of his long life was lived in retirement and his influence in the development of our literature was perhaps strongest indirectly in his criticism and in his personal association with his literary friends his son richard henry dana jr eighteen fifteen to eighteen eighty two is even more widely known than his father as the author of the popular narrative two years before the mast eighteen forty among the minor poets belonging to this period of fresh beginnings several call for mention who were not directly in association with the knickerbocker group john pierpoint seventeen eighty five to eighteen sixty six a native of connecticut and later a unitarian clergyman in boston was the author of the spirited warren's address and of the poem the pilgrim fathers his heirs of palestine and other poems was published first in eighteen sixteen james gates percival seventeen ninety five to eighteen fifty seven a man of remarkable versatility also connecticut born was a physician a geologist and a linguist he wrote fluently although little of his work is familiar now the coral grove is one of his brightest compositions his first volume of poems prometheus appeared in eighteen twenty lydia huntley sigourney seventeen ninety one to eighteen sixty five born at norwich connecticut and for many years head of a famous select school for girls which she established at hartford in eighteen fourteen was a pioneer in the cause of higher education for women 
she was a prolific writer the author of fifty-three volumes in prose and verse her first volume of moral pieces appeared in eighteen fifteen emma h willard seventeen eighty seven to eighteen seventy another connecticut woman who became famous as an educator she conducted the troy female seminary eighteen twenty one to eighteen thirty eight published a volume of poems in eighteen thirty in which was included the well-known song rocked in the cradle of the deep george morris eighteen o two to sixty four who was the author of many poems of sentiment popular in his day is now remembered for only one woodman spare that tree samuel woodworth seventeen eighty five to eighteen forty two is likewise remembered as the author of one song the old oaken bucket eighteen twenty six john howard payne seventeen ninety one to eighteen fifty two whose name is immortalized because of his home sweet home was an actor and writer of plays he was born in new york and lived a wandering life his tragedy brutus eighteen eighteen was his most successful drama the opera clary the maid of milan in which occurs the famous song was written in paris in eighteen twenty three and produced at covent garden london payne was united states consul at tunis from eighteen forty one until his death in eighteen eighty three his remains were removed to washington and there interred francis scott key seventeen seventy nine to eighteen forty three wrote the star-spangled banner in eighteen fourteen key was detained as a prisoner on board a british man-of-war during the bombardment of fort mchenry all night he watched the engagement with keenest anxiety and in the morning wrote the words of his song it was printed immediately and to the air of anacreon in heaven was sung all over the land another national anthem america was written in eighteen thirty two by rev samuel f smith eighteen o eight to nineteen o five the name of washington alston seventeen seventy eight to eighteen forty three should be included in this group for the most distinguished of our earlier american painters was also a leader in literary culture and the author of numerous graceful poems james abraham hillhouse seventeen eighty nine to eighteen forty one of new haven was one of the earliest of americans to attempt the poetic drama on the lines of byron and shelley his dramas appeared in eighteen thirty nine charles fenno hoffman eighteen o six to eighty four founder of the knickerbocker magazine in eighteen thirty three was the author of light and brilliant verse his career was closed by insanity in eighteen forty nine in contemporary estimation at least no other member of the new york group during the thirties and forties quite equaled nathaniel parker willis he was born in portland maine was graduated from yale college in eighteen twenty seven and served his apprenticeship as a man of letters in boston after his removal to new york he was associated with george p morris as editor of the new york mirror in eighteen forty four he made a place on the mirror for poe it was in that paper that the raven was published january eighteen forty five during his visits to england and the continent willis wrote for the mirror or the home journal lively sketches of picturesque scenes and notable people these were gathered in pencilings by the way eighteen thirty five eighteen forty four and loiterings of travel eighteen forty he wrote two plays also bianca visconti eighteen thirty seven and tortesa the usurer eighteen thirty nine the sacred poems eighteen forty three represent his most worthy accomplishment in verse End of part one chapter three Part two of Chapter three of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Three, Part Two, Washington Irving, seventeen eighty three to eighteen fifty nine. First among American writers to obtain universal recognition abroad our first true literary artist and our earliest classic is washington irving if some few among our earlier pioneers in letters had already detected in american soil the germs of a native literature it is irving to whom belongs the honor of successfully developing those germs in works which still preserve their freshness their delicacy and their charm to the inspiration of native themes, Irving owed much of his ample success. Washington Irving was born in the city of New York, April 3, 1783. It was the year which marked the end of the long struggle for liberty and the beginning of peace. The British troops evacuated the city, and the Continental forces assumed possession. Washington's work is ended said mrs irving and the child shall be named after him some six years later we are told when the first president returned to new york then the seat of government a scotch maid servant of the family finding herself and the child by chance in the presence of washington presented the lad to him please your honor said lizzie all aglow here's a baron was named after you and the father of his country gravely laid his hand upon the head of his future biographer and blessed him. The household in William Street was comfortably well-to-do. The father, William Irving, a Scotchman, born to the Orkney Islands, and, until his marriage, an officer upon a vessel, plying between Falmouth and New York, was now engaged in the hardware trade. He was a man of strict integrity, rather severe in his attitude toward life with a good deal of the old strict covenanter spirit in his make-up he took little interest in amusements required that at least one of the half-holidays in every week should be piously employed with the catechism and saw to it that his children were well grounded in sound presbyterian doctrine the mother daughter of an english curate was far less rigid in her views and more vivacious in temperament needless is it to say that the future chronicler of the knickerbocker legends resembled the mother more closely than the father in his inheritance of spirits full of drollery and mischief the boy ran merry riot sometimes a source of perplexity even to the more indulgent parent who once was heard to exclaim oh washington if you were only good he loved music and delighted in the theatre whither in spite of his father's prejudices the boy often betook himself secretly in company with his young comrade paulding irving's training was desultory and his schooling ended at sixteen this cutting short of the school days was due to the state of his health in these early years which forbade confinement or close association with books yet he read and read intelligently becoming familiar with the best especially books of travel voyages and adventure in his rambles about the city for he lived much out of doors he oftenest turned toward the docks dreamingly wandering among the piers and along the waterside with mind apparently stirred by the sight of the shipping and the romantic suggestions of foreign lands up the hudson also he wandered into the highlands and over all the countryside until the suburbs of manhattan and the picturesque region of the catskills were familiar ground nevertheless young irving settled down more or less seriously to a professional career upon leaving school he began the study of law tradition has it however that irving's reading was more upon works of general literature than on those concerned with legal practice his excursions continued. In 1798, he thoroughly explored that idyllic region of Sleepy Hollow, afterward immortalized in the sketchbook. In 1800, he took an extended trip up the Hudson and into the Mohawk Valley. Although he had become 
in 1802, a law clerk in the office of Josiah Hoffman, he was at least, to outward appearance, a good deal of an idler. He had always been fond of society, and entered with zest into its pleasures. In the wide circle of his friendships, he was a conspicuous and favorite figure, admired for his genial, happy gaiety, and for his warmth and kindliness of heart. His first contributions to literature were made at this time. In 1802, he published in the Morning Chronicle, a paper just established by his elder brother, Peter Irving, a series of letters signed Jonathan Oldstyle. These papers were in frank imitation of the Spectator and Tatler essays, full of boyish humor, and directed with the audacity of youth at some of the visible follies of the day. In 1804, Washington Irving was sent abroad by his brothers, who were anxious over the condition of his health. On this first visit, Irving was absent a year and a half. He touched at the Mediterranean ports and incidentally enjoyed the experience of a real capture by pirates. He sojourned four months in Paris, and the same length of time in London. He made acquaintance with many distinguished people and drank joyously of the romance of the old world as found in its scenery its manners its languages its literature and its art the experience was in every way broadening and educational the youth became a man of the world pleased and stimulated as well as restored in health he returned to america early in eighteen o six a year later irving together with his intimate friend james k paulding and his brother, William Irving, joined in a rollicking bit of literary mystification, the publication, at irregular intervals, of a lively little journal entitled Salmagundi. This publication appeared anonymously throughout its successful career, which continued from January 1807 to January 1808, and included twenty numbers. The series was modeled upon the periodicals of Addison and Steele. The style was amateurish, the humor was of a coarser type, but it tickled the fancy of its readers from the start. Its modest program was announced in the first number. Our intention is simply to instruct the young, reform the old, correct the town, and castigate the age. Two years later, in December 1809, appeared Irving's first notable work, the famous Knickerbocker History of New York. Its author was now twenty-six years old. He was still unsettled in his plans, although admitted to the bar. He was not attracted to his profession, nor likely to make headway in its pursuit. The months just preceding had, moreover, been saddened by the experience of an overwhelming sorrow, and the depression of its shadow was not to be relieved for many years. Irving had become tenderly attached to the beautiful Matilda Hoffman, daughter of the gentleman, in whose office he had followed the study of law. She was stricken with fatal illness, and with the gradual fading of her life in the almost constant presence of her devoted lover, the sunshine seemed to fade from the life of this hitherto light-hearted youth. It is a marvel that out of these months of doubt and gloom should have come a volume which, is still recognized as the masterpiece of American humor, for as such the Knickerbocker history may fairly be ranked. This inimitable epic of the dowdy Dutch burghers of New Amsterdam purports to be the serious work of Diedrich Knickerbocker, in whose mystifying personality considerable interest has been aroused by very ingenious advertisements preceding the publication of the book. In the broadly humorous pages of the narrative, Irving's lively imagination runs with reckless abandon. In the golden age of the settlement, the renowned Walter Van Twiller site sits in ominous silence, lost in his doubts, and in the cloud of smoke rising from his pipe, until he emerges from both these hazy envelopments to pronounce judgment in the affairs of the colony. His successor, William the testy, wiry and waspish, in his broad-skirted coat with its huge buttons, cocked hat stuck 
on the back of his head and a cane as high as his chin storms through the city his soul burning like a vehement rushlight in his bosom inciting him to incessant bickering and broils old peter stuyvesant surnamed the headstrong brilliantly clad in brimstone colored breeches stumps with his wooden leg before his admiring people and valiantly leads his army against the swedes in that most awful of battles when the earth shook as if struck by a paralytic stroke trees shrunk aghast and withered at the sight rocks burrowed in the ground like rabbits and even christina creek turned from its course and ran up a hill in breathless terror there is greater significance in the appearance of the knickerbocker history of new york than it first appears from our modern point of view it was the first american book not only was it the starting point of the knickerbocker tradition but it was pleasing testimony to the fact that even in the recently developed civilization of the new world material existed which possessed true literary value and that in the evolution of its artistic spirit america had arrived where she might hope to produce works of the creative imagination where her representatives might be recognized as men of letters abroad as well as at home while the lively humor of knickerbocker proved unnecessarily irritating to some of the descendants of the dutch heroes so cleverly caricatured by irving the good-natured laughter of the historian was understood and heartily echoed by most of irving's contemporaries in england the history was read and applauded it proved the introduction of irving to the literary circle in which he was soon to mingle and sir walter scott declared that it was as good as the work of jonathan swift he afterward told its author that he had read it aloud to his household and that they had laughed over its pages till their sides were sore still irving remained undecided as to future plans of life uncongenial though it was he became a partner with his brothers in the hardware business for the most part attending to the interests of the firm outside of new york he traveled much and was a familiar as well as a welcome figure in the society of philadelphia washington and baltimore during the war of eighteen twelve he bore himself patriotically and offered his services to the state he was in fact made governor's aide and military secretary and was addressed as colonel in eighteen fifteen washington irving made his second trip to europe expecting to be absent but a few months he remained abroad seventeen years he was occupied with the business affairs of the firm which were at this time in a bad way still he found time for occasional visits to some of the principal towns of england making congenial acquaintance with distinguished persons it was in eighteen seventeen that he paid that visit of personal tribute to walter scott which he has so charmingly described in the sketch of abbotsford with the business failure of irving brothers in eighteen eighteen a crisis came in the personal affairs of the younger brother and washington irving betook himself more seriously to literary effort the sketch-book of geoffrey crayon esq was published in america in eighteen nineteen this first series contained the first five of the sketches, including Rip Van Winkle. The completed work appeared in 1820. It proved an instant success in America, and with its issue by a British publisher that same year, Irving's literary fame was established. The genial spirit, delicate humor, and graceful sentiment, together with its flowing diction, placed the sketchbook among the best examples of this familiar essay type in our literature twice in this volume does irving utilize for his sketches material drawn from the old dutch associations of manhattan and the highlands of the hudson in the legend of sleepy hollow and rip van winkle we recognize two masterpieces our most popular classics in the field of the short story among the thirty-odd papers which comprise the sketchbook there are several conceived in the old spirit of the spectator essays 
notably those on the Boarshead Tavern, Westminster Abbey, Rural Funerals, the Pride of the Village, and the Angler. A group of studies dealing with the household pleasures of the holiday season at a typical English hall is particularly attractive, and is our first introduction to the environment which Irving chose as the setting of his next book, Bracebridge Hall. This volume followed in 1822, and two years thereafter, the third in this series of sketchbooks, for all are modeled on the same general plan, The Tales of a Traveler. Irving's best work is found among these sketches and tales. The influence of Addison and of Goldsmith is obvious in the plan and in many details of this work, but the originality of Geoffrey Cran is just as evident. The native vein, which had been worked with such success in Rip Van Winkle, was followed almost as successfully in Dolph Heiliger, and was drawn upon in Kid the Pirate, The Devil and Tom Walker, and Wolfert Weber. These tales exhibit their author as a master in narrative, and are justly regarded as our earliest examples of that highly developed form of literature, the short story. If we choose to group the works of Irving according to their themes, it is easy to find an order of division. Following that first group of early essays, including the Knickerbocker History, the Sketchbook, Bracebridge Hall, and Tales of a Traveler, 1809-24, to 24, we have a well-defined period in the author's life during which his interest centers in the historical records of Spain. In 1826, Irving went to Madrid to make a translation of some important historical documents, then appearing as extracts from the journals of Columbus, impressed with the richness of this material, bearing on the discovery of the New World, he determined to write a life of the great navigator. Thus, the author of the sketchbook, who had recounted with such charm the old Dutch traditions of his native land, creating for the valley of the Hudson an atmosphere of romance which has never vanished, became the first among American writers to draw upon that store of romantic legend and rich historic chronicle which, from the era of the Moors to that of the discoverer, have given fascination and allurement to this poetic and picturesque land of Spain. Besides his life and voyages of Columbus, 1828, and the voyages and discoveries of the companions of columbus eighteen thirty one his most serious undertakings irving wrote a chronicle of the conquest of granada eighteen twenty nine and most attractive of all the spanish series the alhambra eighteen thirty two this last volume is another sketchbook for a period irving dwelt within the walls of this historic structure under the spell of its beautiful architecture and its romantic associations haunting its marble halls gazing from lofty windows over the surrounding landscape or pacing at evening through its deserted gardens melodious with the song of the nightingale it is no wonder that his imagination kindled in the glow of ancient splendor until he wrote in poetic strain of the moonlit nights in this enchanted palace in 1829, Irving had been pleasantly surprised by an appointment as Secretary of Legation to the Court of St. James. It had required, however, the urgency of his friends to induce him to accept the honor. Naturally diffident, he shrank from the public responsibilities of a diplomatic position. Moreover, several literary projects were engaging his attention. However, the poet, once assumed, proved agreeable, and until the fall of 1831 he continued in the position. It was during these last two years of official routine that the series of Spanish volumes was completed. In 1830, Irving had been awarded one of the two medals annually placed by George IV at the disposal of the Royal Society of Literature to be given to authors of works of eminent merit. The historian, Hallam, received the other. Shortly thereafter, the University of Oxford conferred upon the American writer the degree of D.C.L. In 
In May, 1832, Irving, who had been longing for his native land, returned to America, distinguished and admired abroad, to find himself honored and beloved by his countrymen at home. The homecoming was signalized by a spontaneous outburst of hearty welcome, which partly expressed itself in a public banquet tendered by the city of New York to her own humorous historian, the Dutch Herodotus, Diedrich Knickerbocker, as the recipient was facetiously named in a toast. Greatly impressed by the development of his country during the years of his absence, Irving made an extended tour in the South and the West, pushing out into the wild regions of the Pawnee country on the waters of the Arkansas. In his tour of the prairies, 1835. The author describes the life of the ranger and the trapper as he saw it on this excursion. But the characteristic feature of this period in Irving's life is his establishment at Sunnyside, near Terrytown, on the Hudson. This comfortable little farm of earlier Dutch possession has, through its associations with our first conspicuous man of letters, acquired a fame almost as general as that attaching to the home of scott this american abbotsford as it is often called was an ideal location for the residence of knickerbocker it was the old estate of the van tassels its comfortable stone cottage was humorously said to have been modeled after the cocked hat of peter the headstrong at all events a whimsical weathercock brought over from rotterdam perched above its pretentious little tower, and ivy grown from a slip secured at Melrose Abbey, clustered thickly over its walls. It was and is a charming place. Sleepy Hollow itself was hard by, and Sunnyside, in its owner's lifetime at least, had an atmosphere of retirement and seclusion delightfully congenial to the world-weary traveller. Here, surrounded by a bevy of nieces, whose youth and spirits made the old Dutch cottage bright with laughter. Irving felt himself finally at home. So general and widespread was his popularity, however, that many attempts were made to induce Irving's entrance upon a public career. He was urged to accept nominations for the office of mayor of New York and for a seat in Congress. He was even obliged to decline the portfolio of the Secretary of the Navy in President Van Buren's cabinet. The charms of Sunnyside and of his vivacious household held him fast. The literary work of these ten years is comparatively unimportant. A Tour of the Prairies, 1835, Abbotsford and Newstead Abbey, 1835, Legends of the Conquest of Spain, 1836, Astoria, 1836, Adventures of Captain Bonneville, 1837, and sketches contributed to the Knickerbocker magazine complete the record. A lifelong project to write the history of the conquest of Mexico was during this period generously abandoned by Irving when he learned that Prescott was contemplating such a plan, and this, after long preparation, and while actually engaged upon the early chapters of the work in eighteen forty two washington irving was named by daniel webster then secretary of state under president tyler for the post of minister to spain this honor irving accepted although with the regret of departure before him he was overheard murmuring to himself it is hard very hard yet i must try to bear it god tempers the wind to the shorn lamb after four years' residence at Madrid, Irving returned, once more eager for the quiet retirement of Sunnyside. In the congenial environment of his home, it was now his pleasant lot to pass in comfort and in quiet the thirteen years remaining to him. His Life of Goldsmith, 1849, Mohammed and His Successors, 1850, and his noteworthy Life of Washington, 1855 to 59 occupied these last years in 1855 the sketches contributed some years before to the knickerbocker magazine were published under the title of wolfert's roost irving's washington 
represents the most serious labor of his entire career. Depreciated by many critics as without historical value, it has been praised by others. Its power and charm as a literary work have never failed of appreciation. These last years of Irving's life were happy and serene. There is a picturesque sketch of his personal appearance in one of the easy chair papers in Harper's Magazine, which describes the author of Knickerbocker on an autumnal afternoon tripping with an elastic step along Broadway, with low-quartered shoes neatly tied, and a tall cloak, a short garment that hung from the shoulders like the cape of a coat. There was a chirping, cheery, old-school air in his appearance, which was undeniably Dutch, and most harmonious with the associations of his writing. He seemed, indeed, to have stepped out of his own books, and the cordial grace and humor of his address, if he stopped for a passing chat, were delightfully characteristic. He was then our most famous man of letters, but he was simply free from all self-consciousness and assumption and dogmatism. It is this simplicity, this cheeriness of spirit, this native humor and cordial grace of address, which most distinguish the man in his literary work. He is always amiable, a truly lovable soul. For obvious reasons, when we think of the sketchbook and of Bracebridge Hall, we are reminded of the Spectator Essays and Sir Roger de Coverley. But the spirit of Irving was more closely akin to that of Goldsmith than to that of Addison. If, however, I can by lucky chance in these days of evil rub out one wrinkle from the brow of care or beguile the heavy heart of one moment of sadness if i can now and then penetrate the gathering film of misanthropy prompt a benevolent view of human nature and make my reader more in good humour with his fellow beings and himself surely surely i shall not then have written entirely in vain such was the literary aspiration of Washington Irving, as expressed in connection with his works, which are best remembered. An aspiration, perhaps, not the most lofty which can impel a writer in the practice of his art, but one altogether worthy, and in its realization eminently deserving of the appreciation and gratitude of mankind, full of years and modestly happy in his fame, Washington Irving, died at Sunnyside, November 28, 1859. He was buried on a little elevation overlooking Sleepy Hollow and commanding a view of the Hudson, so intimately connected with his writings and associated with his name. The writings of Washington Irving are not, in the largest sense, great, but they have the literary qualities that always charm and are always valued. The student in his reading of this author will be impressed with the gentleness, the geniality, the wholesome enjoyment in life, the hearty sympathy with all things human, which distinguish the winning personality of the man. He will note that the sources of Irving's material are almost entirely in the past, in history, biography, and tradition. Also, that the subjects which attracted his attention are romantic. His whimsical humor, it was that first claimed public recognition. But this was more and more tempered by the delicate sentiment which gives to his sketches and tales their finest flavor. The mere humorist is without sentiment and is never romantic. Irving was an idealist and a lover of romance. One's reading of Irving will doubtless begin with the sketchbook, probably with the world-famous narrative Rip Van Winkle. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is companion piece. Westminster Abbey should be compared with Addison's visit to Westminster Abbey. Next, take the sketches of English manners, Christmas, the stagecoach, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and the Christmas dinner. These papers will furnish a pleasant introduction to the volume entitled Bracebridge Hall, into which the reader may dip at will by no means feeling it necessary to read every sketch. 1. The Stout Gentleman should be carefully studied. It is one of Irving's most brilliant essays, and should be appreciated by the student. 
The story of Dolph Heiliger at the close of the volume takes us back to the Dutch burghers of Manhattan and the legend-haunted shores of the Hudson. The sketch entitled The Author at the opening of the volume and the author's farewell at its close should be included for the insight they afford into the personality of Irving himself. The tales of a traveler exhibit the writer in his most vivacious mood. Charmingly reminiscent of his visit with Scott is Irving's delightful sketch of Abbotsford. The Alhambra contains some of Irving's most attractive work. The imaginative and poetical qualities of his prose are found preeminently in this volume. The wonderful charm of his style in both narrative and descriptive writing is nowhere more in evidence than here. His descriptions of the historic structure, its gardens, its spacious courtyards, the orange and lemon trees silvery in the radiance of moonlight, its pavilions and arcades, the notes of guitar and lovers' serenades, the lulling patter of its fountains. These descriptions are more than sketches. They are word paintings which glow with color and fitly interpret the spirit of romance which abides in the locality and the theme. As example of Irving's more serious historical writing, the account of the discovery of land, book three, chapter four, in the life of Columbus and at the landing of the discoverer, Book Four, Chapter One, are especially suggested. For illustrations of this author's humor in its most rollicking vein, the student is referred to the Knickerbocker History, Book Three, Chapter One, which contains the description of Walter Van Twiller, and Book Five, Chapters One and Eight, wherein the character of Peter the Headstrong is introduced and the account given of the famous battle between the Dutch and the Swedes at the taking of Fort Christina. In reading Irving, the student may feel assured that he is giving his time to a writer who is not only a prince among entertainers, but one who may well serve as a model of prose style. As a master of English, Irving is well-nigh incomparable among American authors, certainly for ease, fluency, vivacity, grace, and elegance, he is yet unsurpassed. The authoritative biography of Washington Irving is The Life by Pierre M. Irving. In the American Men of Letters series, the volume on Irving is by Charles Dudley Warner. A briefer life of the author is that by H. W. Boynton in the Riverside Biographical series. A delightfully written sketch of Irving by George William Curtis may be found among the Easy Chair articles in Harper's Magazine, June 1881, volume 63, page 145, and another in the same magazine, April 1883, volume 66, page 790. An elaboration of this same material is included in Curtis's Literary and Social Essays, Harper's page 239. An interesting English estimate is given in Thackeray's Nil Nisi Bonum, Roundabout Papers, or Harper's Monthly, March 1860. The Critic, March 31, 1883, was published as an Irving centenary number. End of Part 2 of Chapter 3Part 3 of Chapter 3 of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 3, Part 3 James Fenimore Cooper, 1789 to 1851. While the genius of Irving was winning for a newly developed American literature, the recognition and respect of our kinsman in England, his contemporary, James Fenimore Cooper, suddenly appeared in the field of letters to share in the distinction and the honor of widely recognized literary success. Our first notable writer of fiction, 
Cooper was in no sense a follower of the first American romancer, Charles Brockton Brown, nor an imitator of his fantastic and abnormal types. He stands rather as the originator of the novel of adventure in our literature, and is frequently termed the American Scott. It is remarkable that many of the best English novelists have begun their careers as professional storytellers almost by accident. This is true of Richardson and Fielding, the fathers of the modern novel, as it was of their great forerunner, Defoe. Walter Scott was driven to romancing in prose when Lord Byron invaded so successfully his chosen field of metrical romance. Dickens and Thackeray stumbled into fiction through the hedgerows of journalism. George Eliot had found a place for herself in letters before her talent for character creation was discovered. Cooper's experience was somewhat similar to that of Fielding, for the author of Joseph Andrews was provoked into novel writing by his impatience at the tediousness and unnaturalness of Richardson's Pamela and our first american novelist of genius started upon his earliest venture to prove to his wife that he could write a better story than one that by chance he was trying to read the secret of cooper's success is the same as that of these others given the innate talent for narration and the born storyteller will whatever and whenever the exciting cause of his activity in the fullness of time come to his own james fenimore cooper was born in burlington new jersey september fifteenth seventeen eighty nine but before he was quite one year old his father removed his family to a most romantic homestead on the shore of otsego lake in central new york it was the frontier of civilization in that day and on the very edge of the interminable forest that stretched out over the western wilderness the deer the wolf the wildcat and the bear were familiar denizens of the still savage woods the tribes of the six nations still held their powwows and followed the war-path beneath its shade the lonely cabins of more venturesome settlers were still exposed to the horrors of indian attacks the little village of cooperstown itself exhibited all the various phases of pioneer life and character amid these scenes and in this vigorous atmosphere the childhood of cooper was passed it is no wonder that the impressions of these early years should remain vividly painted on his memory to give realistic coloring to the picturesque tales of pioneer life which were later to be written a second period of unconscious preparation came when in eighteen o six having got himself expelled from yale college through some outbreak of youthful folly in his junior year he signed articles on board the merchant ship sterling and entered upon a regular apprenticeship before the mast a year later he secured a commission as midshipman in the United States Navy, and for three years followed the service on the Atlantic and the lakes. In 1809, he was in command of the gunboats on Lake Champlain. Cooper resigned from the Navy in 1811, but his experiences on shipboard had made him master of material, which he afterward used in two or three as admirable sea tales as ever were written. James Fenimore Cooper was thirty years old when he began to write. He was then living in Westchester County, not far from the city of New York, on what was known as the Angovin Farm, a beautifully situated estate commanding an extended view of the Sound. His resignation from the Navy nine years before had been coincident with his marriage to a Miss Delancey, whose father during the revolutionary war had supported the cause of the crown cooper himself had not settled down to any definite vocation least of all had any thought of a literary career entered his head the occasion which led to the writing of his first novel has been mentioned i believe i could write a better story myself he said 
laying down an English novel which had come into his hand. Try, said his wife. In November 1820, the novel, Precaution, was published. No one reads the book today. It is doubtful if many of Cooper's contemporaries read it, but some of his friends seemed to find evidence of promise amid its crudities and encouraged the author to go on. The next year, he had something better to present them. This time, it was The Spy, A Tale of the Revolution. This famous novel had some foundation in historical fact. Cooper had heard from John Jay years before an account of a patriot spy who had been in his service during the war. This was the germ of the narrative. The story was vivid and impressive. It was full of local color. It appealed to the patriotism of readers. In many ways, it was the best piece of fiction that had been produced in this country, and even permitted comparison with Scott. Its success was immediate and unprecedented at home, while in England its success was relatively as great. It was translated into French and then into other European languages. It was dramatized and long remained popular on the stage. Numerous imitations were inspired, and the hero of the novel, Harvey Birch, found a place in the popular heart. Between 1820 and 1830, Cooper produced eleven novels. The Pioneers, 1823, was the first of the famous series by reason of which Cooper holds his rank among the novelists. It was a labor of love. This attempt to interpret the picturesque life of the frontier, and with the final completion of the leather-stocking tales, he had fairly performed the task. This great series, however, was not produced consecutively or in regular order. Cooper's fourth narrative was the pilot, the first of his sea tales, and this appeared in January 1824. The pilot was, like the spy, an experiment, for the real romance of the sea had not been attempted, although the coarsely realistic stories of Smollett had indeed introduced the theme into English fiction. Scott's novel, The Pirate, had been published near the close of 1821, and as the author's identity was still concealed, the apparent familiarity with nautical terms displayed in that narrative occasioned much conjecture. It was declared that it must be the work of a seafaring man. Cooper maintained otherwise, and asserted that the author's ignorance of maritime affairs was betrayed by the book. He went further, and determined to write a sea story to prove his argument. The success of the pilot was almost as brilliant as that of the spy. For the first time, a genuine sea novel had been written, and, in spite of some obvious defects, the pilot remains to this day one of the best novels of its class. The principal characters, Colonel Howard, the American with Tory sympathies, Captain Burrowcliffe, the British officer, Captain Manuel of the Marines, the midshipman Mary, Boltrop, the quartermaster, and above all, Long Tom Coffin, the typical American sailor, are most happily drawn. The female characters, as Cooper would have designated the heroine and her companion, are, as is always the case in his narratives, inane and unreal. On the other hand, the actual hero of the story, John Paul Jones, who appears in disguise and is known only as the pilot, is presented with considerable success. The character certainly maintains the impressiveness of the traditional hero of romance, and presents as commanding a figure as any produced in more recent attempts to portray this imposing personality of revolutionary days. Thus was James Fenimore Cooper fairly launched on his career as a novelist. He wrote prolifically, becoming the author of some thirty works of fiction, of which perhaps a dozen may be called great novels. Besides those already named, Precaution, 1820, the Spy, 1821, The Pioneers, 1823, and The Pilot, 1824. The following are included in the list. Lionel Lincoln, 1825, 
the last of the mohicans eighteen twenty six the prairie eighteen twenty seven the red rover eighteen twenty eight the wept of wish wish eighteen twenty nine the water witch eighteen thirty the bravo eighteen thirty one the headmower eighteen thirty two the headman eighteen thirty three the monicans eighteen thirty five homeward bound eighteen thirty eight home as found eighteen thirty eight the pathfinder eighteen forty mercedes of castile eighteen forty the deerslayer eighteen forty one the two admirals eighteen forty two wing and wing eighteen forty two wyandot eighteen forty three afloat and ashore eighteen forty four miles wallingford eighteen forty four satanstow eighteen forty five the chain bearer eighteen forty six the redskins eighteen forty six the crater eighteen forty seven jack tier eighteen forty eight the oak openings eighteen forty eight the sea lions eighteen forty nine and the ways of the hour eighteen fifty in addition to these narratives cooper was also the author of a history of the united states navy eighteen thirty nine of a biography of one of his shipmates ned myers eighteen forty three of tales contributed to graham's magazine and of ten volumes of travels cooper's literary work was interrupted variously seven years he spent in foreign residence owing to an abnormal sensitiveness to criticism and lack of self-control in the vigorous expression of his opinions he established a reputation not wholly merited for unreasonableness intolerance and pugnacity his unfortunate irascibility of temper precipitated quarrels his belligerent patriotism was aroused by european criticism of american institutions and the manner in which he expressed his protest aroused resentment abroad no less irritating were his own criticisms passed upon some of our national defects and crudities which he noticed after his return to the united states several of his novels were written in the spirit of satire solely as expressions of his censure these are naturally his poorest works he was bitterly criticized in the public press to maintain his contentions he involved himself in lawsuits and indeed won most of the suits but he also won a most unpleasant notoriety becoming in the highest degree unpopular both in america and england and yet with it all cooper was at heart a sincere earnest pure-hearted truth-loving man of honor a fearless and devoted patriot of undisputed power are the novels which comprise the famous leatherstocking group and it is mainly upon the merits of this remarkable series that cooper's claim to distinction rests both at home and abroad the character of the hero natty bumpo or leatherstocking portrayed from youth to old age is unique in literature professor lounsbury the biographer of cooper declares it to be perhaps the only great original character that american fiction has added to the literature of the world it is a fact worthy of note that these indian tales have been translated into nearly all if not all the languages of the civilized globe when the prairie was completed in eighteen twenty seven five editions were published at the same time two appeared in paris one in french and one in english one in london one in berlin and one in philadelphia but the most picturesque statement regarding the popularity of these novels abroad is found in a letter written in eighteen thirty three by morse the inventor of the electric telegraph he says quote, i have visited in europe many countries and what i have asserted of the fame of mr cooper i assert from personal knowledge in every city of europe that i visited the works of cooper were conspicuously placed in the windows of every bookshop they are published as soon as he produces them in thirty-four different places in europe 
they have been seen by american travelers in the languages of turkey and persia in constantinople in egypt at jerusalem at ispahan unquote. the later years of the novelist's life were passed mainly on his estate at cooperstown here with many uncompleted literary projects in mind some of them already begun death came upon him september fourteenth eighteen fifty one the fifteenth of september would have been his sixty-second birthday on the twenty-fifth a public meeting was held in the city hall new york washington irving presided and a committee of prominent literary men was appointed to arrange for suitable memorial exercises these exercises were held in metropolitan hall february twenty fifth eighteen fifty two the audience was representative of the culture of new york daniel webster presided and william cullen bryant delivered the memorial address which was eloquent and just no master of style in the large sense cooper did possess the one essential gift of a great novelist he had a story to tell and told it in such a fashion as to make it real in narrative and description he was eminently successful his word pictures of forest and prairie of land fights and sea fights of storm and wreck are superb the account of the pilots working the frigate from her perilous position on a treacherous coast and the thrilling instant of the ariel's wreck are unsurpassed cooper was prolix he moralized to excess on commonplace themes his characters are often described as conventional rather than living personalities nevertheless in his best narratives interest rarely flags he is fertile in incident good in arousing suspense and not too technical to be clear the reader who to-day takes up the volumes of the leather stocking series in their proper order the deerslayer the last of the mohicans the pathfinder the pioneers and the prairie will not be disposed to question the preeminence of these tales in the field of native historical romance if he adds to these an equal number of the sea tales including the pilot the red rover the water witch the two admirals wing and wing he will find that the genius of cooper does not suffer when brought in comparison with later storytellers who many of them his imitators are cultivating the romances of nautical adventure to-day the last of the mohicans is the volume usually prescribed for reading in school courses it is a pity that the pupils should not first read the deerslayer its predecessor in the series as representative of the sea tales either the pilot or the red rover may be taken the spy will prove an interesting narrative for those who enjoy historical romance while it is impossible satisfactorily to represent any novel by selections from it the first five chapters of the pilot will serve well to illustrate cooper's style in narrative so will chapters twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine and thirty of the deerslayer the first includes the account of the escape of the ariel the second that of natty bumpo's brief captivity among the hurons both are thrilling incidents admirably narrated for a review of cooper's life and work select the james fenimore cooper by thomas r lounsbury it is an ideally written biography one of the best in the series of the american men of letters a short sketch of cooper is the volume by clymer in the beacon biographies bryant's memorial address in the volume of his orations and addresses will repay the reference the atlantic monthly for september nineteen o seven contains an interesting article of cooper by brander matthews end of part three of chapter three Part four of Chapter three of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard.
Chapter Three, Part Four, William Cullen Bryant, seventeen ninety four to eighteen seventy eight. William Cullen Bryant, first of our American classic poets, was born November third, seventeen ninety four, at Cummington, in the beautiful hill region of western Massachusetts. His father, Peter Bryant, of Puritan descent, was a physician and surgeon a country doctor of the old school, skilled by experience, self-forgetful and self-sacrificing. He was a man of literary tastes, and not alone encouraged his son in the development of his talent, but was himself an occasional writer of verse. For several terms he served in the state legislature as representative and as senator. He was revered for his high ideals and was widely known as the good and learned Dr. Bryant. Mrs. Bryant, a descendant of John Alden of the Plymouth Colony, was a woman of great energy and keen moral sense, thoroughly representative of the sturdy New England type. With remarkable persistency, she kept a diary for fifty-three solid years, in itself a moving testimony to her conscientious, practical character. Each year had its little volume, the paper being sometimes cut and bound by her own hands, and sewed with linen thread of her own spinning. One entry in the diary reads as follows. Monday, 3. Stormy. Wind, northeast. Churned. Unwell. Seven at night. A son born. And this brief note records the birth of William Cullen Bryant. As an infant, the future poet was frail and sickly. Gathering strength as he grew, he began early to take unusual delight in the beautiful environment of his country home. Surrounded by rugged hills, the Hussack range not far distant, amid the narrow, winding valleys with their rushing mountain streams and great tracts of woodland, solemn and grand, the boy became a lover of nature. As a child, he prayed that he might be a poet. He was precocious, knew his letters before he was two years old, and was placed in school at four. At nine he was writing little poems, and paraphrased a part of the Book of Job. In these efforts William Cullen was encouraged and criticized by his father, who taught my youth the art of verse, and in the bud of life offered me to the muses. At thirteen he composed a satire the embargo which dr bryant thought worthy of publication this composition aimed at the president thomas jefferson after one of the unpopular acts of his administration appeared in print at boston in 1808 but was afterward discarded by the poet the family was now living with mrs bryant's parents on the farm belonging to ebenezer snell a stern rigorous puritan who nevertheless was not without the grace of humor and the influence of grandfather snell was strong in the development of the growing boy the activities of farm life proving too laborious for william's strength he welcomed the opportunity to secure a college education in eighteen o nine he was sent to the home of an uncle a clergyman in north brookfield to begin the study of latin in eight months he had mastered the grammar had read the new testament all of virgil and the orations of cicero the next year he attended a school in plainfield to learn greek to which he gave himself as he says with his whole soul in september eighteen ten bryant entered williams college as a sophomore the experience of college life was brief however for at the end of seven months the student dissatisfied with the limited advantages then offered by the institution withdrew from williams expecting to enter yale college in the fall but this anticipation was not realized as dr bryant found it impossible to furnish the means necessary to go on and the period of bryant's student life to his own lasting regret was thus abruptly terminated. Bryant's poetical talents were not, however, allowed to lie dormant. In his father's library he found several volumes of the contemporary English poets, which stimulated his imagination and directly influenced his own expression. 
From an early age, he had read Cowper with delight. He was familiar with Thompson's Seasons. He now read Southey and Kirk White. And it is worthy of note that Blair's morbid but remarkable poem, The Grave, which he discovered at this time, moved him with melancholy pleasure. It must have been during this period, in the autumn of 1811, as the poet recalled it, that Thanatopsis was composed. At the close of 1811, Bryant became a law student in an office at Worthington. While diligent in his legal studies, poetry still allured him, and nature's hold upon his affections was strengthened by a new experience. Bryant now read Wordsworth for the first time. The lyrical ballads fell into his hands, and, as he said in later life to his friend Richard Henry Dana, a thousand springs seemed to gush up at once in my heart, and the face of nature of a sudden to change into a strange freshness of life. This influence of the English poet, the supreme interpreter of nature and chief apostle of simplicity and naturalness in verse, is to be recognized not as setting a new model for the Western poet, but as confirming in his mind the truthfulness and value of conceptions already there. Now he learned what nature herself might mean to a genuinely poetic spirit, and a new world lay open before him. He knew that he, too, had received the gift of poetry, yet he pursued his law studies to their natural close, and in 1815 was admitted to the bar. Bryant's twenty-first birthday fell in November 1815. On an afternoon in December, following, the newly-fledged lawyer trudged across the hills seven miles to the village of Plainfield, where it was decided that he should begin the practice of his profession. His spirit was depressed. His ambition seemed thwarted. In the previous year he had written to a friend these lines. And I, that loved to trace the woods before, and climb the woods a playmate, of the breeze, have vowed to tune the rural lay no more, have bid my useless classics sleep at ease, and left the race of bards to scribble, starve, and freeze. We may well imagine that the dreariness of the wintry landscape on that December afternoon reflected the doubt and despondency of Bryant's mood. Then came a glorious sunset and as the young man gazed at the rosy splendor of the clouds, a solitary bird appeared, winging its flight along the horizon. Bryant watched it out of sight, and that evening, in his new abiding place, he wrote his imperishable lines to a waterfowl with its tender clothes. He who, from zone to zone, guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, and the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. Three months later, Bryant removed to Great Barrington, settled down to his profession, and definitely abandoned all idea of being a poet. Meanwhile, there occurred an event which makes very notable record in the history of American literature. Among his Boston acquaintance, Dr. Bryant numbered Mr. Phillips, one of the editors of the new North American Review and by that gentleman he was asked to invite his son, William Cullen Bryant, to contribute to the magazine. To this invitation there came no immediate response from the law office in Great Barrington, but Dr. Bryant, looking through a drawer in an old desk at Cummington, came upon some of the verse which his son had left there at his departure. Among the manuscripts he found the poems Thanatopsis, and the inscription for the entrance to a wood. It was a dramatic discovery. It is said that the poet's father was so affected by what he had found that he ran with the poems to an appreciative neighbor, burst into tears, and exclaimed, Oh, read that! It is Cullen's! Without consulting their author, Dr. Bryant immediately copied the poems, took them to Boston, and placed them in the editor's hands. When Phillips read Thanatopsis to Richard Henry Dana, associate editor of the North American, the latter remarked with a smile, Ah, Phillips, you have been imposed upon. 
no one on this side of the atlantic is capable of writing such verses however the two poems appeared in the review for september eighteen seventeen as already stated bryant had written thanatopsis as nearly as he could recollect in eighteen eleven through some impulse of self-distrust or of diffidence he had refrained from submitting these unusual lines to his father whose kindly criticism he had commonly invited and they had lain thus hidden for six years the poem was a marvellous production for a boy of seventeen the solemn view of death so calm and self-controlled in its presentation so universal and elemental in its stately setting when published in the review the poem lacked its formal introduction the exhortation to list to nature's teachings nor did it then possess the familiar lines of its present effective conclusion the poem began with what is now line seventeen yet a few days and ended with line sixty six and make their bed with thee but it did include those sonorous verses yet not to thine eternal resting place shalt thou retire alone nor couldst thou wish couch more magnificent thou shalt lie down with patriarchs of the infant world with kings the powerful of the earth the wise the good fair forms and hoary seers of ages past all in one mighty sepulchre the hills rock-ribbed and ancient as the sun the vales stretching in pensive quietness between the venerable woods rivers that move in majesty and the complaining brooks that make the meadows green and poured round all old oceans gray and melancholy waste are but the solemn decorations all of the great tomb of man marvellous indeed it was that one so young could rise to such lofty thought and find such impressive phraseology for its expression and no less wonderful that this youth roaming the woods alone should command such skill in the use of blank verse the resonant voice of which has eluded many a clever versifier in the face of this achievement we can only recall the general precocity of bryant's earlier youth and his enjoyment of the poet cowper similar comment may be passed upon the second of these two poems the inscription for the entrance to a wood though expressive of a lighter less solemn mood it does not fall in excellence below its companion piece it speaks of calm tranquillity and deep contentment the forest shades are still the abode of gladness the thick roof of green and stirring branches is alive and musical with birds the rivulet sends forth glad sounds and tripping o'er its bed of pebbly sands or leaping down the rocks seems with continuous laughter to rejoice in its own being a prompt request for further contributions brought forth in the following year an essay on american poetry which is entitled to rank at least as the first attempt by an american writer in the field of literary criticism in it the writer emphasized the truth that for a literature to be national it must be natural and must originate without imitation in the sincere personal expression of individual genius personal experiences which deeply concerned the poet occurred in quick succession in eighteen twenty dr bryant died and bryant's hymn to death was completed by a noble tribute to his father's memory infused with more of personal feeling than had characterized the poems just described in june of the following year came the poet's marriage to miss fanny fairchild a farmer's daughter whose virtues had inspired the lines o fairest of the rural maids in which poe saw the first true poem written by bryant shortly after his marriage the poet was honored with an invitation from the phi beta kappa society of harvard college to read a poem at the coming commencement 
such was the occasion of bryant's first visit to boston and cambridge and his first presentation to the men who were at that time leaders in american scholarship and in literary taste the poem read was the ages its theme is the progress of man through the centuries and the triumph of virtue and liberty in the new world it is composed in the spencerian stanza is on that account perhaps somewhat artificial in its effect and falls below the standard of bryant's best work yet the poem was heartily received and in the minds of many of his hearers the ages placed its author at the very head of american poets one result of this visit was the beginning of a warm and intimate friendship between bryant and richard henry dana a friendship which continued unbroken until death a second result was the publication through the influence of dana and phillips of the first volume of bryant's verse this appeared in eighteen twenty one it was a small pamphlet of forty-four pages bound in brown paper boards and containing the following eight poems the ages to a waterfowl translation of a fragment of simonides written apparently while bryant was in college the inscription for the entrance to a wood the yellow violet song the hunter of the west green river and thanatopsis while not all of bryant's compositions to that time are included these poems were representative of his best work and five of them were never surpassed by any subsequent composition thanatopsis now appeared in its completed form the conclusion having been added possibly to meet some criticism which had deplored the purely pagan sentiment of the poem in its earlier form the poet continued to publish his work appearing at intervals in the review and also in the idle man a short-lived periodical established by richard henry dana in new york in eighteen twenty three he began regularly to send his verse to a new magazine in boston the united states literary gazette which under the editorship of theophilus parsons had a distinguished although brief career from this magazine the poet received and accepted an offer of two hundred dollars a year for his verse to average a hundred lines a month in three years bryant published in its columns between twenty and thirty poems among which were the massacre of sio rispa the rivulet march summer wind monument mountain autumn woods to a cloud and a forest hymn in eighteen twenty five bryant withdrew from the practice of law and in response to the urgency of friends removed to new york here he assumed editorial charge of a new literary publication somewhat heavily weighted by the title of the new york review and athenaeum magazine to its first issue the poet contributed a song of pitcairn's island the same number contained also a poem by dana and halleck's now familiar poem marco bazaris besides halleck and dana the literary men of new york among them paulding willis and james fenimore cooper became his friends and associates the city atmosphere was not altogether congenial nor were the professional ideals of some in the group so high as bryant's they did not take the art of verse so seriously as he who deemed the poet's exercise anything but the pastime of a drowsy summer day his poems during this period still breathed the love of nature and frequently he journeyed back to his massachusetts hills for the freshening of the old environment the career of the magazine was closed in eighteen twenty seven but bryant's editorial course was only beginning he was offered a position on the staff of the new york evening post founded in eighteen o one by alexander hamilton and at this time the best established of the metropolitan newspapers in eighteen twenty nine it became editor-in-chief thereafter financially independent with a political influence national in its scope and a growing reputation as the foremost american journalist he lived his long and useful life 
absorbed in the exacting duties of his profession, universally esteemed and honored by his countrymen, but finding little time for poetic utterance, and producing nothing that compares in beauty or power with the compositions of his earlier years. In 1832, the poet published a volume of his collected pieces, 89 in all. Here were gathered all of his early poems, which he cared to preserve, and those contributed to magazines, including a group of compositions which had appeared in the Talisman, a miscellany of prose and verse, published under Bryant's supervision as an annual in 1828, 1829, and 1830. Of this group, only two poems, The Past and The Evening Wind, are worthy of note. The first was considered by the poet one of his very best. Poe greatly admired the second, which has been said to be less a description than the very thing itself which it describes. The song of Marion's men and the exquisite lines to the fringed gentian were first published in the volume of 1832. During the forty-five years which followed, Bryant's further compositions hardly equaled in amount the verse included in this collection. Bryant traveled much. Three times he visited the Middle West, whither his brothers and their mother had removed after Dr. Bryant's death in 1820. The family was established in central Illinois. The poet's first visit was in 1832. It was in the pioneer period, and the country was still to a large extent picturesque and primitively wild the unshorn fields boundless and beautiful profoundly impressed his mind the journey on horseback across the prairies was the inspiration of one of his finest descriptive poems here he pictures the encircling vastness swept by the shadow of the clouds aflame with tossing golden flowers and still the haunt of wolf and deer his imagination was stirred also with visions of the future. He saw the advancing multitude following fast upon those who had begun already to till and tame this rich garden soil of the waiting west. An interesting incident of the journey was his chance meeting with a company of Illinois volunteers led by a tall, uncouth lad on their way to help put down an Indian uprising under the famous chief Black Hawk. The young captain, whose homely awkwardness and breezy humor had aroused Bryant's interest, was introduced to him as Young Abe Lincoln. Thirty years later, Mr. Bryant himself had the pleasure of introducing Mr. Lincoln to a great audience in New York City as a candidate for the presidency of the United States. In later years, the editor of the Evening Post made several trips to Europe one of which included a tour of Egypt and the Holy Land. The letters sent by him to his paper, descriptive of his travels, were published under the titles Letters of a Traveler, 1850, and Letters from the Far East, 1869. For practically fifty years, William Cullen Bryant was a distinguished citizen of New York. His position as a leading representative of American letters became more and more conspicuous in spite of the infrequency of his verse. He was one of the most successful of public speakers, and on occasions demanding oratory of an exceptional excellence, he was the natural choice. His most notable addresses were those delivered at the meetings commemorating the work of Cooper, Irving, and Halleck. In all his utterances, private as well as public, Two qualities characterize Bryant, dignity and modesty. At a remarkable banquet given in honor of his 70th birthday in 1864, an occasion signalized by the presence and speech of Emerson, and by poetical tributes from the distinguished contemporary poets of Cambridge and Boston, Bryant modestly described himself as one who has carried a lantern in the night and who perceives that its beams are no longer visible in the glory which the morning pours around him. At seventy-three, the poet began to translate the Iliad in blank verse. 
four years later, at the end of 1871, both the Iliad and the Odyssey were finished, and Bryant's excellent translation of Homer was published. The poet's old age was vigorous and hale. From youth, he had been compelled to take unusual care of his health. He adopted strict rules regarding diet and exercise. He rose early and regularly spent between one and two hours in exercising with dumbbells and bar. It was his invariable practice without regard to weather to walk to and from his office in the city, and he discarded the use of the elevator. Bryant was not tall, but erect and well-proportioned. In old age, his appearance was distinguished and everywhere commanded reverence. His leonine head, long silvery hair, and beard made him a venerable figure. He was always courtly, always dignified. To those who did not know, through intimacy, his great kindness of spirit and his genial nature, Bryant seemed cold and austere. Readers of his poems do not need to be told that the religious feeling typical of the Puritan was strong and vital. Besides his residence in the city, Mr. Bryant owned two fine country homes. One was the Snell homestead in Cummington, to which he returned for a short period every year. The other was an estate at Roslyn, Long Island, acquired in 1843, wherein a spacious old-fashioned mansion, dating almost from revolutionary times, he made his principal residence. He took a special delight in farm and garden, personally superintending the care of both and experimenting with fruits and flowers. Here he delighted to receive his friends, and here he unostentatiously entertained many a distinguished visitor from abroad. Mrs. Bryant died in 1866. The poet's death occurred twelve years later. The circumstances were peculiar. A statue to the Italian patriot, Mazzini, was unveiled in Central Park. On the 29th of May, Bryant delivered the address. He spoke bareheaded, the sun shining directly upon him. It was unusually warm for the season, and when he had finished he appeared exhausted. After the exercises, the poet walked across the park with an old friend and ascended the steps of the latter's house. But as he entered the vestibule, he fell suddenly backward through the open door, striking his head on the stone platform. The results were fatal. A fortnight later, he died at his own home in his eighty-fourth year. The funeral services were held in New York. Then, with simple exercises, this poet was buried by the side of his wife at Roslyn. The love of nature is preeminently the theme of Bryant's verse, and his characteristic treatment of this theme is in connection with the elemental experiences, life and death. He is our recognized poet of the forest. No other American singer has interpreted so impressively as he the mystery and sanctity of the woods. To him, the woodland solitude was eloquent of majesty and monition, of benevolence and sympathy. The groves were God's first temples fit shrine for a humble worshipper to hold communion with his maker. Bryant is both descriptive and reflective in his verse. He is often called the American Wordsworth, because he resembled the great English poet in these traits. But Bryant was never an imitator of Wordsworth or of any other poet. He was distinctly original in choice of themes, and true to his own native personality in his expression. He was faithful to the scenes with which he was familiar, and to the spirit of what he himself had observed. In A Winter Piece, for example, a poem which, in its beginning, contains many suggestions of Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey, the atmosphere is unmistakably that of the Massachusetts woods in winter. The snowbird twitters on the beechen bough, the partridge nestles beneath the hemlock, the rabbit, fox, and raccoon have left their tracks in the snow. Smoke wreaths rise among the maples, where the sap is being gathered in brimming pails. The woods ring with the stroke of the axe. And with the first breath of spring, 
lodged in sunny cleft where the cold breezes come not blooms alone the little wind flower whose just opened eye is blue as the spring heaven it gazes at the poet is wont to feel the serious and chastening aspect of these scenes and the spirit of his brooding is often tinged with melancholy he sings the melancholy days are come the saddest of the year of wailing winds and naked woods and meadows brown and sere but this tender poem was intensely personal and was inspired by the death of a dear sister there are other poems in which an entirely different spirit is manifested as the planting of the apple tree and that rollicking bird song robert of lincoln nor could anything be cheerier than the musical lines of that beautiful descriptive poem green river this descriptive quality in bryant's compositions must not be overlooked it is an important feature of his verse we get exquisite illustration of it in the two flower poems the yellow violet and to the fringed gentian both these poems are like many of wordsworth's in their simplicity and in the little moral lessons which they convey a characteristic resented by some critics as an intrusion or a defect although the imaginative insight of each descriptive touch is disputed by nobody it is of course the reflective poems which have given to bryant his lasting fame for various reasons the early composition thanatopsis overshadows all the others the universality of its theme its passionless exultation of spirit its rugged and lofty eloquence its diction so calm so austere and elemental place it yet among the great poetical expressions of the race the hymn to death is an amplification of the same theme in less impressive setting although the utterance of a personal grief gives pathos to its close in a forest hymn which completes this remarkable trilogy of poems on the mortality of man the poet's idea shapes itself more clearly death is indeed universal lo all grow old and die but life is ever reappearing there is not lost one of earth's charms after the flight of centuries the freshness of her far beginning lies and yet shall lie life mocks the idle hate of his arch enemy death the saxon element predominates in bryant's verse his style is simple sometimes severe yet always fitting what crispness of diction do we find for instance in the oft-quoted stanza truth crushed to earth shall rise again the eternal years of god are here but error wounded rise in pain and dies among his worshippers bryant commonly used the so-called iambic ten-syllabled line when he employed the stanza it was usually the four lines of alternating rhymes known as the quatrain but bryant was at his best in blank verse which he used with a facility and power of expression unsurpassed by any other american poet the volume of Bryant's poetry is comparatively small, and its range of subjects is somewhat narrow. He is called stern and cold by many of the critics, and it is true, as they point out, that the poet lacked humor, and his poetry passion. And yet, in spite of these and other limitations, a high estimate must be placed upon the value of Bryant's work, and on its significance in the development of our national literature he was original natural and sincere he drew his inspiration not from the poets he read but direct from nature as he saw her in the mountains and the valleys the trees the brooks and the flowers of his new england home he proved that native themes were as poetical in america as in england and that the true poet finds his material at his hand in his poems as in his profession and private life he celebrated the virtues typical of the puritan truth purity moral earnestness reverence and faith 
he wrote a few poems which must remain a permanent possession in our literature and what is after all more notable yet he laid a safe and substantial foundation for american verse the poem thanatopsis calls for careful study not only that the student may accurately grasp its central thought its message but also that he may really appreciate the superb quality of its diction as shown in the choice of words and moulding of phrases the inscription for the entrance to a wood should be compared with it to a waterfowl the yellow violet and to the fringed gentian may be read in connection and the poet's manner of pointing a moral lesson noted wordsworth poem to the small celandine might be read for comparison also freneau's stanzas on the wild honeysuckle other of bryant's descriptive poems like green river the prairies and the evening wind should be read with especial reference to the spirit and truthfulness of the description the song of marion's men the massacre at sayo not yet and our country's call exhibit another phase of bryant's verse the planting of the apple tree and robert of lincoln illustrate still another a lifetime is of interest as a summary of the poet's experiences and the poet as an expression of his own ideal a forest hymn the death of the flowers and the flood of years eighteen seventy six are too important to be omitted from the list and it is hoped that the study of bryant's life will have aroused a desire to read most if not all of the poems mentioned in the preceding pages the only complete edition of bryant's poems is that edited by park godwin his associate on the evening post and his son-in-law published by appleton mr godwin is also the author of the authoritative biography of the poet appleton a more compact biography is the interesting william cullen bryant by john bigelow in the american men of letters series houghton mifflin company the most recent life of bryant is that by william a bradley in the english men of letters series macmillan critical comment will be found in e p whipple's literature and life stedman's poets of america and richardson's american literature there are poetical tributes to bryant by stedman stoddard whittier holmes and lowell with the stirring lines of lowell's birthday offering on board the seventy six read also his humorous characterization of bryant in a fable for critics eighteen forty eight end of part four of chapter three end of chapter three Part One of Chapter Four of A Student's Guide to American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Four Philosophy and Romance. Section One The Literary Development of New England. The literary achievements of the Knickerbocker group of writers were practically accomplished by 1850. During the larger part of that first half century, there had been no question of the literary predominance of New York. New England had played, comparatively, an inconspicuous part in the field of national literature. A few of Longfellow's earliest poems were published previous to 1830 and some of Whittier's also, but it was really nearer 1840 than 1830 that either obtained general recognition as a poet. Emerson's first series of essays was published in 1841, and Hawthorne's Mosses from an Old Manse in 1846. The Scarlet Letter did not appear until 1850. It was, nevertheless, a period of intellectual activity. In Boston and Cambridge, new ideas were stirring the minds of the thinkers, and throughout the New England states, which were advancing rapidly in material prosperity 
by the establishment of manufacturing interests and the building up of a rich trade with the east indies the intellectual life of the people was feeling the stimulus of its own energy in rather remarkable degree the first phase of this new awakening is recognized in the so-called unitarian movement which spread over new england during the early years of the century opposition to the calvinistic doctrines of the presbyterian and other orthodox denominations had existed in the colonies even in revolutionary times but it was not till near the end of the eighteenth century that this opposition assumed the aspect of an important religious controversy the arena in which john cotton and his grandson cotton mather roger williams and the many lesser controversialists of the colonial period had waged their theological battles was again the scene of an intellectual and religious agitation which in its immediate effects and subsequent influence was more far-reaching even than that celebrated movement of the preceding century the great awakening of seventeen thirty four to forty four in eighteen o five harvard college the fountainhead of new england literature elected a unitarian as professor of divinity by the end of the first decade nearly every prominent congregational pulpit in eastern massachusetts was held by a preacher of unitarian doctrine the theological seminary at andover was founded in eighteen o seven to combat the new teaching moses stewart seventeen eighty to eighteen fifty two and leonard woods seventeen seventy four to eighteen fifty four became famous as teachers in this institution and as defenders of the orthodox creed lyman beecher seventeen seventy five to eighteen sixty three the father of henry ward beecher and harriet beecher stowe was the ablest and best-known champion of orthodoxy in new england in eighteen twenty six he was called from his church in litchfield connecticut to a prominent boston pulpit that he might have a position on the firing line the recognized leader of the unitarians was william ellery channing who was born at newport rhode island and received his education at harvard he became the minister of a boston parish in eighteen o three cultured eloquent and a persuasive writer he became famed throughout new england for his oratorical gifts and as a theologian in seriousness of purpose and in purity of character channing represented the strength and virtue of the old puritan stock his portrait presenting him in the conventional black gown of the clergyman with the white bands at the neck shows a face highly intellectual and refined with features delicate spiritual almost ascetic in their type the influence of dr channing was strongly felt a sermon preached by him at an ordination in baltimore in eighteen nineteen is especially famous as a rallying cry of unitarianism prove all things hold fast that which is good was his text the sacredness of the individual conscience and the freedom of individual thought was his theme while his writings are largely controversial he was also a graceful essayist and his literary influence was felt by contemporary writers who were stirred by his thought and passion a second phase of this quickening in the intellectual life of new england appears in the development of transcendentalism closely allied with the religious movement just described and including many prominent unitarians within its circle transcendentalism nevertheless was not unitarianism the latter was a religious movement it grew into the liberal denominations of the present day transcendentalism designates a school of abstract thought a philosophy general in its application to life and conduct it was distinctly local in its development this new school of abstract ideas arose among the intellectual leaders of boston and cambridge during the second and third decades of the century 
the teachings of german and french philosophy the influence of goethe of coleridge and carlyle had a part in its origin the transcendentalists were idealists they opposed materialism in every form they regarded matter as an appearance and thought as the reality the old platonic system the doctrine of ideas was practically the basis of their belief they emphasized the necessity of the individual and the free expression of the individual mind they chose to be led by the inner light the highest revelation is that god is in every man said emerson i believe in this life i believe it continues as long as i am here i plainly read my duties as writ with pencil of fire they thought and talked and wrote upon the truths which cannot be demonstrated which lie beyond the sphere of the established which transcend human experience and ordinary knowledge they were deeply intent upon reform social civil and religious they were philanthropic in purpose and members of the group were often associated in schemes for the betterment of society which usually proved utopian dreams in july eighteen forty a quarterly periodical was started by the transcendentalists as the organ of their views at first under the editorship of margaret fuller a talented but visionary woman whose name is prominently associated with the movement and later under that of emerson the dial ran its honorable course for about four years when it was discontinued for lack of financial support to this famous magazine emerson contributed essays and poems while others of the coterie bronson alcott george ripley theodore parker james freeman clark and henry david thoreau were among its best-known writers carlyle's comment upon the early numbers of the dial is probably suggestive of the general attitude of those outside the circle toward these enthusiastic idealists but it is all good and very good as a soul wants only a body which want means a great deal many of the new views were far from clear and many hapless failures resulted from these utopian experiments at the same time some practical progress was made and through this campaign of debate in more than one direction was built the road to reform in eighteen forty one an ideal community one of several such experiments was established by some of these enthusiasts at brook farm in west roxbury nine miles from boston george ripley was the promoter and leader of the movement it attracted some whose names were to be well known in later days the young george william curtis was an interested member and so was charles a dana afterward the distinguished editor of the new york sun for a time also nathaniel hawthorne was a member of the colony and ten years later utilized some phases of his experience in the blithedale romance emerson was interested and an occasional visitor although not an active brook farmer himself the experiment was not altogether a failure there were difficulties all along but for five years the community flourished demonstrating the possibilities of a simple rational method of living until in eighteen forty six there came a disastrous fire and soon afterward the farm was sold the general influence of the thought and labors of the transcendentalists was stimulating in high degree the intellectual and moral growth of the period in spite of the numerous isms which flourished among them it stirred the minds of men and in general wrought for culture and for philanthropic and progressive measures it enlisted the eager enthusiasm of young lowell in temperance reform and for a brief period in the agitation for woman suffrage it labored with whittier and garrison and phillips in the cause of abolition it reflected the intellectual activity of emerson and if longfellow holmes and lowell in mature life 
were not personally identified with the cult, their ideas were indirectly colored by the influence which transcendentalism set afoot. It was an important current in New England culture and was significant of what Mr. Barrett Wendell has appropriately called the Renaissance of New England. Of this latter phase of the movement, Ralph Waldo Emerson is the distinguished representative. A leader among these students of ideas, a preacher of moral and intellectual truths, a poet, a philosopher, a teacher, his influence upon the intellectual life of New England was stimulating in the extreme, while the effect of his writings on American thought and letters can hardly be reckoned. Among the minor authors in this interesting group, there are three or four that call for comment, although necessarily brief. George Ripley, 1802 to 1880, was a Harvard graduate and in 1826 became minister of a Unitarian society in Boston. He became conspicuous as a leader among the transcendentalists with the founding of the Brook Farm community, was active as a writer, and together with Charles A. Dana edited the New American Cyclopedia, 1857-68. to Like others of the Brook Farm colonists, Ripley enjoyed the helpful friendship of Horace Greeley, and wrote, under Greeley's patronage, scholarly reviews for the New York Tribune. He made, however, no permanent contribution to literature. Amos Bronson Alcott, 1799-1888, famous for his eccentricities and for the unintelligibility of his mystical utterances, set out at fifteen as a peddler. With the design of adding to the family income, he traveled through a part of the South, but returned with an empty pack and four hundred dollars in debt. This experience was typical of later ones. He was nothing if not unpractical. At twenty-six, he tried school teaching in Connecticut, but his peculiar ideas kept him moving from place to place. It is only fair to add that many of Alcott's original methods are established principles in the school systems of today. In 1834, he opened a school in Boston, which lasted for five years. Attracted by Emerson's presence in Concord, Mr. Alcott removed thither. The most extreme notions of the transcendental brotherhood were pushed by him beyond the extreme. With an idea of improving upon the Brook Farm experiment, he organized a new community at Fruitlands. His idealism was so strong that he would not permit canker worms to be disturbed, and forbade the planting of such vegetables and roots as grow downward instead of upward into the air. After the failure of this communistic experiment, he held select conversations, which became a settled institution in Concord. Like Emerson, he traveled to some extent in the West holding conversations, and expounding the transcendental ideas. To the dial he contributed his Orphic sayings, which aroused much ridicule from those not of the elect. In 1879, the Concord Summer School of Philosophy and Literature was established, and of this Mr. Alcott was the recognized head. Alcott's essay on Emerson and his Concord Days 1872, are his most readable remains. A more practical member of the family was Louisa May Alcott, 1832-88, to who struggled hard to offset her father's deficiencies on the bread and butter side of existence. She possessed talent as well as perseverance, and success came with the publication of Her Little Women in 1868. No more popular series of stories for young people has ever been produced than that which contains this book and its sequel, Little Men. Her later stories, Joe's Boys, An Old-Fashioned Girl, Eight Cousins, and Rose in Bloom, have, with their naturalness, humor, and humanness, well maintained the popularity of Miss Alcott's earlier work. Margaret Fuller, perhaps, commands more of interest than any other figure in the transcendental group. 
a brilliant intellect marred by a somewhat morbid egotism characterized her literary work she shared in the erratic tendencies of her associates but surpassed most of them in critical ability and to a certain extent in literary expression like alcott margaret fuller conducted conversations for the benefit of boston ladies she was prominent in the transcendental circle at concord and was warmly esteemed by emerson a frequent visitor at brook farm margaret fuller is assumed to be the original of zenobia in hawthorne's blithedale romance she too experienced the practical friendliness of horace greeley and in eighteen forty four became the literary critic on the tribune devoted to philanthropy and reform she was the friend of the italian patriot mazzini in eighteen forty seven she visited italy and during her residence there was secretly and romantically married to the marquis Ossoli. in eighteen fifty the pair determined to come to america and with their infant son set sail from leghorn within sight of the american coast their vessel encountered a severe storm and was wrecked the entire family perished it is undoubtedly to this tragic event that the general interest in the personality of margaret fuller is in part due but her place in american literary history is deserved the most important of her works are woman in the nineteenth century eighteen forty four and papers on literature and art eighteen forty six end of part one of chapter four part two of chapter four of a student's history of american literature by william simons this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 4, Part 2. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882. Ralph Waldo Emerson came of the academic class. His ancestors for five generations had been scholars, and most of them had been ministers. His father, William Emerson, minister of the first church in boston was a man of good sense dignified after the manner of the old new england type and emphatic in the expression of his views the mother of ralph waldo was known for her patience her gentle courtesy her quiet dignity and serenity of spirit among the early companionships of the household there was another which had a lasting influence in the development of emerson's character that of an aunt mary moody emerson whose strong intellectuality was of the sort which distinguished emerson himself ralph waldo emerson was born may twenty fifth eighteen o three in the parsonage on summer street in boston not far from the house in which franklin was born almost a century before his boyhood was passed in an atmosphere of intellectuality and of literary effort in 1804, the Reverend William Emerson organized what was known as the Anthology Club, and edited a publication of the club, the Monthly Anthology, or Magazine of Polite Literature. The circle of contributors included John Quincy Adams, Daniel Webster, and much scholarly talent. The famous Boston Athenaeum Library was an outgrowth of this club, and although with the death of mr emerson in eighteen eleven the anthology ceased publication the appearance of the north american review in eighteen fifteen is regarded as a revival of the earlier magazine waldo was eight years old at his father's death and the household was in serious financial straits there were five boys to be clothed and fed and educated as family tradition and innate talent required by heroic exertion and a most rigid frugality mrs emerson succeeded in realizing her ambition for her sons it is related that one winter when times were especially hard in the family ralph and his brother edward 
had but one greatcoat between them and had to take turns in going without and in bearing the taunts of their schoolfellows calling after them whose turn is it to wear the coat to-day it is said too that ralph waldo was obliged on one occasion to forego the reading of the second volume of some work drawn from a circulating library because the pennies needed to secure it were not to be spared yet out of the enforced economy and the life bare of material comfort the boys emerged sweet-tempered nobly mannered and with the best academic training to be had all but one were graduates of harvard college there are not many records of emerson's school days he studied at the boston latin school and entered harvard at fourteen through his appointment as president's messenger he had his lodging free in the president's house and his board was paid by waiting on table in the commons he was not conspicuous as a student yet was always the scholar not talkative his utterances were well weighed deliberate and with a certain flash when he uttered anything that was more than usually worthy to be remembered gentle and amiable his personality lacked a little perhaps in masculine vigor for mathematics emerson had no faculty but in all subjects of a literary sort he took a good stand like most students who develop into geniuses he read widely in authors not prescribed in his course he won prizes in english composition and at his graduation in eighteen twenty one delivered the poem for the class after leaving harvard emerson taught for several years at first in a suburban school for girls kept by his brother william where the young instructor does not seem to have been altogether charmed with the teacher's lot it was at this time that he composed one of his most widely known poems good-bye proud world i'm going home the latter half of this poem is descriptive of the sylvan retreat amid the rocks and pines of canterbury whither mrs emerson had recently removed a district now included within the limits of franklin park the lines are significant of the spirit of this nature lover at the age of twenty oh when i am safe in my sylvan home i tread on the pride of greece and rome and when i am stretched beneath the pines where the evening star so wholly shines i laugh at the lore and the pride of man at the sophist schools and the learned clan for what are they all in their high conceit when man in the bush with god may meet emerson was also employed in a characteristic new england academy in the country near lowell his manner in the schoolroom was impressive his self-control was perfect he never punished except with words his last experience as a schoolmaster was in cambridge here he is remembered as appearing every inch a king in his dominion or rather like a captive philosopher set to tending flocks resigned to his destiny but not amused with its incongruities in eighteen twenty three emerson began studying for the ministry descended from a long line of ministers deeply spiritual in nature and equally a passionate seeker after truth full of ideals of hopefulness and philanthropy this was the natural course but his activities in this profession were brief he was ordained in eighteen twenty nine as associate pastor of the second church in boston the historic old north which in the preceding century had flourished for sixty years under the ministry of the mathers father and son it was now one of the important pulpits of unitarianism the young minister who in a few months became the sole incumbent took an active interest in public affairs he was a member of the school board and was chosen chaplain of the state senate he invited anti-slavery lecturers into his pulpit and helped philanthropists of all denominations in their work three months after his ordination however emerson found himself fettered even by the liberal doctrines of the unitarians and in eighteen thirty two disapproving the continuance of the lord's supper 
as a permanent right, he presented his scruples in a sermon to his parishioners. His views not receiving their support, he quietly withdrew from the church. The young wife, Ellen, a delicate girl of seventeen when Emerson married her soon after his ordination, died in 1831. The strain of this bereavement, combined with that of his separation from his church, affected his own health, and on Christmas Day, 1832, Emerson, urged by his friends to take a sea voyage, sailed from Boston on a small vessel bound for the Mediterranean. He visited Italy, France, and England, and apparently found his greatest satisfaction in the opportunity thus afforded to meet the noted men whom he had long wished to see. Coleridge he visited just one year before that writer's death. He saw Wordsworth also, then sixty-three years old, and passed the time of poetical power. And then he went to see Carlyle, who was living on his lonely farm at Craigenputtock. Of course, we could do no other than welcome him, wrote Carlyle to his mother, the rather as he seemed to be one of the most lovable creatures in himself we had ever looked on. He stayed till next day with us, and talked and heard talk to his heart's content, and left us all really sad to part with him. With this congenial introduction began the lifelong friendship of the two great moralists. The Scotch essayist was seven years the senior of his guest. By his translations, his essays, and his life of Schiller, Carlyle had already won recognition from many like Emerson, who were deeply interested in the newly discovered fields of German literature. This was also the year, 1833, in which Carlyle was putting forth his most characteristic work, the Sartor Resartus, and one result of this visit was the publication of that work during the following year, in America, under the direction of Emerson. In 1834, Ralph Waldo Emerson became a resident of Concord. For a year he lived with his mother in the old-fashioned, gambrel-roofed house, built as a parsonage for his grandfather, who, in his time, had served the Concord Church. It was this house which subsequently came to be occupied by the novelist Hawthorne, and was given fame in the title of his mosses from an old manse. In 1835, Emerson was married to Miss Lydian Jackson of Plymouth, and settled in the house, then on the edge of the town, where for almost fifty years he lived his serene and uneventful life. The quiet village has been a famous place ever since the day when, by the rude bridge, the embattled farmers fought the British soldiers in that first conflict of the Revolutionary War, and its fame has grown more enduring because of the remarkable group of thinkers and writers who made the town their home. To Emerson, the surroundings were peculiarly attractive. From his home, a path led through open fields to the shore of beautiful Walden Pond. There was plenty of space about him. Meandering through an expanse of green meadow land, crept the sleepy Concord River, the musketaquid of his palm, between its willow-bordered banks. More than all else, he loved the woods, a forty-acre lot of woodland he bought by the shore of Walden that he might feel the sense of possession in it. In My Garden, he sings its beauty and significance to him. In constant communion with nature, he wrote of her in prose and verse. To him, God was near in every form of natural life, and he loved to express in his writings the deep spiritual significance of what he saw and heard. He said, I go to the God of the wood to fetch his word to men. There was never mystery, but tis figured in the flowers. Was never secret history, but birds tell it in the bowers. Among his townsmen, Emerson moved, a familiar and welcome figure. His duties as a citizen and neighbor were never shirked. Everybody knew the tall, spare man, with a slight stoop of the shoulders, the shrewd, wise, tender face, with its smile, 
like the mild radiance of a hidden sun. Whenever he spoke in the town hall or in Concord Church, they turned out in large numbers to listen to his address with neighborly pride and due respect, if not with entire comprehension of his utterances. There was, too, a circle of intimate friends about him. Some, like Bronson Alcott and Margaret Fuller, attracted thither by the presence of one generally recognized as the ablest prophet of transcendentalism. The young and talented Thoreau, a disciple, although a very independent one, early engaged his interest. In 1842, Hawthorne came to Concord, and for five years dwelt in the old manse. Occasionally, too, there appeared fantastic dreamers with queer schemes of social reformation in their heads, who sought out Emerson in his retreat as if to consult the oracle at some sacred shrine. Altogether, the little New England town became closely identified with that strong intellectual movement, which Emerson, more than any other American writer, had inspired. In 1836, there was published anonymously in Boston a little book of about a hundred pages, entitled Nature. This was Emerson's first characteristic utterance through the printed essay. A reflective prose poem is what Dr. Holmes calls it, beautiful in its exaltation of spirit. Poetical, mystical, vague, incomprehensible, doubtless to many an unsympathetic reader. It was the first public enunciation of the transcendental principles on which much of the subsequent teaching was based. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face, we through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition, and a religion by revelation to us, and not the history of theirs? This is the question which serves to start the discussion. Under the heads, commodity, beauty, language, and discipline, the essayist speaks of the varied advantages which our senses owe to nature. A characteristic passage is the following. In the woods is perpetual youth. Within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign. A perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the woods we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air, and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. Nature attracted some attention, aroused some hostile criticism. Its ideas were pronounced pantheistic, and considerable ridicule was bestowed upon the transcendental notions of the Concord sage. In the following year, 1837, Emerson delivered before the Phi Beta Kappa Society of Harvard College his famous address on the American scholar, and with this notable utterance emerged clearly into the light of public recognition. This address is first of all a challenge of academic ideals in that day, and then a plea to the scholar for a larger vision of his relation to nature, a braver attitude toward the conventions inherited from the past, a stronger confidence in the sacred, the divine character of his own perception of truth, and a call to participate in the life of his generation, not only to think, but to live. The books which once we valued more than the apple of the eye we have quite exhausted. First one, then another. We drain all cisterns, and waxing greater by all these supplies, we crave a better and more abundant food. The man has never lived that can feed us ever. I ask not for the great, the remote, the romantic. What is doing in Italy, in Arabia, what is Greek art or 
provencal minstrelsy i embrace the common i explore and sit at the feet of the familiar the low in sentences like these did the orator assail the authority of scholastic tradition his words disturbed the grave dignity of many in his audience but to the younger generation of harvard graduates who sat under the spell of his eloquence emerson spoke a message of wonderful power fear always springs from ignorance in self-trust all the virtues are comprehended the unstable estimates of men crowd to him whose mind is filled with the truth as the heaped waves of the atlantic follow the moon suggestive indeed are these words to-day more impressive and inspiring were they then this grand oration was our intellectual declaration of independence says dr holmes the young men went out from it as if a prophet had been proclaiming to them thus saith the lord the oft-quoted comment of lowell gives us a vivid impression of the effect produced by this address it was an event without any parallel in our literary annals a scene to be always treasured in the memory for its picturesqueness and its inspiration what crowded and breathless aisles what windows clustering with eager heads what enthusiasm of approval what grim silence of foregone dissent from this time on emerson was a familiar figure on the public platform his occasional addresses were regarded as events of importance in the literary and intellectual world the public lecture system the lyceum as it was usually called had grown into popular esteem throughout new england mr emerson was looked upon as the most eminent lecturer in the field his tours were extended through the middle west as far as st louis and to this day in thriving illinois and indiana towns one may hear it mentioned with complacent local pride that in such or such a year emerson spoke there the unmethodical manner in which these lectures were prepared is perhaps exaggerated by those who who have dwelt on this feature of emerson's work from his commonplace book or journal emerson called the ideas epigrammatically recorded which touched his theme and thus he built the discourse almost haphazard it would seem to a formal writer without the usual regard to logic or coherence in composition yet these sharp short often paradoxical sentences weighty with truth yet brilliant with their illuminating thought keenly witty and delicately fanciful made a most effective appeal to the audiences prepared to appreciate them they stirred the minds and kindled the souls of many it was a new voice in the land a challenge and a prophecy which came to have vital force in the intellectual and moral growth of thoughtful americans in that generation there was no vociferousness in emerson's lecturing calm simple almost monotonous in delivery without gestures he read from his notes with deliberation and with frequent pauses but his voice was melodious and resonant and all agree in the charm felt by his auditors he did not prolong his discourse to weariness at the end of the sixty minutes without climax he stopped lecturing he found laborious he followed it from necessity and yet in spite of the discomforts of long journeys and of unhomelike inns he enjoyed too the freedom of expression on the platform it more than supplied the opportunities of his old boston pulpit and immeasurably amplified the congregation of his hearers for to the last mr emerson remained a preacher the first series of Emerson's essays appeared in 1841. It included these now familiar discourses. History, Self-Reliance, Compensation, Spiritual Laws, Love, Friendship, Prudence, Heroism, The Oversoul, Circles, Intellect, and Art. These were, for the most part, transcripts from his lectures. The favorite doctrines appear felicitously expressed 
trust thyself every heart vibrates to that iron string whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds to be great is to be misunderstood insist on yourself never imitate in such compact oracular utterances emerson loved to crowd his thought taken from their immediate setting they appear yet more paradoxical than when read in their connection these brief and startling epigrams illustrate both the strength and the weakness of this author's style many of these statements are debatable extreme application of every precept to the general conduct could hardly result in anything but confusion and turmoil nevertheless these ideas were intensely stimulating and if they made readers think so much the better agreement with the writer's thought was by no means essential trust thyself was the burden of his teaching even to our generation these essays of emerson are illuminating and quickening epistles which have their greatest value perhaps in arousing and confirming a wholesome independence of mind the second series of essays published in eighteen forty four included the poet experience character manners gifts nature a second handling of this theme politics nominalist and realist and the new england reformers in eighteen forty seven a cordial invitation to address lyceum audiences in england and scotland led to a second trip across the atlantic the visit was a success emerson delivered many lectures was warmly received renewed the acquaintance with carlyle and made many new friends the material of these lectures appeared in eighteen fifty under the title representative men the opening chapter is on the uses of great men their most efficient and enduring service being that of introducing moral truths into the general mind the characters selected for study and interpretation are plato or the philosopher swedenborg or the mystic montaigne or the skeptic shakespeare or the poet napoleon or the man of the world and Goethe, or the writer while the volume suggests a comparison with carlyle's heroes and hero worship it will be seen that the plan and idea of emerson's work are entirely different from his in english traits eighteen fifty six emerson produced a thoughtful appreciative and not uncritical study of british personality and the significance of the national character these two volumes stand by themselves as the only works of the essayist having a formal structure and definite plan the first collection of emerson's poems appeared in eighteen forty six he had been writing verse for many years and some of his best-known compositions the problem wood notes the sphinx and others had appeared in the dial some like the famous concord hymns had been heard upon notable occasions in 1867, a second collection appeared under the title May Day and Other Pieces. The poetry of Emerson is, as one would expect to find it, intellectual, subjective, abstract. It is unemotional and often austere. I do not belong to the poets, but only to a low department of literature, the reporters, suburban men. Emerson had declared, writing to Carlyle, again he had said with more of justice to his gift i am born a poet of a low class without doubt yet a poet that is my nature and my vocation while criticism has often joined in the poet's own depreciation of his power there are also many who find the fire of genuine poetic genius in his verse stedman calls him our most typical and inspiring poet the thought the substance of his verse has the originality and vital strength of all his discourse the poetical form is uneven thus does emerson write of the poet great is the art great be the manners of the bard he shall not 
his brain encumber with the coil of rhythm and number but leaving rule and pale forethought he shall i climb for his rhyme pass in pass in the angels say into the upper doors nor count compartments of the floors but mount to paradise by the stairway of surprise there are numerous passages of wonderful simplicity and beauty in the poetry of emerson lines like the familiar quatrain in voluntaries so nigh is grandeur to our dust so near is god to man when duty whispers low thou must the youth replies i can and the perfect lines in wood notes thou canst not wave thy staff in air or dip thy paddle in the lake but it carves the bow of beauty there and the ripples in rhymes the oar forsake in poems like the humble bee the snowstorm the rhodora wood notes monadnock musket equipped emerson is at his best and ranks next to bryant if not as his equal among american nature poets he describes the northward flow of spring with its radiant life as poured the flood of the ancient sea spilling over mountain chains bending forests as bends the sedge faster flowing o'er the plains a world-wide wave with a foaming edge that rims the running silver sheet of the dawn he writes oh tenderly the haughty day fills his blue urn with fire these are the phrases and figures of a true poet but a large part of emerson's verse is oracular like the paradoxes in his prose hence it is that much is said derisively of such orphic breathings as we find in the sphinx and brahma with its disconcerting if the red slayer think he slays or if the slain think he is slain they know not well the subtle ways i keep and pass and turn again subtly symbolic as this group of poems is it appeals to the intellect and appeals strongly when once the reader finds the key while emerson never strikes the chord of passion there is one poem and that one of his best wherein we feel the human heartbeat of a human grief in eighteen forty two the poet lost his little son a perfect little boy of five years and three months he wrote carlyle a few weeks ago i counted myself a very rich man and now the poorest of all in threnody we have the calm philosophic yet very feeling expression of the father's experience it is not disconsolate to him who so often interpreted to others the mystic whisperings of the great mother teacher there comes a response from nature's heart saying what is excellent as god lives is permanent hearts are dust hearts loves remain hearts love will meet thee again house and tenant go to ground lost in god in godhead found emerson's attitude on public matters during the period of agitation preceding the civil war is interesting his friends in the transcendental coterie were vigorous abolitionists with characteristic self-restraint emerson refrained from violent utterance he spoke against slavery but not aggressively against the south he proposed a plan to purchase the slaves from the planters because it is the only practical course and is innocent as the struggle developed however his position on the issue of the hour was perfectly clear he stood with wendell phillips when the speakers were mobbed at a public meeting in boston and when the emancipation proclamation went into effect january first eighteen sixty three he read the vigorous stanzas of his boston hymn he paid an eloquent tribute to lincoln in an address at concord in april eighteen sixty five and was the orator at the services held by harvard college in memory of her sons fallen in the war when lowell read his commemoration ode emerson's literary activity continued throughout a period of forty years in eighteen sixty eight 
1869 and 1870, he delivered courses of lectures at Harvard, which furnished the material for the volume entitled Natural History of Intellect. Society and Solitude was published in 1870. Among the twelve essays included under this title is the one on books, in which occur the oft-quoted but somewhat dubious rules. Never read any book that is not a year old. Never read any but famed books. Never read any but what you like. It is in the Essay on Civilization of this series that we find the famous precept, Hitch your wagon to a star. The volume, Letters and Social Aims, appeared in 1874. Parnassus, a collection of poems by British and American authors, a selection made by Mr. Emerson for his own pleasure, was published in the same year. The last public address written by Emerson was that delivered at Concord in April 1875 on the centennial of the fight at the bridge. In 1871, the poet visited California. Soon after his return to Concord, his house was partially destroyed by fire. A European tour followed for relief and recreation, a tour which extended as far as Egypt. During Mr. Emerson's absence, a spontaneous movement among his friends resulted in the subscription of some $12,000, a gift which Mr. Emerson was with some difficulty prevailed upon to accept. It provided for the expense of the journey and for the restoration of the house. At the homecoming in May 1873, the entire town of Concord assembled at the station to greet its famous and well-loved citizen. The church bells announced his arrival, and the appearance of the train was received with the cheers of the assemblage. Emerson appeared, surprised and touched, on the platform, and was escorted with music between two rows of smiling schoolchildren to his house, where a triumphal arch of leaves and flowers had been erected. Already, before the events just mentioned, there had been indications of a weakening of the splendid intellectual power which had so long led the thought of that generation on the higher levels of the spirit. Memory failed, and now and then there was the pathetic spectacle of one whose mastery of the written and spoken word had been preeminent, groping vainly for some familiar term. "'I can't tell its name,' he said once, when he wanted an umbrella. Then, with a flash of his old humor, "'But I can tell its history. Strangers take it away.' But the shadows fell gently on these days of declining strength. In the spring of 1882, Mr. Emerson suffered from a severe cold, which developed into pneumonia, and after a brief illness, the end came April 27, the poet recognizing his friends with a smile of greeting to the last. Upon Sunday, the 30th, simple and impressive services were held in the church at Concord. The homes of the townspeople and the public buildings were draped. Emerson was buried in the village cemetery, Sleepy Hollow, at the dedication of which, as a burial place, he had delivered an address. His body was laid at the foot of a tall pine, not far from the graves of Hawthorne and Thoreau. The writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson, whether prose or poetry, are philosophical, but they make no attempt to set forth a comprehensive system of thought. Emerson is rather a spiritual teacher than a philosopher. Truth came to him not through an argument nor in logical progression, but in intuitions, as it does to a poet, and to these keen, condensed, authoritative utterances so picturesquely expressed are self-convincing by their very form. His real philosophy was the purest idealism, an idealism which, to materialistic readers appeared merely vague and mystical. He maintained that its application to conduct was the only worthy, the only practical course. This ideal he supported with an independence and a self-possession that were marvelous. We hardly appreciate now how radical he was, nor how indifferent to the views and opinions of others. To many who disputed his opinions, Emerson's attitude seemed one of 
insolence. This was a misinterpretation of the spirit of one who was as gentle and amiable as he was courageous. What we admire in Emerson is not only the intellectual elevation, but the moral purity and simple childlike goodness and sweetness of the man, says a noted English essayist. In his search for truth, he felt only one responsibility, the responsibility to himself. Assured of his own integrity, he stood serene and happy in absolute freedom. This freedom of individual opinion and expression, which he claimed for himself, Emerson urged upon all. It was a cardinal point in his teaching. He taught also the simple life and practiced it. Above everything else, he believed and taught the eminence of God, the presence of divinity in all of nature and in man. He liberalized thought in America. His crisp sayings are everywhere quoted. Whatever of substantial value is discoverable in the various schemes of the new thought of today is pretty sure to go back to Emerson as its proper source. His ideas are current wherever men think seriously of life. Perhaps his greatest service to literature was the stimulus and encouragement which he gave to the youth of his own generation who followed so closely in his steps. Hawthorne came under his influence. He was the direct inspiration of Whitman. Longfellow, Holmes, and Lowell felt the immediate power of his message, and, together with Emerson, these were the men who largely determined the character of American literature in the 19th century, and gave it such distinction as it has. Of Emerson's prose, the following essays are especially recommended. Self-Reliance, Compensation, Books, In Society and Solitude. The Address, The American Scholar, should certainly be read, and the ideas characteristic of the writer be noted. In the same way, parts of the first nature should be considered. The student will find in English Traits an interesting account of Emerson's visits with Wordsworth and Carlyle. Among the poems, some should be compared with those of Bryant's, which have been read. These are particularly such nature poems as The River, The Rodora, The Humblebee, The Snowstorm, Musketaquit, My Garden, The Titmouse, and Woodnotes, One and Two. More directly suggestive of the poet's transcendental utterances are The Apology, Each and All, The Problem, The Sphinx, The Informing Spirit, Experience, Hamatrea, Nature, Two Versions, 1844-1849, Days, and Brahma. The Concord Hymn, Boston Hymn, and Voluntaries are in a group by themselves, inspired by events. Threnody and Terminus are poems of experience. The authoritative editions of Emerson's works are those published by Houghton Mifflin Company. The authorized biography is The Memoir of Ralph Waldo Emerson by J. B. Cabot, two volumes. The volume on Emerson in the American Men of Letters series is by Oliver Wendell Holmes. That in the English Men of Letters series, the most recent biography, is by George E. Woodbury. Sketches and criticisms are almost numberless. It is best to mention few. The student, therefore, is referred only to the following titles. Emerson in Concord by E. W. Emerson, son of R. W. Concord Days by A. Bronson Alcott, and the same authors, Ralph Waldo Emerson, an estimate of his character and genius. G. B. Bartlett's Concord, H. E. Scudder's Men and Letters, and E. P. Whipple's Recollections of Eminent Men. Both Lowell and George W. Curtis have delightful essays upon Emerson lecturing, the former in literary essays, the latter in The Easy Chair. There is also a light sketch of Emerson, principally of Concord, in Curtis's 
literary and social essays an english estimate most appreciative is to be found in four great teachers by joseph forster an excellent account of the communistic experiment in roxbury is brook farm by lindsay swift in national studies in american letters end of part two of chapter four Part three of Chapter Four of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Four, Part Three, Henry David Thoreau, 1817 to 1862. While several of those who compose this group of transcendental thinkers in the Concord Circle became more or less noted either for eccentricity or utterance the most remarkable among them all after emerson was henry david thoreau a genuine lover of nature a naturalist first of all he was also a philosopher and a poet too although a crude one he was misunderstood by most of those who knew or heard of him while he lived and these were not many but by the inner circle of the transcendentalists he was comprehended and beloved it is characteristic of his career that but two of his books were published in his lifetime while his published writings now number twenty volumes thoreau's ancestry was of mingled french and scotch his grandfather john thoreau emigrated to new england from the island of jersey about 1773, and settled in Concord in 1800. Henry Thoreau's father was a maker of lead pencils, and was in rather poor circumstances. Nevertheless, Henry received a classical education, and was graduated from Harvard in 1837, at the age of 20. If he won distinction in any of his studies, it was in Greek, in which he was especially proficient. He taught for a while, but for the most part he made his living by surveying and by making pencils. He also lectured from time to time, and on his father's death he continued the little business of pencil manufacturing, which included a small trade in plumbago. He was thoroughly original and independent. Strongly American, he was yet more strongly idealistic in his conceptions of conduct and citizenship he refused to pay the old parish tax which was then still exacted and spent one night in jail because he would not pay his poll tax on account of the government's permission of slavery when emerson came to the cell with the inquiry henry why are you here thoreau received him with the question why are you not here he was a friend of john brown and declared that any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already he regarded only what was necessary as desirable a man is rich he said in proportion to the number of things which he can afford to let alone his acquaintance with emerson began early he was for a time a member of his household, and during Emerson's visit to England in 1847, Thoreau occupied his house and took charge of affairs during his absence. Concerning Thoreau's qualifications as a naturalist, Emerson has this to say. He knew the country like a fox or a bird, and passed through it as freely by paths of his own under his arm he carried an old music book to press plants in his pocket his diary and pencil a spyglass for birds microscope jackknife and twine he wore straw hat stout shoes strong gray trousers to brave shrub oaks and smilax and to climb a tree for a hawk's or squirrel's nest 
he waded into the pool for the water plants, and his strong legs were no insignificant part of his armor. His power of observation seemed to indicate additional senses. He saw as with microscope, heard as with ear trumpet, and his memory was a photographic register of all he saw and heard. Every fact lay in glory in his mind, a type of the order and beauty of the whole. His intimacy with animals suggested that either he had told the bees things, or the bees had told him. Snakes coiled round his leg, the fishes swam into his hand, and he took them out of the water. He pulled the woodchuck out of its hole by the tail, and took the foxes under his protection from the hunters. In 1845, Thoreau built for himself a cabin on the shore of Walden Pond, and here for two years he lived, cultivating potatoes, corn, and beans sufficient for his subsistence, recording his observations of all natural phenomena, and transcribing from his journal the narrative of an excursion taken with his brother in 1839. It is this experience in his life with its subsequent record, which has more than anything else, aroused interest in the personality of Thoreau. My purpose in going to Walden Pond, he says, was not to live cheaply nor to live dearly there, but to transact some private business with the fewest obstacles. He did not by any means discard human society. He made frequent trips through the woods to his home in Concord, and received many visitors at his hut. The simplicity and freedom of this unconventional life, and its nearness to the heart of nature, were his delight. He was handy with the axe and with all tools. He philosophized as he hoed his beans in the early morning. When my hoe tinkled against the stones, that music echoed to the woods and the sky, and was an accompaniment to my labor, which yielded an instant and immeasurable crop. It was no longer beans that I hoed, nor I that hoed beans and I remembered with as much pity as pride, if I remembered at all, my acquaintances who had gone to the city to attend the oratorios. Walden, or Life in the Woods, contains the story and the thought of these two years. It reveals Thoreau at his best, and has long since become an American classic. The book was published in 1854. An earlier volume had appeared in 1849, the preparation of which had formed no small part of that private business which had induced Thoreau's retirement to the hut on Walden Pond. A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers is the title of the volume, and the voyage which is the basis of its chapters had occurred ten years previous, when its author, two years out of college, together with his brother, in a boat built by their own hands, had explored the courses of these beautiful streams. Richly descriptive, the week is also full of the philosophy of Thoreau, sometimes expanded into essay-like proportions, sometimes expressed in queer, crude lines of verse, which somehow suggest the rhyming of an ancient bard. For example, Conscience is instinct bred in the house, Feeling and thinking propagate the sin, by an unnatural breeding in and in. I say, turn it outdoors, into the moors. I love a life whose plot is simple, and does not thicken with every pimple, a soul so sound, no sickly conscience binds it, that makes the universe no worse than finds it. It is in his prose that the essayist oftenest shows himself a poet. It required some rudeness to disturb with our boat the mirror-like surface of the water, in which every twig and blade of grass was so faithfully reflected, too faithfully indeed for art to imitate, for only nature may exaggerate herself. The shallowest still water is unfathomable. Wherever the trees and skies are reflected, there is more than Atlantic depth and no danger of fancy running aground. We notice that it required a separate intention of the eye, 
a more free and abstracted vision to see the reflected trees and the sky than to see the river bottom merely and so are there manifold visions in the direction of every object and even the most opaque reflect the heavens from their surface some men have their eyes naturally intended to the one and some to the other object less than three hundred copies of the thousand comprising the first edition were sold the remainder were thrown on the author's hands after four years mute appeal in the bookstores i have now a library of nearly nine hundred volumes thoreau wrote in his diary over seven hundred of which i wrote myself is it not well that the author should behold the fruit of his labor yet thoreau continued to write shortly after leaving college he had begun to keep a journal which was both diary and commonplace book and this journal he continued throughout his life from this source he drew the material of the week and of walden as well as of his posthumous books and his lectures essays and addresses the journal was also drawn upon by others after his death to make books and magazine articles and in nineteen o six was published in its entirety in fourteen volumes various articles by thoreau were published in the dial and through the friendship and assistance of horace greeley in the new york magazines as well as in the tribune itself thoreau made other excursions to the maine woods to canada to cape cod and these furnished fresh material for observation and comment in his journal he never married he lived simply and unconventionally in his own independent way probably because of exposure for he gave little heed to the elements he developed consumption and died in his forty-fifth year at his home in concord the ground of thoreau's more recent popularity has been well summarized by professor trent the years have favored him more than they have any of his friends in the dial group mankind has returned more and more to nature and at the same time has shown a preference for the minute semi-scientific semi-poetic treatment of her which thoreau was supereminently qualified to give over the rhapsodical pantheistic treatment illustrated in the writings of emerson and other transcendentalists american and british the life of thoreau in the american men of letters series is by f b sanborn a more serviceable biography is that by henry s salt in the great writers series thoreau his home friends and books by annie russell marble is a more intimate relation a biographical sketch by emerson is prefixed to thoreau's miscellanies End of Part three of Chapter four. Part four of Chapter four of A Student's Guide to American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter four. Part four. Nathaniel Hawthorne. 1804-1864. In the historic town of Salem, well remembered for its sad delusion concerning witchcraft in colonial times, and better famed in New England tradition for many brighter and happier events, Nathaniel Hawthorne was born July 4, 1804. William Haythorne, first of the line to appear in the colony, was an associate of Governor Winthrop, and was known as a persecutor of the Quakers. John, his son, was a judge, and left an unenviable reputation as a bitter searcher out of witches, relentless in the treatment of his victims. Many of the Hawthorns were seafaring men, for during those years Salem was a thriving seaport and practically controlled the rich East Indian trade. Nathaniel's grandfather commanded a privateer in revolutionary times and figures as the hero of the ballad on bold hethorn the novelist's own father also nathaniel 
was captain of a ship at an early age he died at Suriname only four years after his son was born from the shock of this event mrs hawthorne never recovered to the end of her life forty years afterward she lived in seclusion rarely emerging from her room even taking her meals apart from her children under these peculiar conditions the child who was destined to take his place as the foremost writer of fiction in america and one of the world's great romancers passed into boyhood it is not surprising that peculiarities of temperament were developed or that even as a child he was lonely sensitive and shy when nathaniel was nine years old the family lived for a time in maine their home was on the shore of sebago lake in a region that was then almost wild where the boy enjoyed a freedom like that of the birds but where the inclination for solitude was intensified when hawthorne entered the doyne college in eighteen twenty one his habits of seclusion were in a measure broken he was a healthy hearty youth slender but finely built handsome and athletic his comrades called him oberon here were begun two intimate and lifelong friendships that had no slight influence in his later career the friendships with horatio bridge and franklin pierce later president of the united states with longfellow also a classmate hawthorne seems to have had rather a slight acquaintance but this was cordially renewed in later years the future story-teller was already meditating the possibility of a literary career in the dedication of one of his volumes to his friend bridge he speaks of the fact the passage gives us such a pleasing glimpse of these college days and intimacies that it deserves quoting if anybody is responsible for my being at this day an author it is yourself i know not whence your faith came but while we were lads together at a country college gathering blueberries in study hours under those tall academic pines or watching the great logs as they tumbled along the current of the androscoggin or shooting pigeons and gray squirrels in the woods or bat fowling in the summer twilight or catching trouts in that shadowy little stream which i suppose is still wandering riverward through the forest though you and i will never cast a line in it again two idle lads in short as we need not fear to acknowledge now doing a hundred things that the faculty never heard of or else it had been the worse for us still it was your prognostic of your friend's destiny that he was to be a writer of fiction hawthorne was graduated in the class of eighteen twenty five it is a matter of record that while in college his superiority in english composition was recognized by his instructors it is also clear from the passage quoted that at least one of his classmates already discerned the promise of the future in the gifts of imagination insight and budding genius the ensuing ten years were spent by hawthorne in his native city his mother and sisters had again established themselves in their former home and the peculiar habits of seclusion that had so colored nathaniel's childhood were now resumed the young man became a recluse his meals were left before the locked door of his room from which he issued chiefly at night however there were days when he paced solitary the breezy pastures of salem neck which juts forth a mile or two out upon the island strewn bay sometimes he turned toward the western suburbs where he might stray for miles uninterrupted and alone over pasture roads bordered with sumac and barberry or follow the upland ridge to the spot associated with the gloomy memories of the fanatical severity of old judge hathorne and his associates in the witchcraft period the low eminence of gallows hill we must not think however that it was hawthorne's desire to shun all human society he trod the narrow winding streets of the ancient town with no slight stirrings of affection for the associations of the present and the past he joined the groups of fishermen loafing around their drying nets or sun-bleached lobster traps he mingled with sailormen in their 
lounging places, listening with an appreciative ear to their salty conversation. Of course, Hawthorne had his acquaintance in the city, but he was strangely diffident, reserved, and silent. Many thought him morose. It was a dreary ten years in his existence. We do not even live at our house, he once exclaimed pathetically. Yet Hawthorne was not idle. Shut in his chamber, he studied regularly, if not systematically, and read widely. It was a period of reflection and experiment. In his lonely chamber, he pondered and brooded. Here my mind and character were formed, he wrote in 1840. And here I sat a long, long time, waiting patiently for the world to know me, and sometimes wondering why it did not know me sooner, or whether it would ever know me at all, at least till I were in my grave. By and by the world found me out in my lonely chamber, and called me forth. He wrote, wrote much, and burned much of what he wrote. His first venture in print was a novel, crude and not especially suggestive of the works that followed. This was Fanshawe, published anonymously in 1828. It is a product of the first graduate years. Its scene is laid at Harley College, and its characters are reminiscent of academic days. The book was suppressed by its author afterward, but in 1879 was republished. With his sketches and short stories, the young author had better success. In these the note of originality was clearly struck, and their style, wonderfully delicate and refined, speedily commanded attention and praise, although their audience was limited. They were published in the annuals. Several appeared in the Boston Token, edited by S. G. Goodrich, far famed in that day under the pen name of Peter Parley, as the author and compiler of books for children. In the Salem Gazette, and in the New England Magazine, in 1837, by the kindly interest, unknown to Hawthorne, of his classmate, Horatio Bridge, the first collection was published under the title Twice Told Tales. Here were gathered the historical sketches, The Grey Champion, and The Maypole of Marymount, The Strange Study of Wakefield, The Man Who Could Not Enter His Own Home, The Delightful and Now Familiar Rill from the Town Pump, The Allegories, Fancy's show-box, the great carbuncle, and the prophetic pictures, so suggestive of Hawthorne's fondness for symbolism. As a boy he had counted The Fairy Queen and Pilgrim's Progress among his favorite books. Here also was the pathetic story of The Gentle Boy, and, with others, the characteristic tale, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment. The future work of the romancer was fairly foreshadowed in this representative collection. The twice-told tales attracted favorable notice and sold to the extent of six or seven hundred copies. Longfellow made the volume the basis of an appreciative article in the North American Review, and a friendly correspondence followed. Writing to Longfellow in June 1837, Hawthorne speaks with strong feeling of his hermit-like existence during the past ten years. I have secluded myself from society, and yet I never meant any such thing, nor dreamed what sort of life I was going to lead. I have made a captive of myself, and put me into a dungeon, and now I cannot find the key to let myself out. And if the door were open, I should be almost afraid to come out. For the last ten years I have not lived, but only dreamed of living. But the dreamer was already beginning to participate in the joy of life. Under romantic circumstances, Hawthorne had made acquaintance with Miss Sophia Peabody, an acquaintance that soon ripened into love. And in the glow of this experience, the ice of diffidence and reserve was melted. As we have already seen, the administration of President Van Buren, in its appointments to official positions, was noticeably helpful to men of literary talents. George Bancroft, the historian, was at this time collector of the port at Boston. In 1839, Nathaniel Hawthorne was made aware and gouger in the Boston Custom House. 
it is pathetic to think of genius thus compelled to labor for existence in uncongenial employment while his pen remains idle but this was the experience of robert burns and many others so for two years the author of the twice told tales discharged his duties faithfully weighing cargoes of salt or measuring coal as he once described on board a black little brutish schooner narrow though it was the experience may have been not unhelpful in its opportunity for practical contact with men then came the year spent in the idealistic community at brook farm hawthorne was not a transcendentalist in the strict sense of the term but this experiment in simple living conjoined with high thinking appealed to him association with those who formed the colony would be profitable and possibly here he might find a congenial location for a permanent home after his marriage which was to occur in the following year with hearty zeal he entered into the life of the community he performed his share in all the labor of the farm and it was strenuous enough at the first glimpse of fair weather he writes to his sister soon after arriving mr ripley summoned us into the cow-yard and introduced me to an instrument with four prongs commonly entitled a dung fork with this tool i have already assisted to load twenty or thirty carts besides i have planted potatoes and peas cut straw and hay for the cattle and done various other mighty works his sister sympathetic and practical wrote in reply to another letter of similar tenor what is the use of burning your brains out in the sun if you can do something better with them possibly hawthorne himself became somewhat doubtful of the desirability of prolonging the experience at all events before the twelve month was quite up he withdrew from this interesting circle of enthusiasts whose characteristics and plans have been described in a former chapter in the american notebooks we find many picturesque details of this experience and in his blithedale romance written ten years later the community life is presented as the background of the fiction in eighteen forty two when hawthorne was thirty-eight occurred his marriage to miss peabody and their settlement in the old manse at concord here for four years they lived happy and hopeful in spite of the really straitened circumstances due to slender income from literary work but hawthorne wrote busily encouraged by evidences that his work was recognized and appreciated more and more widely as its volume increased the second collection of the twice told tales appeared in eighteen forty two the journal of an african cruiser eighteen forty five was edited for his friend horatio bridge who had entered the american navy and whose log books supplied the material of this narrative the stories and sketches produced during this period were published collectively in eighteen forty six under the happily chosen title mosses from an old manse although he never wholly lost his habit of reserve the tendency to aloofness which was in his nature hawthorne was no longer a recluse he met emerson more or less frequently although he sought nothing from him as a philosopher he listened courteously to the conversation of margaret fuller and the other members of that distinguished coterie but he writes in his notebooks most enthusiastically of excursions with ellery channing and thoreau when we cast aside all irksome forms and straight-laced habitudes and delivered ourselves up to the free air to live like the indians or any less conventional race during one bright semicircle of the sun this pleasant period of our author's life was terminated in eighteen forty six by an appointment to the surveyorship at the custom house in salem once more the hawthorns were domiciled in the city of their birth there were two children in the household a daughter una born in concord and julian well known as a writer in our own day whose birth occurred in boston just before the removal to salem it is in his companionship with these children 
gaily, even boisterously participating in their sports and pastimes, that we catch our pleasantest glimpses of Hawthorne in this period. In 1849, following his enforced retirement from office, the result of political schemes, Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter. Although Hawthorne's reputation as a writer of tales was already well established, it was through this remarkable novel that his mastery in the field of romantic fiction was really revealed. In this narrative, the inheritance of ancestral tradition is easily perceived so too the influence of the old new england religious atmosphere the fact of sin and its effects on the soul the workings of conscience the problems of repentance and atonement these are the themes with which hawthorne works in the strong and impressive narrative of hester prynne the young minister arthur dimsdale and the elfish child little pearl the sombre background of puritan bigotry and persecution affords a setting as effective as it is appropriate in construction and form it is beautifully developed while its verbal style is exceptional in its delicacy and beauty the finest piece of imaginative writing yet put forth in this country so henry james describes it the essay on the custom house prefatory to the novel, is one of the most charming of Hawthorne's sketches. The picture of his associates at the seat of custom, humorous and ironical in tone, was, perhaps, too true to life to be relished. At all events, when this essay was read by his fellow citizens, irritation followed, and there was a general expression of hostility toward the novelist. He soon removed from Salem. For a year and a half the Hawthorns lived in Lenox, among the Berkshire Hills, the beautiful region in western Massachusetts where William Cullen Bryant had passed his early years. Here Hawthorne wrote The House of the Seven Gables, 1851, the only one of his romances the scene of which is actually laid in Salem. This novel, thought by its author to be a greater work than The Scarlet Letter, is recognized as one of his best productions although not placed above its predecessor. The working out of an ancient curse invoked upon the head of a family line is the theme of the romance. It must not be forgotten that this writer of weird tales and somber romance was also a successful storyteller for children, and that his essays in this field are still favorites among the children's classics. Here belong the earlier collections, like Grandfather's Chair, 1841, and biographical stories eighteen forty two which have not been previously mentioned from the grim pages of the house of the seven gables hawthorne now turned to the preparation of the delightful wonder book for girls and boys eighteen fifty two and here with the fascinating freshness of style simply yet beautifully he recounts the greek myths of midas pandora of hercules in quest of the golden apples Bellerophon and the Chimera, of Baucis and Philemon, of Perseus and Medusa. A second series of classical myths, presented in the same entertaining manner, appeared in Tanglewood Tales, 1853. During a brief temporary residence in West Newton, Hawthorne wrote The Blythedale Romance, not one of his most attractive works. It is a somber tale, but commands a peculiar interest because reminiscent of the sojourn at brook farm and some of its associations the romance was not published until the following year eighteen fifty two when the hawthorns were once more living in concord where the novelist had bought a cottage it was the home of the alcotts to which the name of the wayside was now given unhappily this house is not associated with the creation of any noteworthy work in 1852, the writer of romances took time to prepare a campaign biography, a life of his old classmate and ever-loyal friend, Franklin Pierce. Following Pierce's election as president, Hawthorne was formally appointed United States Consul at Liverpool, and in July 1853 sailed with his family for England. There he remained until he resigned his office in 1857. No literary work 
marks this period of four years English residence, except the usual minute record of observation and experience comprised in Hawthorne's interesting notebooks. The next two years were passed in Italy, mainly in Rome. It was for the most part a pleasing and illuminating sojourn. The associations with American residents, notably with Story, the sculptor, were stimulating. The serious illness of the daughter, Una, cast a cloud upon the last few months of the stay in Rome, yet here Hawthorne collected the material for what was to prove his last and most popular romance. During the summer in Florence, the family occupied a romantic villa with a moss-grown tower which had the reputation of being haunted. I mean to take it away bodily and clap it into a romance which I have in my head. Hawthorne wrote in his notebooks, and thus was Hilda's airy nest in the marble fawn projected. In the spring of 1859, the Hawthorns returned to England, where the new romance was completed. It was published in England in the early part of 1860, under the title Transformation, and simultaneously in America as The Marble Fawn. The Hawthorns then came home. The story of the marble fawn, again, is psychological. It deals with the development of a soul under the influence of a committed sin. The central figure is that of Donatello, a youth whose resemblance to the sculptured fawn of Praxiteles is so marked as to suggest that he himself is but half human, his free and apparently irresponsible nature confirming this suspicion. Through participation in a crime, the soul of Donatello appears to be awakened, and we infer that his humanity begins in the self-revelation which follows his sin. The effects of this act upon characters of contrasted types is subtly worked out. Upon Miriam, the chief actor in the crime, upon Hilda, who is only a witness, but whose intensely moral soul, Puritan of the Puritans that she is, suffers most keenly of all. The pure-minded, sweet-souled Hilda, feeding the doves as they flock daily about her ancient tower, and in her hour of self-torture, groping for relief from the sense of contamination, which comes only from her knowledge of another's crime, this is, for most readers, the most attractive character in the book. There is much concerning Italian art in the marble fawn, at least much concerning sculpture. This fact, and also the circumstance that historic spots are picturesquely described, have made something of a glorified guidebook of the romance, and have enhanced its value in the eyes of many. But Hawthorne is not a sound critic of art. The marble fawn should be read for its story, and its characters, and the problems they present. Once more the romancer and his family occupied the wayside. Full recognition of Hawthorne's peculiar genius had been won. Among American writers he was regarded essentially the foremost. Yet the four years of life remaining were not very happy ones. Various circumstances and events conspired to create depression and to recall the old spirit of aloofness and reserve. His daughter Rose, at this period ten or twelve years old, gives this description of her father. I always felt a great awe of him, a tremendous sense of his power, his large eyes, liquid with blue and white light, and deep with dark shadows, told me, even when I was very young, that he was in some respects different from other people. We were usually a silent couple when off for a walk together, or when we met by chance in the household. I longed myself to hear the splendidly grotesque fairy tales, which Una and Julian had reveled in when our father had been at leisure in Lenox and Concord. Hawthorne was greatly agitated by the breaking out of civil war. His politics identified him with the unpopular party in the North, and his stanch loyalty to his friend Pierce, then in disfavor, seemed to arouse in a degree public sentiment against himself. From his English notebooks he had called material which was published under the title Our Old Home in 1863, 
this volume in spite of some protests from his friends he insisted upon dedicating to franklin pierce the appropriateness of the dedication is easily seen and probably it was appreciated by most of hawthorne's readers then still the novelist felt somewhat the stigma of personal unpopularity he became despondent and his splendid health rapidly declined he could not advance with the literary work in hand he made a journey to washington with his intimate friend ticknor the publisher in the endeavor to shake off his weariness and depression ticknor died suddenly in philadelphia and hawthorne returned very ill early in may eighteen sixty four mr pierce proposed that his former classmate should accompany him on a tour through the white mountains and the novelist left his home in concord with a last farewell at a hotel in plymouth new hampshire after his journey hawthorne retired to rest and fell asleep on the twenty third of may the body of our great romance writer was laid in the village burial place at concord a most distinguished company following to the grave emerson longfellow lowell and holmes were in the group they were all his friends and admirers of his genius the manuscript of the unfinished work the dolliver romance was laid on the coffin it was this funeral which inspired longfellow's tender tribute to hawthorne now i look back and meadow manse and stream dimly my thought defines i only see a dream within a dream the hilltop hearsed with pines i only hear above his place of rest their tender undertone the infinite longings of a troubled breast the voice so like his own there is seclusion and remote from men the wizard hand lies cold which at its topmost speed let fall the pen and left the tale half told the appearance of hawthorne's writings did not cease with his death the notebooks so continuously and so carefully kept have been drawn upon and much of their material published passages from the american notebooks eighteen sixty eight english notebooks eighteen seventy and french and italian notebooks eighteen seventy one have thus appeared in eighteen seventy two the romance septimus felton unrevised and therefore unfinished was published a few fragmentary scenes from the dolliver romance were included in a volume with other hitherto unpublished pieces in eighteen seventy six the youthful production fanshawe was reprinted another unfinished romance dr grimshaw's secret was issued in eighteen eighty three together with more sketches tales and studies in the same year there appeared an edition of the complete works hawthorne's place in our literature is established he is the most commanding figure that america has produced in the field of romance the universal superiority of his genius has been challenged by more than one critic yet others have granted him the highest distinction even in this broader field henry james describes him as the most beautiful and most eminent representative of a literature in the field of letters the most valuable example of the american genius some points in comparison may be helpful it is obvious that he is altogether original irving in his sketches was as obviously working after earlier english models hawthorne's peculiar choice of theme the study of influences supernatural in the noblest sense acting on the human soul in its development lifts his effort to a much higher plane than was reached by cooper admirable storyteller that he was hawthorne's one contemporary rival in the domain of the short story was edgar allan poe while hawthorne lacks the intensity and passion of poe he also escapes the morbidness which mars the beauty of poe's art in spite of occasional vagueness in outline and in details together with an inclination to allegory which is perhaps too mechanical to be accepted as one of the best methods of literary art nathaniel hawthorne is emphatically our greatest master in romantic fiction and in that peculiar field in which he worked 
he remains unique. The volume of his production is by no means small. We count but four successful romances completed. One of these, however, The Scarlet Letter, is acknowledged by all critics to be the strongest work of fiction yet produced in America, and two of the other three, The House of Seven Gables and The Marble Fawn, are admirable examples of narrative art. But Hawthorne's numerous tales and sketches must also be taken into account. Many of them stand forth with marks of high distinction. The Gentle Boy, The Snow Image, The Great Stone Face, The Ambitious Guest. These are fine examples of the short story, as then conceived, in quiet tone. Wakefield, Ethan Brand, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment, Roger Malvin's Burial, Young Goodman Brown, The White Old Maid, and Rappuccini's Daughter have the weirdness and the fantasy of more pronounced romance. The historical sketches like The Grey Champion, The Maypole of Marymount, and The Legends of the Province House are unsurpassed in their kind. The allegories like Fancy Showbox, The Birthmark, and Earth's Holocaust perhaps do not call for a special praise, but the sketches based on realities, of which we should note particularly a reel from the town pump, Main Street, the old manse, and the essay on the custom house are well worthy of admiration. It is a wonderful collection, the product of a wonderful imagination, fantastic, sometimes grotesque, always subtle, always expressing itself in a style of the utmost delicacy and charm. Hawthorne was ever an idealist, whether it was a result of his tendency to aloofness, his early years of solitude and contemplation, or not, he had somehow received the gift of insight which showed him the human heart. Certainly he achieved in unusual degree the storyteller's art. The reader may make his own selection from the various groups of Hawthorne's tales mentioned in preceding paragraphs, but on no account should he miss the introductory essays which accompany Mosses from an Old Manse and The Scarlet Letter. He will also find it interesting and worth while to dip here and there in the American notebooks. While Julian Hawthorne's Nathaniel Hawthorne and his wife will rank as chief authority, a study of Hawthorne by George Parsons Lathrop will prove more generally useful, and the admirable brief sketch of Hawthorne in the Beacon biographies by Mrs. Fields may be used to good advantage. Mrs. Rose Hawthorne Lathrop's Memories of Hawthorne and the Recollections of Hawthorne by Horatio Bridge are especially recommended. Henry James is the author of The Hawthorne in the English Men of Letters series, and Moncure D. Conway of that in the Great Writers series. In Yesterdays with Authors by James T. Fields and the essays Hawthorne and the works of Nathaniel Hawthorne, by George W. Curtis, literary and social essays, will be found picturesque and suggestive glimpses of this strange personality. Professor Trent's American Literature contains a most comprehensive study of Hawthorne's literary work. The only editions of Hawthorne's complete works are published by Houghton Mifflin Company. End of Part 4 of Chapter 4《Part Five of Chapter Four of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Four, Part Five, Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 to 1849. Four and a half years after the date of Hawthorne's birth. There was born in Boston another child of eccentric genius, like the lonely orphan boy in Salem, destined to literary fame as a dreamer of romance, and alas, destined also to a career unique in the history of American letters for its brevity, its pathos, and its tragedy. 
Edgar Allan Poe was born January 19th, 1809. That his birth occurred in Boston was due to the fact that his parents, members of a theatrical company, were filling an engagement in that city when the event occurred. David Poe, the father of the child, was a southerner, a native of Baltimore, where the Poes were people of character and standing. Connection with the parental home had ceased, however, when the young man had recklessly pushed his law books aside for an uncertain career upon the stage. He was never a brilliant actor. The lady whom he married was by far his superior in the profession, and possessed the more vigorous personality of the two. It was from his mother that Edgar inherited his artistic temperament. While the prevailing weaknesses of the boy's later life it is safe to assert, were a natural inheritance from his father. Within a year of Edgar's birth, his father died, and a year or two later, Mrs. Poe also died, at Richmond, Virginia, in poverty, leaving three young children to the charity of friends. A Mrs. Allen, wife of a tobacco merchant of Richmond, had become interested in the suffering family, and took Edgar into her home. The black-eyed, curly-haired boy, handsome and precocious, soon won his way into the affections of Mr. and Mrs. Allen. He was given the name of his foster parents, was made the pet of the household, and treated with a degree of indulgence far from wise. One of his accomplishments was the ability to declaim childish speeches before the dinner guests when the table was cleared for dessert, and to pledge the health of the company in wine with roguish grace. In 1815, Mr. Allen went to England, taking his family with him. Edgar, then six years old, was placed in the Manor House School in a suburb of London, and there he remained five years. The associations of this period left a strong and not unpleasant impression on the boy's memory. They are recalled with some detail in the story William Wilson, at this old and typical English school, the youth was brought in contact with much that was ancient, with many reminders of great historic characters and events. He studied Latin and French, participated in all outdoor sports, and before the close of his residence had begun to write occasional verse. The principal of the school had remarked nothing in Edgar Allen, as he was called, except that he was clever but spoilt by an extravagant amount of pocket money upon the return of the family to america in eighteen twenty the boy continued his studies at a private school in richmond where he appeared to be a quick and brilliant pupil although not always steady or accurate in scholarship he excelled in athletics was a skilful boxer and a daring swimmer having it is said one hot june day swam six miles in the James River against a strong tide. Like Byron, he was very proud of this accomplishment. The University of Virginia had been opened under the patronage of Thomas Jefferson in 1825. At the beginning of 1826, Poe, then seventeen, placed his name upon the register of students. In the convivial atmosphere of undergraduate fellowship, Habits of irresponsibility and reckless indulgence were easily acquired. To such habits this proud, impulsive, and highly strung youth was especially susceptible. At the same time there was a reserve and a self-absorption that checked intimacy. His classmates hardly knew him except as a person of high spirit. His favorite diversion was to wander off for a long, solitary ramble among the outlying hills of the ragged mountains giving rein to his fancy, and returning to his associates with some wild romance, story, or poem, which he would recite for their pleasure. He was fairly regular in attendance on the exercises, and at the end of the year secured honors in French and Latin. He had also, unfortunately, accumulated gambling debts to a large amount, and when the year closed, Mr. Allen withdrew Poe from the university, refused to pay the debts thus incurred, and set the young man at work in his counting-room. Smarting under a sense of injustice in the severity of his foster-father's treatment, Poe ran away to Boston and enlisted in the army under the name of 
e a perry but he first secured the publication of his earliest volume tamerlane and other poems which appeared in the spring of eighteen twenty seven poe's record in the service was an honorable one in two years time he had been promoted to the rank of sergeant major for merit then occurred the death of mrs allen and this brought a reconciliation mr allen secured edgar's release from the service in january eighteen twenty nine and not long thereafter obtained his appointment as a cadet in the military academy at west point poe entered the academy in july and for a time performed his duties with credit then he became discontented and despondent neglected all obligations was court-martialed and dismissed in january eighteen thirty one this made the breach with mr allen complete and final a second edition of his poems had been published by poe at richmond while waiting for his appointment to the academy in eighteen twenty nine there had been additions to the volume issued at boston two years before al araf a vague and mystical poem the longest of poe's compositions was added to the first collection it reflects the influence of shelley as the earlier poem tamerlane suggests the influence of byron after the dismissal from west point a third edition entitled simply poems eighteen thirty one was brought out by poe in new york here were included some of his finest compositions to helen israfel the city in the sea lenore and the valley of unrest already his verse had acquired its haunting music already found its note of melancholy now began poe's struggle with fate the panorama of his most stormy life is a lurid one a hurried glimpse will be sufficient for two or three years he made his home in baltimore with his father's sister mrs clem he wrote for magazines and did all kinds of literary hack work the romantic tales were now begun and one of these manuscript found in a bottle secured in eighteen thirty three a prize of one hundred dollars offered by a weekly literary paper in baltimore this success brought poe some timely friends who helped him to an editorial position on the southern literary messenger at a salary of five hundred dollars this magazine was published at richmond whither poe now returned to the messenger poe contributed a few tales and poems none of which is now recognized as of more than minor importance but it was as a critic that poe now startled the readers and the writers of that day there had been some attempts at literary criticism by american writers before this an article by bryant in the north american review in eighteen eighteen has already been mentioned and there were some literary studies written about the same time by richard henry dana which are properly termed critical but there had been no such outspoken and vigorous reviews as were now produced by poe the noteworthy fact concerning them is not that they were trenchant but that they were based upon certain definite principles of criticism formulated by poe and consistently followed by him in his own literary work it is an evidence of the intellectual versatility of the poet that he appears conspicuously in this field also and as a pioneer the literary messenger now came to be recognized as one of the leading magazines of the country if not the foremost and poe's prospects appeared very bright in eighteen thirty six he married his cousin virginia clem the beautiful and talented child wife then not quite fourteen years of age whom with passionate devotion the poet loved and cherished until her pathetic and miserable death in eighteen forty seven but the journalistic career which had begun so promisingly was interrupted by the habits of indulgence which were to prove the ruin of poe in january eighteen thirty seven he lost his position on the messenger and removed to new york in eighteen thirty eight he published his longest story the narrative of arthur gordon pym philadelphia now seemed to offer poe a better opportunity for success and in the summer of eighteen thirty eight he proceeded thither here the poet seems to have made a successful effort to recover his self-control 
for a long period he appears to have refrained altogether from the use of wine this is the period of poe's strongest work the tales of the grotesque and the arabesque were published in two volumes at the end of eighteen thirty nine two years after the appearance of hawthorne's twice told tales in his critical reviews of this period poe is even more independent and emphatic than in the messenger articles he made a notorious attack upon longfellow repeated at various times charging the new england poet with gross plagiarism while longfellow bore poe's attacks with unfailing equanimity this was not the case with all who suffered not a few of his victims became bitter personal enemies of the imperious reviewer poe now enters a new field of fiction of which he may be regarded as the discoverer this is the story in which a mystery is apparently solved by analysis and reason the modern detective story is our present popular example of the type poe's analytical powers were remarkable when the opening chapters of dickens novel barnaby rudge appeared poe forecast from them the entire plot of the novel the solution of papers written in cipher cryptographs was a favorite pastime with him he declared that no one could invent a cipher that he could not solve and at one period he was kept busy deciphering specimens of enigmatic productions of this sort it was in eighteen forty one that poe's masterpiece in this kind of fiction the murders in the rue morgue appeared this was followed by another narrative the mystery of marie roget in which the author applied his method in the study of an actual murder mystery which occurred in new york in eighteen forty three was published the gold bug the third in this group of realistic narratives the most popular of all his tales this also was a competitive story and brought its writer a second one hundred dollar prize again poe enjoyed unusual advantages in eighteen thirty nine he became associate editor of burton's magazine one of the most successful periodicals of the time but he quarrelled with his principal and lost his position before the close of eighteen forty within a month or two however he had been made the editor of graham's magazine as important a publication as burton's and then for some irregularity the nature of which is unknown again he was discharged although all evidence indicates that poe had fairly conquered his old vice of intemperance during these years there is unhappily other evidence that he was using opium the main cause of his journalistic failures however probably lay in the temperament of the man himself eccentric irritable self-willed as audacious in his treatment of others as he was sensitive to their treatment of him it is not strange that this singular man who did not lack admirers or friends was unable to retain business associations with them in society when he chose to enter it both in philadelphia and later in new york he was a marked figure he was often serious and silent but his broad and pallid brow the large piercing eyes his gracious manner when he did converse and his remarkably melodious voice gave a peculiar charm to his presence in his home to both wife and mother he was the embodiment of kindness and tenderness from philadelphia the poes removed to new york in eighteen forty four and the struggle for existence became acute in the course of the first year of residence in new york poe made the acquaintance of willis the most popular and most influential member of the knickerbocker group willis at once made a place for poe on his paper the evening mirror thus it was that in this paper in january eighteen forty five poe published the raven the appearance of this poem perhaps the most widely known of all american poems gave poe a national reputation it was copied in well-nigh every newspaper in the land again the future looked bright for one whom people now hailed as the foremost among american poets the tales were republished all of his poetical compositions that he wished to preserve were collected and published under the title of the raven and other poems 
Moreover, he had become, in this year, 1845, editor and proprietor of the Broadway Journal. But with the close of the year, the journal was abandoned, and Poe was left with a substantial debt. In 1846, the family was established in a little cottage of the humblest description at Fordham, now in the borough of the Bronx, then not within the limits of the city. Mrs. Clem had become, and not for the first time, the mainstay of the household. Virginia was dying with consumption. Poe himself was broken in health. Half insane with anxiety and grief, he had lapsed into the old excesses. Before the year closed, they were in absolute destitution. The death of Virginia occurred in January 1847, under conditions too painful to be described. The two years which followed were pitiable enough. After the poet had, in a measure, recovered his shattered health, he employed himself in various efforts without much success. He wrote a long and elaborate essay, which he called Eureka. It was an attempt to explain the existence of the universe. He thought that he had solved the mystery of creation, but these conceptions of his erratic imagination have no scientific value. Of more worth are the poems written during this period. Ulalum, The Bells, For Annie and Annabel Lee, this last name ballad a poignant memory of the child wife, Virginia. In 1849, Poe was again in Richmond, hoping to get aid to establish a new magazine. On the last day of September, he departed on his return to New York, and stopped over in Baltimore to see some friends. He was drinking heavily. On the 3rd of October, it being an election day, Poe was found, unconscious and in wretched plight, in a rear room of a rum shop, used as a polling place. Friends were summoned, and the unfortunate man was conveyed to a hospital. On the 7th of October, without regaining his senses, he died dismally. His last words were, Lord, help my poor soul. The next morning, five friends of the poet followed his body to its cheerless burial in the old cemetery of Westminster Church. Such in outline is the tragic story of Edgar Allan Poe. To add to these details would be to emphasize its sordid aspects rather than to brighten it. The blighted career the disastrous climax of his misfortune can excite but one feeling a profound pity for this unhappy soul whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore yet over this strange personality critics have contended more fiercely than over any other in our literary annals at the same time we may say that no american poet lives more vividly in the memory of his countrymen than Edgar Allan Poe, nor is there any other that, in the eye of Europe, ranks as high as he. Already before his death, French writers had detected in Poe's works a quality that appealed strongly to their artistic sense. His poems and tales were translated into their language, later into Spanish and German also. To the present time, Germany, Spain, and France regard the author of the raven as the supreme representative of the west in literary art let us look briefly at poe's actual achievement remembering if in volume his imaginative work appears disappointing that he died at forty and that during the two brief years of his working life he was beset with weaknesses and embarrassed by failures such as occurred in the experience of no other American writer of first rank. His productions fall into three groups, the critical articles, the tales, and the poems. Poe was, as has been said, a pioneer in this country in the field of serious criticism. As matter of fact, nearly half of his literary work is of this nature. Besides the pungent reviews of contemporary writers, the critical essays on The Rationale of English Verse and The Poetic Principle must not be forgotten. He was not always a sound critic. He was not infallible in his judgments, and in some of his attacks he was inspired by jealousy or prejudice. But it is remembered that he was one of the earliest to recognize the genius of Mrs. Browning 
and of Tennyson, that he applauded Dickens from the start, that he was one of the first to discover Hawthorne, and wrote warmly of his work, although he later denied his originality, and characteristically declared that Hawthorne had stolen some material from his own tale of William Wilson. For Lowell's verse, Poe had nothing but praise, and Longfellow, in spite of his own ill-tempered attack, he placed at the head of American poets. He also noted the limitations of Irving, Cooper, and Bryant, and in much of his criticism he has been justified by time. The general effect of his critical work was apparently helpful in the development of American literature. Poe wrote some seventy tales of greatly varying merit. These can be considered but briefly and in groups. We find, first, narratives of romantic adventure, typified by a manuscript found in a bottle, intense in its suggestions of the mysterious and unearthly. His longest piece of fiction, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, inspired, perhaps, by the popular success of Cooper's Romances of the Sea, is as realistic in its employment of commonplace and minute details as any of the narratives of Defoe, the first great master of realism in fiction. Poe's imaginative power is exhibited in vivid pictures of murder, mutiny, shipwreck, and starvation, which are gruesome enough, and sometimes become so morbid as to be offensive to sound taste. But in the conclusion of the tale, his poetic imagination asserts itself in wonderful descriptions of an unknown land and of the mysterious white sea of the Antarctic. In A Descent into the Maelstrom, we have the finest example of this group, realistic, poetical, and thoroughly impressive. The adventures of one Hans Fall, like the subsequent story, The Balloon Hoax, is based upon the possibilities, real and romantic, of aerial navigation and is a prototype of such pseudo-scientific fiction as the romances of Jules Verne. Poe makes a brave display of scientific knowledge in all these tales, a knowledge which is superficial in fact, although effective in the machinery of his realism. Another group contains the analytical tales, which Poe himself called tales of ratiocination, because their appeal is to the reasoning faculty rather than to the emotions the presentation of a mystery the solution of which is to follow is always fascinating and poe's dominion over his reader is nowhere more complete than in these tales that the romancer having first built up his mystery is obviously only retracing his own steps in the working out of its solution does not at all affect the interest of his story for here his art is strong enough to produce the illusion that the reader is watching the first unraveling of the plot. The Gold Bug, The Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Mystery of Marie Roget, and The Purloined Letter still remain our best examples, at least in the short story form, of this class of fiction. Working more closely in the field cultivated by Hawthorne, Poe produced also a group of romantic tales in which conscience is the theme. William Wilson, the narrative of a man with a double, is the best. It might have been the suggestion of Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Here are to be included also the horrible story of The Black Cat, The Tell-Tale Heart, and Thou Art the Man. But Poe's most effective tales are those which are carefully elaborately designed to produce a vivid effect on the reader's mind foremost among them is the remarkable fantasy the fall of the house of usher a masterpiece of literary art wherein every sentence is significant and almost every word a contribution to the dismal effect here belongs also the mask of the red death with its weird use of colors its atmosphere of revelry invaded by the horror of the plague. Ligeia, a fantasy of transmigration, the cask of Amontillado, a study in revenge, and Hop Frog, in which the same theme again appears, grotesquely treated, fall in the same group. The morbid element is conspicuous in all. Death, horrible and ghastly. Pestilence, dissolution, the awakening of the dead, the awakening of those prematurely buried, 
These are the instruments of horrible suggestiveness which are here employed. It is no wonder that one's flesh creeps as he reads. That was in the design. Poe had little of the sense of humor. He wrote, however, a number of extravaganzas with intent to make them humorous. In one, The Devil in the Belfry, he succeeded fairly. Another phase of his fancy is discovered in two beautiful landscape pictures, masterpieces of natural description. The Domain of Arnheim and Lander's Cottage, pure idealizations of romantic scenery worthy of a poet's dream. If the volume of Poe's verse is small, there is an unusual proportion of compositions that attain the perfection of form. The best of them are exquisite embodiments of Poe's own theories regarding his art. Poetry and music were allied in his mind, the aim in both to produce an impression. The poetical effect, he said, could be prolonged only to a certain limit, and that he placed at about one hundred lines. He had no sympathy with the idea that poetry should inculcate a moral. This idea he termed the heresy of the didactic, and soundly rated the New England poets for their inclination so to write. Poetry he defined as the rhythmical creation of beauty. The poetic principle manifests itself in an elevating excitement of the soul. In the service of beauty, Poe employed his art. We can easily name the titles of his most effective poems. They are The Song to Ligere in Al Araf, The First to Helen, Israfel, The City in the Sea, The Colosseum, The Haunted Palace, The Conqueror Worm, Ulalum, Poor Annie, The Raven, The Bells, and Annabel Lee. Poe's melodies are haunting ones. Sonorous words play an important part in the mechanics of his composition. Repetition, sometimes in the form of assonance, as in the line, From a wild, weird clime that lieth sublime. Sometimes in the refrain, so effectively employed in The Raven. Sometimes in the recurrence of the identical word, as in Dreamland and in Ulalum, is used with marked musical effect. Poe makes artful use of melodious names like Ober, El Dorado, Israfel, Ulalum, Lenore. There is a wonderful charm in the rhythmic movement of Poe's verse, and there is also, for most readers, a charm in that omnipresent melancholy which pervades his poems. So characteristic is this last quality that Poe has been described not as a single poem poet, but the poet of a single mood. Weird, mystical, unearthly, out of space, out of time. These compositions succeed in fulfilling the purpose of their author. They impress the mind with ideas of supernal beauty. They speak no message of hope or inspiration. They teach no lesson. In Poe's conception of his art, the poet, as prophet, had no place. If Poe had a literary master, it was the author of Christabel and the Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Coleridge, more than any other poet, taught the author of Israfel and the Raven the secret of melodious verse and the fascination of the weird. Of Poe's tales, selection should be made as to include the several types. The following will serve for the purpose. A Descent into the Maelstrom, The Gold Bug, the murders of the rue morgue william wilson the fall of the house of usher legia lander's cottage the devil in the belfry these eight tales are fairly representative of poe's best work in romance having read these the average reader will not need urging to increase the list the student should make a study of the very impressive tale the fall of the house of usher let him examine word by word the careful composition of the introductory paragraph, heedfully noting the cumulative effect of the descriptive phrases like dull, dark, and soundless day, in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low, singularly dreary tract, etc., 
and also the iteration of the feeling evoked in the narrator as expressed in terms like insufferable gloom utter depression of soul unredeemed dreariness of thought then let him apply the same method to the study of the piece as a structure and he will perceive something of the mechanics of poe's masterpiece as he clearly recognizes its marvelous effect of the poems the raven of course calls for our first attention poe's article on the philosophy of composition will be found helpfully suggestive in studying the poem although no one accepts seriously all that the author says regarding its composition at least all of the twelve poems named in this text should be read and the uniformity of tone and theme be noted the standard edition of poe's complete works is the virginia edition seventeen volumes edited by james a harrison crowell nineteen o two the works in ten volumes edited by e c stedman and g e woodbury is also authoritative the latest full biography is j a harrison's life and letters of edgar allan poe nineteen o three g e woodbury's edgar allan poe american men of letters series is the best critical biography a briefer life of poe by w p trent in the english men of letters series is announced the sections upon poe in trent's american literature richardson's american literature wendell's literary history of america and stedman's poets of america are valuable for reference end of part five of chapter four end of chapter four philosophy and romance Part 1 of Chapter 5 of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 5 The New England Poets. Part 1 Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1807 to 1882. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow the most widely read of all the american poets and the one that has the closest hold upon the hearts of the american people was born in portland maine february twenty seventh eighteen o seven his father a graduate of harvard college was a leading lawyer in the city both parents were of the best english stock and descendants of the early settlers in new england on his mother's side the poet traced his ancestry to john alden whose peculiar courtship of the plymouth maid priscilla he was to celebrate in one of his happiest poems it was from his mother a lover of nature and of poetry that longfellow inherited his romantic taste and his literary ambition school life commenced early for this boy he began to study at three and was placed in an academy at six at seven he was well on his way through the latin grammar and was reported by his master one of the best boys we have in school his conduct last quarter was very correct and amiable there were eight children in the home four brothers and four sisters henry was the second child books were at hand and out of doors there was not a little to stir the imagination of a boy in the brisk seaport town which has always been noted for both enterprise and beauty its picturesque features were never forgotten in the descriptive poem my lost youth written in eighteen fifty five they are vividly recalled the pleasant streets of the seaside town the gleam of the sunlight on the bay the harbor islands the garrison in the little fort the sea fight between the enterprise and the boxer which was watched by the citizens from the shore like irving longfellow was fascinated by the sight of the wharves and the shipping and thus he writes i remember the black wharves and the slips and the sea tides tossing free 
and spanish sailors with bearded lips and the beauty and mystery of the ships and the magic of the sea i remember the gleams and glooms that dart across the schoolboy's brain the song and the silence in the heart that in part are prophecies and in part are longings wild and vain and the voices of that fitful song sings on and is never still a boy's will is the wind's will and the thoughts of youth are long long thoughts longfellow was twelve years old when irving's sketchbook appeared the young reader was immediately captivated by its charm at thirteen he began to write verse some of which was printed in the newspapers he was fourteen when he passed his entrance examinations for college in eighteen twenty two longfellow became a student at bowdoin college and was admitted to the sophomore class in college he was a general favorite social in disposition but above everything else the industrious student and voluminous reader we have already seen that his acquaintance with hawthorne his classmate was comparatively slight although longfellow wrote considerable prose and verse some of which was published in the united states literary gazette of boston there is little in the work of this period which calls for comment we note the recurrence of nature themes and the influence of bryant's poems an influence so strong that these early compositions appear hardly more than imitations before the end of his college course longfellow had recognized his true vocation and had formulated his desires in a letter to his father written in his senior year i most eagerly aspire after future eminence in literature my whole soul burns ardently for it and every earthly thought centers in it again he writes whatever i do study ought to be engaged in with all my soul for i will be eminent in something at the commencement exercises of his class in eighteen twenty five longfellow spoke on the theme our native writers the opportunity for further equipment came speedily a professorship of modern languages had just been established at Bodoin, and to the young graduate already marked as a youth of talent this position was offered with permission to spend three years in europe for study the call was accepted with eagerness and delight this first european sojourn extended from the spring of eighteen twenty six to the summer of eighteen twenty nine and longfellow returned with a practical knowledge of french spanish and italian the study of these languages was then altogether new in american colleges and much of the professor's time was employed in preparing texts for the use of his students there was little opportunity for literary composition nevertheless during eighteen thirty three and eighteen thirty four longfellow began the publication of some travel sketches which in eighteen thirty five appeared in book form under the title of outre mer a pilgrimage beyond the sea this volume is a lesser sketchbook in the manner of irving without his skill in eighteen thirty four longfellow received a call from harvard college to follow the distinguished scholar george ticknor in the professorship of belles lettres which he was about to resign a second trip abroad followed the acceptance of this call longfellow was now accompanied by his wife he had married in eighteen thirty one miss mary potter of portland and in the autumn while they were in holland mrs longfellow died the loneliness and desolation of that experience are suggested in the opening pages of hyperion the setting of a great hope is like the setting of the sun the brightness of our life is gone Shadows of evening fall around us, and the world seems but a dim reflection, itself a broader shadow. We look forward into the coming lonely night. The soul withdraws into itself, then stars arise, and the night is holy. The poet hastened on to Heidelberg, and, like Paul Fleming, the hero of his romance, buried himself in books. 
For eighteen years, from 1836 to 1854, Longfellow retained his active connection with Harvard College, however exacting his duties, and there were times when they became irksome. He never slighted them. His students found him patient and gentle. His presence, equally with his instruction, was an inspiration. The poet's life is inseparably associated with the history of Harvard and of Cambridge. In the midst of a distinguished society, he became, as time went on, its most distinguished member. Soon after his arrival in Cambridge, Longfellow had taken rooms in the stately and historic mansion known as Craigie House, celebrated as having been the headquarters of General Washington, but now more famous as the poet's home. It remained his residence until his death. In 1839, Longfellow published two volumes, which commanded immediate recognition. The one, a prose romance, Hyperion, is more or less a record of the moods and thoughts associated with its author's sojourn in Germany and Switzerland, warmly colored by the sentiment of youth and by the imagination of a poet who is stirred by romantic regions and legend-haunted scenes the other a thin volume of verse entitled voices of the night contained a number of his earlier compositions together with eight new poems of genuine worth these were the impressive hymn to night beginning with its finely imaginative stanza i heard the trailing garments of the night sweep through her marble halls i saw her sable skirts all fringed with light from the celestial walls the psalm of life now so time-worn and so hackneyed that we treat it slightingly instead of submitting our imagination to the stirring appeal of its verse the reaper and the flowers the light of stars footsteps of angels flowers the beleaguered city and midnight mass for the dying year simple and melodious these poems quickly found their way into the poems and hearts of the people two years later a volume of ballads and other poems appeared and to the songs in the earlier group were added the now familiar skeleton in armor the wreck of the hesperus the village blacksmith the rainy day maidenhood and excelsior this last like the psalm of life a favorite mark for the arrow of the critic it is worth while in passing to note how many of these compositions have held their place in popularity and justified the first impression of their merit longfellow took little part in the political discussions of his day he was neither abolitionist nor transcendentalist nor did he like whittier or lowell employ his verse in the furtherance of any specific cause he did, however, on his return voyage after six months' stay in Europe in 1842, compose seven poems dealing with the subject of slavery, and these were published at the close of the year. They lack intensity of feeling and possess little artistic merit, but are interesting as the only utterance on this theme to which the poet gave public expression. In 1843 occurred the poet's marriage to Miss Frances Appleton, whom he had first met in Switzerland, seven years before. In the character of Mary Ashburton, she had figured in the romance Hyperion. In this year of his marriage was published the first of Longfellow's dramas, The Spanish Student. The next ten years were richly productive. Two collections were edited by Longfellow in 1845, one of which, The Poets and Poetry of Europe, contained numerous translations made by the poet then followed in eighteen forty six the volume entitled the belfry of bruges and other poems and in eighteen forty seven the first long narrative poem evangeline kavanagh a tale was completed in eighteen forty nine and a fresh volume of verse the seaside and the fireside appeared in eighteen fifty another dramatic work the Golden Legend, was finished in 1851. In 1854, Longfellow began working upon Hiawatha. The work was completed and published in 1855. 
of the two narrative poems it is necessary to speak in some detail the pathetic incident on which the story of evangeline is based was related first to hawthorne as a subject well suited to romance the novelist however made no use of the material thus obtained but willingly resigned the theme to longfellow who had shown a lively interest in the tale there was no question of the poet's success this beautiful idyll of the acadian exiles with its plaintive romance of evangeline's weary heart-breaking search for the lover so ruthlessly separated from his bride was immediately accepted as the crown of the poet's work and it is worthy of note that the poem was finished upon his fortieth birthday longfellow had chosen a peculiar meter for evangeline the use of hexameter verse had not been deemed consistent with the principles of english versification and had not been employed with marked success it had however been used by the german poet goethe with very pleasing effect in his pastoral poem Harman und dorothea and longfellow who had experimented slightly with the measure determined to use it here the poet was invariably happy in his choice of metrical forms the reader of his poems is inevitably struck with the appropriateness of the measure to the theme as dr holmes says in respect to the meter of evangeline the hexameter has often been criticized but i do not believe any other measure could have told that lovely story with such effect as we feel when carried along the tranquil current of these brimming slow-moving soul-satisfying lines the poet knows better than his critics the length of step which best befits his muse the second of these great compositions makes use of a distinctively native theme longfellow had for some time been attracted to the american indian as a subject and finally hit upon a plan for weaving together a number of the indian traditions in narrative form the finnish epic kalevala suggested an appropriate measure and in other ways served as a model for the poem which he wrote with intense enjoyment as in the case of evangeline the form selected proved remarkably apt to the treatment of this primitive theme the trochaic tetrameter using classic terminology and the employment of parallelism and repetition gave an elemental effect to the narrative that was both appropriate and rhythmically pleasing hiawatha is the epic of the red man and the romantic the heroic phase of indian nature has never been better presented considerable criticism greeted its appearance and there were many charges of plagiarism nevertheless the poem was immensely popular and is now generally regarded as the poet's most original and most satisfactory achievement the demands of the classroom had increased with the years and college duties became more and more irksome to the poet this college work is like a great hand laid on all the strings of my lyre stopping their vibrations he writes in his journal in eighteen fifty in eighteen fifty four longfellow resigned the professorship and gave himself wholly to his vocation as a poet following hiawatha his next important work was the delightful puritan pastoral the courtship of miles standish a bit of refreshing human comedy drawn from the sober annals of plymouth the poem was published in eighteen fifty eight three years later in eighteen sixty one the happiness and serenity of longfellow's life were suddenly broken by the shocking accident which caused the death of his wife sitting in the library of their home sealing some packages of their little daughter's curls mrs longfellow's dress caught fire she died the following day the deep grief of his loss the poet bore in silence after his death there was found in his portfolio the sonnet entitled the cross of snow written in eighteen seventy nine the single utterance of his grief in verse there is a mountain in the distant west that sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side 
such is the cross i wear upon my breast these eighteen years through all the changing scenes and seasons changeless since the day she died to occupy his mind and alleviate his sorrow the poet began a translation of dante upon this he worked at intervals for several years the divine comedy was completed in eighteen sixty seven it holds a place among the best versions of dante's work in english meanwhile the first part of tales of a wayside inn had appeared in eighteen sixty three in eighteen seventy two and eighteen seventy three the remaining parts were published in the spring of eighteen sixty eight mr longfellow went again to europe accompanied by his children the poet was everywhere accorded a royal welcome the universities of oxford and cambridge honored him with their degrees and queen victoria received him as her guest at windsor the winter was spent in florence and rome and after again visiting england the party returned home in the fall longfellow's most ambitious but not most successful dramatic work christus a mystery which includes the divine tragedy the golden legend and the new england tragedies was published complete in 1872 the mask of pandora and other poems in 1875 Geramos and other poems in 1878 ultima thule in 1880 and in the harbor in 1882 michael angelo a fragment did not appear until 1884 the most notable among these later compositions was the morituri salatanus written for the fiftieth anniversary of the famous class at bodoin longfellow's last years can hardly be termed declining years his health continued vigorous his spirit was cheerful his house remained a centre of sociability his children married and established their homes around him outside the circle of distinguished men in cambridge and boston who cherished his friendship he might well have called all his countrymen his friends for no american man of letters was ever so widely beloved his popularity indeed had its drawbacks it was sometimes amusing and often annoying to the poet this insistent pressure of friendly feeling his time and strength were absorbed by well-meaning but inconsiderate visitors whose only errand was to express their admiration requests for autographs were numberless in one day longfellow wrote sealed and directed seventy replies one ingenious lady in ohio sent him a hundred cards with the request that he would write his name on each that she might distribute them among her guests at a party which she was to give upon the poet's birthday no account of longfellow's personality would be complete without reference to his love for children his relation to them was singularly intimate and tender among his sweetest poems are those which treat of childhood it was no perfunctory greeting that he uttered come to me o ye children and whisper in my ear what the birds and the winds are singing in your sunny atmosphere for what are all our contrivings and the wisdom of our books when compared with your caresses and the gladness of your looks ye are better than all the ballads that ever were sung or said for ye are living poems and all the rest are dead and the children came to him on his seventy-second birthday they brought him the famous chair made from the wood of the spreading chestnut tree which had shaded the doorway of the village smith they continued to come collectively and individually for the warm-hearted poet gave orders that no child who wished to see the chair should be excluded and the muddy print of many a little shoe was left on the floor of the hall in craigie house longfellow's seventy-fifth birthday was celebrated in the public schools throughout the land his last visitors were four boston schoolboys who had asked permission to call whom the poet received with accustomed kindliness that night he had a sudden attack of illness and six days later march twenty fourth eighteen eighty two 
he died. His last poem, The Bells of San Blas, was written a few days before his death. One finds a touch of prophecy in the closing lines, the last verses that he wrote. Out of the shadows of night the world rolls into light. It is daybreak everywhere. Among the many tributes to the memory of the poet, there was none quite so touching, none more apt, than the comment made by Emerson at Longfellow's funeral. He was then within a month of his own departure. His memory was shattered, and he showed all the weakness of his pathetic decline. Gazing intently upon the face of the dead poet, he turned to a friend and said, That gentleman was a sweet, beautiful soul, but I have entirely forgotten his name. Longfellow's name is safe, and the many thousands who still read and love his poems continue to recognize therein the sweet, beautiful soul of the poet. His body lies in Mount Auburn, the resting place of many famous contemporaries. The qualities which especially mark the poetry of Longfellow are simplicity of style, beautiful imagery, moral earnestness, and narrative power. So simple is this poet that many critics pronounce him commonplace. Unquestionably, he possessed what may be termed the common mind. He was not a profound thinker, not one of the bards sublime. He spoke out of the common experience of life, and it was this, in large degree, which gave him the comprehension and affection of the common people. We must remember, also, that when we dwell upon the commonplaceness or the triteness of Longfellow's sentiment, we are often emphasizing the fact that the verse of our criticism has become worn by our own use. Longfellow shared generously in the gift bestowed on all poets, the sense of beauty and the power of figurative expression. Not at all like the magical art of Poe, Longfellow's art, impassionate, quiet, restrained, often pensive, sometimes melancholy, never morbid, is equally distinctive and equally true. He, too, had a rare felicity of phrase which gave artistic setting to his figures. The following passages are characteristic illustrations of his simple but effective imagery. From the cool cisterns of the midnight air my spirit drank repose. She struck where the white and fleecy waves looked soft as carded wool, but the cruel rocks, they gored her side like the horns of an angry bull. Silently, one by one, in the infinite meadows of heaven, blossomed the lovely stars, the forget-me-nots of the angels. Life had long been astir in the village, and clamorous labor knocked with its hundred hands at the golden gates of the morning. For age is opportunity no less than youth itself, though in another dress, and as the evening twilight fades away, the sky is filled with stars, invisible by day. Like Bryant, Longfellow is usually impressed by the lesson in the thing he sees, and often tags his poem with a moral that is obvious enough to be left unformulated. Yet the happy expression of these wise observations is far from unattractive to the average American reader, and through them he won his way to the hearts of many. Of this didactic tendency we may take as familiar examples a psalm of life and the rainy day, in which the moral lesson is the main purpose of each. In the village blacksmith we are reminded of Wordsworth's manner. Thanks, thanks to thee, my worthy friend, for the lesson thou hast taught. It is as a writer of narrative poems that Longfellow attains his chief distinction. No other American poet compares with him in this field. Not only the three long poems which deal with themes of national interest, but also the twenty-two tales of the Wayside Inn series and the numerous ballads like The Skeleton in Armor, The Wreck of the Hesperus, King Wickliffe's Drinking Horn, and The Discoverer of the North Cape must be taken in account. Not all are of equal merit. The tales of a wayside inn 
attain a varying degree of success, but this body of narrative poems as a whole proves the poet to have been a master of the storytelling art. As a lyric poet, Longfellow ranks with the best. Many of his poems are songs. We think at once of The Rainy Day, The Bridge, The Day is Done, Curfew, Stars of the Summer Night, Resignation, Sandalfon, The Children, The Children's Hour, and many more. With the sonnet, too, Longfellow was eminently successful. Those addressed to Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, and Keats are among his best. The poetical dramas are inferior as a group to the lyric and narrative poems. In The Spanish Student and The Golden Legend, his imagination is freer and stronger than in the other dramas, and the dramatic poem, Michael Angelo, shows the poet's creative power in its highest development. Longfellow's intimate acquaintance with the literatures of Europe and the influence of professional study are shown in the large number of facile translations from Scandinavian, German, French, Italian, and Spanish poets. They are marked by insight, sympathy, and felicity of interpretation, and form no unimportant portion of his work. It is unfair and ill-considered to cite these productions as proof of the poet's lack of originality, as is sometimes done. The translator of The Castle by the Sea and The Song of the Silent Land is a poetical benefactor indeed. It is not altogether to his varied and rich accomplishment in verse that Longfellow's place in the affection of all Americans is due. It was the charm of his personality that confirmed it. He appeared to be one among his countrymen, not above them. Calm in spirit, gentle in utterance, benignant, modest. The people saw in him the embodiment of the beautiful ideal he taught. They admired him as a poet. They trusted and revered him as a man. They accepted him as a teacher. They crowned him poet laureate of the home. To English readers, also, he became endeared. In 1884, a bust of Longfellow was placed with appropriate honors in the poet's corner, Westminster Abbey. It was the first time that an American man of letters had been commemorated in this place of high memorial. We have seen that the poetry of Poe found great favor among the Latin peoples of Europe. Longfellow's poems have enjoyed as wide, if not wider, popularity abroad. There is an anecdote which gives a remarkable illustration of this fact. It is said that on a French steamer, Sailing from Constantinople to Marseille, a Russian, an Englishman, a Scotchman, a Frenchman, a Greek, and an American vied with one another in quotations from our poet. In America, certainly, Longfellow is still the poet of the people. It is an interesting fact that in the great printing establishment of Longfellow's publishers at Cambridge there is always some edition of the poet in the press. His poems are printing continuously every working day in the year. Of the prose works of Longfellow, Hyperion will be found most interesting. Selections from the poems should include representative compositions in the various groups described in the text. The poetry of Longfellow is so familiar that particular directions are unnecessary. Hugh Mifflin Company published the only complete editions of Longfellow's works. The Cambridge edition of the poems in one volume is complete, and its bibliographical notes are admirable. In the Riverside Literature series, The Courtship of Miles Standish, Evangeline, Hiawatha, Tales of a Wayside Inn are printed in separate numbers. The Life of Longfellow, three volumes, by his brother Samuel Longfellow, is the standard biography. The Longfellow in the American Men of Letters series is by T. W. Higginson. That in the Great Writers series is by E. S. Robertson. The best brief biography is that by G. R. Carpenter in the Beacon Biographies. Mrs. Annie Fields in Authors and Friends, Edward Everett Hale in Fireside Travels, Cambridge, 
thirty years ago, and W. D. Howells, in My Literary Friends and Acquaintance, have written interesting reminiscences of the poet. Valuable studies of Longfellow are to be found in Richardson's American Literature, Volume Two, Stedman's Poets of America, Trent's History of American Literature, Wendell's Literary History of America, and Vincent's American Literary Masters. An interesting book of reference is The Wayside Inn, Its History and Literature, by S. A. Bent. A delightful essay upon Longfellow is found in the Literary and Social Essays by G. W. Curtis. Most noteworthy among the publications inspired by the 100th anniversary of Longfellow's birth are The Henry Wadsworth Longfellow by Charles Eliot Norton, Houghton Mifflin Company, The Centenary of Longfellow, Atlantic Monthly, March 1907, by Bliss Perry, and The Critical Article in the North American Review, March 1907, by W. D. Howells. End of part one of chapter five. Part two of chapter five of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter five, part two. John Greenleaf Whittier, 1807-1862 December 17, 1807, the year in which Longfellow was born, occurred the birth of John Greenleaf Whittier, second in this group of New England poets, and one whose memory stands next to that of Longfellow in the affection and reverence of the American people. Unlike Longfellow, Hawthorne, and Emerson, Whittier was neither city-born nor college-bred. In his preparation for life, the academic element was entirely lacking. He was a country boy of the genuine New England stock. For one hundred and sixty years his stalwart ancestors had cultivated the Whittier farm, and the very house in which he was born had been built by the great-great-grandfather of the poet in 1688. The birthplace of Whittier lies a few miles from the busy little city of Haverhill in the northeast corner of Massachusetts. It was, and is, a pleasant region, rather lonely, not so ruggedly romantic as that in which young Bryant learned to commune with nature, yet full of pastoral beauty. Our old homestead nestled under a long range of hills, says Whittier. It was surrounded by woods in all directions, save to the southeast where a break in the leafy wall revealed a vista of low green meadows, picturesque with wooded islands and jutting capes of upland. Through these a small brook, noisy enough as it foamed, rippled and laughed down its rocky falls by our garden side, wound silently and scarcely visible to a still larger stream, known as the Country Brook. This brook, in its turn, after doing duty at two or three saw and grist mills, the clack of which we could hear in still days across the intervening woodlands, found its way to the great river, and the river took up and bore it down to the great sea. The great river was the Merrimack, down which Thoreau made his interesting expedition. It was not far to the beaches of Salisbury, Rye, and Hampton, where the poet pitched his imaginary tent with a great stretch of salt marsh to the westward, the limitless reach of the ocean in the foreground, the high bluff of Great Boar's Head to the north, and to the south the broad mouth of the Merrimack, with the ancient town of Newburyport just beyond. With these localities, Whittier has made his readers familiar. If one would catch a glimpse of Whittier's boyhood, he will find it sketched in The Barefoot Boy. If he would know the spirit of the household, he may find it in Snowbound. The farm itself was not a very profitable one. It was encumbered with debt, and strict economy was the law. Yet it was a comfortable home, and the picture it left in the poet's memory is an inviting one. 
the old rude furnished room with its whitewashed wall and sagging beam its motley braided mat upon the floor and its ample fireplace ruddy with the flame of crackling logs was a scene of contentment and homely cheer shut in from all the world without we sat the clean-winged hearth about content to let the north wind roar in baffled rage at pain and door while the red logs before us beat the frost lined back with tropic heat and for the winter fireside meet between the andirons straddling feet the mug of cider simmered slow the apples sputtered in a row and close at hand the basket stood with nuts from brown october's wood what matter how the night behaved what matter how the north wind raved blow high blow low not all its snow could quench our hearth fire's ruddy glow here the winter evenings were passed with story-telling or talk of guest or poring over one of the scanty volumes perhaps the almanac or the poems of the quaker elwood or the journal of john woolman or the one harmless novel mostly hid from younger eyes a volume of scott read privily but one bright day the district schoolmaster brought a copy of robert burns into the country home and read aloud the songs of scotland's peasant poet the new england farmer's son then fourteen listened with delight and felt his own soul kindled with poetic fire he began to write rhymes of his own and the verses were passed about and admired he borrowed all the books that were available especially poems one of his first purchases was a copy of shakespeare's plays his parents were devout quakers and it was natural enough that oftener than any other volume the bible was in his hands meanwhile the youth was working hard at plough and scythe steadily employed in the severe manual labor of the farm district school he attended during the twelve weeks session every winter whittier's father was a subscriber to the free press a weekly paper which young william lloyd garrison was then editing at newburyport and to this publication mary whittier a sister two years older than the youthful poet sent anonymously one of his early compositions it was printed by the editor and one day when the eighteen-year-old lad was mending fences the postman tossed him the weekly paper with his verses in the poet's corner whittier could hardly believe his eyes he stood dazed reading the lines scarcely comprehending the fact that one of his poems was actually in print it was not long thereafter that garrison himself drove over to have a look at his new contributor and the lifelong friendship of these two men was begun the visitor urged mr whittier not to discourage the literary ambitions of his son and advised that the youth be given an education while not indifferent to his son's desires mr whittier was a hard-headed hard-working practical man upon whom the necessity of a livelihood pressed heavily true to the poet's characterization of him in snowbound a prompt decisive man no breath our father wasted his terse response to this appeal was sir poetry will not give him bread but whittier yearned for an education his health was delicate indeed it had already suffered from the hard labor of the farm and it was evident that his physique could not endure the heavy demands of the agricultural life it was not long after garrison's visit therefore that young whittier obtained his father's consent to his attendance at the academy in haverhill provided that he could earn the means so the farm boy learned how to make slippers and labored at the shoemaker's bench thus he paid his tuition for a six months term in the haverhill school the next winter he taught in the country district and earned sufficient funds to secure another term at the academy this was the extent of whittier's scholastic training a college course he was compelled to renounce for lack of funds and a disinclination to accept assistance unearned he had read a surprising number of books sometimes walking miles to secure a coveted volume had written a great deal of verse and was locally known as a poet 
He even planned to publish an edition of his poems, but the project failed. Under the circumstances, Whittier was fortunate in the opportunities which now offered for a career. In 1829, he became editor of a journal published in Boston called The American Manufacturer, which supported the idea of a protective tariff and also contained literary matter. The position carried no particular distinction with it, and the salary was only nine dollars a week, but it served as a good school for a young writer. Whittier wrote regularly for his paper, both prose and verse, yet had considerable leisure for reading and making acquaintance with the world. In August, his father's illness called him home, and he was kept busy in the management of the farm until his father's death. Early in 1830, he became editor of the Haverhill Gazette. This engagement continued for six months, when he assumed editorial charge of the New England Review, published in Hartford. That the young Quaker of Haverhill had already made some impression by his personality, as well as by his pen, is evident from the introduction now given him by George D. Prentice, the retiring editor of the Review. I cannot do less than congratulate my readers said prentice on the prospect of their more familiar acquaintance with a gentleman of such powerful energies and such exalted purity and sweetness of character i have made some enemies among those whose good opinion i value but no rational man can ever be the enemy of mr whittier for a year and a half whittier retained this position developing rapidly in power and in professional reputation he gave his support to henry clay and upheld the principle of the tariff whittier also enjoyed the society of the literary people more or less noted who made their home in hartford among the members of this interesting group were the poets james g percival and mrs lydia sigourney whose writings were at this time widely read and admired it was in hartford that whittier in eighteen thirty one published his first book Legends of New England, a volume of rather crude sketches, including some verse. They had already appeared in the New England magazine. These legends were not thought by Whittier worthy of permanent place in his prose works, and the same judgment was placed by him on most of his early experiments in fictitious narrative. Of his poems, written previous to 1833, there are few which have survived. The spirited Song of the Vermonters, a product of his school days, the Valdois teacher, and the Star of Bethlehem are selected by Professor Carpenter as the only ones of poetic value. From 1832 to 1836, Whittier was again upon the farm, struggling to make a living for his mother, his sister, his aunt, who lived with them, and himself. We may recall the situation at this period of, of the other writers whose lives have been already noted. It was in 1832 that Emerson resigned his pastorate in Boston and retired to Concord. Poe, recently discharged from West Point, was in Baltimore trying to support himself by hack work for the magazines. Hawthorne was dreaming in the seclusion of his hermit-like existence in Salem. Longfellow was now settled in his professorship at Bowdoin. Bryant, of course, representative of the earlier generation, had emerged from his period of struggle and had been for three years editor of the Post. For Whittier, now in his twenty-fifth year, the future was full of uncertainty. Politics seemed to offer the only field of promise, but this field he hesitated to enter. As he wrote to Mrs. Sigourney, there is something inconsistent in the character of a poet and a modern politician. A year later, he wrote to the same correspondent, Of poetry I have nearly taken my leave, and a pen is getting to be something of a stranger to me. I have been compelled again to plunge into the political whirlpool, for I have found that my political reputation is more influential than my poetical. But in 1833, Whittier's vocation was made clear. It was the turning point in his life. The poet found inspiration in an unexpected theme. The anti-slavery movement, which five years earlier had enlisted the extreme energies of the radical and lion-hearted garrison, 
had already appealed to the humanitarian spirit of Whittier. He was as strong an idealist as any transcendentalist of Boston or Concord, and could not be otherwise than strongly sympathetic with the ultimate purpose of the movement. At twenty-six, therefore, the poet allied himself for better or for worse with the abolitionists. For twenty-seven years, Whittier was one of the foremost among those identified with this cause. He was a delegate to the first National Anti-Slavery Convention at Philadelphia in 1833, and signed its declaration. Two years later, he was mobbed in Concord, New Hampshire, while traveling with an anti-slavery agitator. He was threatened in Boston. In 1838, he took charge of the organ of the society, the Pennsylvania Freeman published in Philadelphia, and again encountered a mob which sacked and burned his office. Throughout this turbulent experience, his courage and zeal knew no limit. The shy and gentle Quaker had become the fearless advocate of an unpopular crusade. In 1833, he published at his own expense a pamphlet, Justice and Expediency, which exerted a wide influence. The verses which he wrote rang like the voices of a trumpet, through the land. Randolph of Roanoke, Massachusetts to Virginia, to Faneuil Hall, the slave ships, the hunter of men, clerical oppressors, the pastoral letter, these poems illustrate various phases of the poet's utterance during these momentous years. When we compare Whittier's Voices of Freedom, 1846, with Longfellow's Poems on Slavery, 1842, we feel at once the difference in the spirit of the two men in this matter. Longfellow's verses are literary. Whittier's are the vehement utterances of emotion and conviction. They were written, said the poet, with no expectation that they would survive the occasions which called them forth. They were protests, alarm signals, trumpet calls to action, words wrung from the writer's heart, forged at white heat, and of course lacking the finish and careful word selection which reflection and patient brooding over them might have given. Such as they are, they belong to the history of the anti-slavery movement, and may serve as waymarks of its progress. It is interesting to see how loyal Whittier remained to the ideals and inspirations of this period, the distinctive epoch in his life. The simple fact is, he wrote to E. L. Godkin, that I cannot be sufficiently grateful to the divine providence that so early called my attention to the great interests of humanity, saving me from the poor ambitions and miserable jealousies of a selfish pursuit of literary reputation. The poet himself never regretted the fact that this alliance had placed these limitations upon his verse. He rather saw it in the real inspiration of his life, the true birth of poetical power. My lad, if thee would win success, join thyself to some unpopular but noble cause, said he in after years to a youth who came to him for counsel. In 1835, Mr. Whittier was elected as representative in the Massachusetts legislature, and at the close of the term was re-elected, but ill health prevented further service. In 1836, the homestead at East Haverhill was sold, and the adjoining town of Amesbury became the poet's residence, his mother and his younger sister, Elizabeth, making his home. For a time, he was again associated with one or another local newspaper, and from 1847 to 1860, he was corresponding editor of The New Era, published in Washington, the mouthpiece of the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. It was in this paper that a number of Whittier's poems were first printed, including Ichabod, 1850, that most effective utterance of scorn and grief, inspired by the 7th of March speech of Daniel Webster. But meanwhile, Whittier's pen had not been employed exclusively on writings for the cause. In 1836, his narrative poem, Mog Megon had been published, afterward a thorn in the poet's flesh, for to his mature taste it did not appear deserving of a permanent place in his works. He said that it reminded him of 
a big Indian in his war paint, strutting about in Sir Walter Scott's plaid. In 1843, Whittier published Lays of My Home. The Songs of Labor appeared in 1850. The Chapel of the Hermits and Other Poems in 1853. The Panorama and Other Poems in 1856. And Home Ballads in 1860. In these collections, Whittier was taking his position as distinctively the poet of New England. Here are nature poems. Hampton Beach, Lakeside, and Summer by the Lakeside, April, and the Last Walk in Autumn. Narrative poems embodying Old New England legends. Cassandra Southwick, Skipper Ireson's Ride, and the Garrison of Cape Ann. Idols of the Farm. Maud Muller, The Barefoot Boy, and in deeper vein, the exquisite ballad, Telling the Bees, quaintly reminiscent of the New England setting, like the rest. Here, too, we find the strongly personal poems, My Psalm, Memories, and My Playmate. While Whittier's prose works have never attracted much attention, we may note the publication during this period of the following volumes. The Stranger in Lowell, 1845, a series of sketches written while the writer was editing for a brief period a newspaper in the city named. The Supernaturalism of New England, 1847, leaves from Margaret Smith's journal, 1849, an attractive study of life in the Massachusetts Bay province, realistically presented and worthy of a wider reading. Old Portraits and Modern Sketches, 1850, and Literary Recreations and Miscellanies, 1854, both volumes made up of essays and studies which had appeared in the era. During the years of Civil War, Whittier published two volumes, In Wartime, 1864, and National Lyrics, 1865, which included the poems inspired by the events of this exciting period. Like the earlier songs born of the movement against slavery, these compositions lack art and finish. They were written in the ardor of conflict and sent immediately into print without the opportunity to meditate and correct. Waiting and The Watchers are among the best of these war lyrics, while in Barbara Fritchie the poet produced what is often described as the finest ballad of the struggle, although the story told in the poem is now discredited. Laos Dale the most stirring of these lyrics, has an interesting history. It was composed while the poet was sitting in the Friends' Meeting House in Amesbury at the regular fifth-day meeting, listening to the bells of jubilation which announced the passage of the Constitutional Amendment abolishing slavery, January 31, 1865. It is done. Clang of bell and roar of gun. Send the tidings up and down. All sat in silence, but on his return to his home, he recited a portion of the poem, not yet committed to paper, to his housemates in the garden room. It wrote itself, rather sang itself, while the bells rang, he wrote to Lucy Larcom. In 1866, Whittier published his masterpiece, Snowbound, A Winter Idol. This beautiful poem is a thoroughly realistic picture of the farm in the grasp of a New England winter. The family circle grouped in homely comfort about the roaring fireplace is that of the poet's own frugal home, but it is typical of rural life in the New England of the sixties, and the portraits are representative of the sturdy class to which the poet's family belonged. Snowbound takes its legitimate place beside Goldsmith's Deserted Village, and Burns, The Cotter's Saturday Night. In Whittier's poems, the personal element is strong. The devoted sister, Elizabeth, our youngest and our dearest, had died in 1864. Perhaps it was this event which had stirred the poet's memories of childhood. Certainly it was the inspiration of the tenderest passage in the poem. Snowbound, brought its author his first substantial pecuniary returns. The sales were very large. From the first edition, he received $10,000, and the financial burden of many years was permanently removed. <laughs> 
The large success of Snowbound was repeated a twelvemonth later, when the collection of narrative poems entitled The Tent on the Beach appeared in the Atlantic Monthly. When the latter poems were published in book form, they began to sell at the rate of a thousand copies a day. This will never do, wrote the poet in humorous self-depreciation to his publisher, James T. Fields. The swindle is awful. Barnum is a saint to us. The comrades of the beach were the poet himself, Mr. James T. Fields, and the noted traveler as well as all-around man of letters, Bayard Taylor. The poems thus grouped in the manner of Longfellow's Tales of a Wayside Inn, 1863, are somber in tone, sad stories of ill-fated ships and legends of the days of delusion. No one of them has gained a strong hold on popular favor. The descriptions of the sea and the familiar portrait of the poet. And one there was a dreamer born, who, with a mission to fulfill, had left the muse's haunts to turn the crank of an opinion mill. These are the happiest touches in the work. Successive volumes of his verse continue to appear at frequent intervals during the remainder of Whittier's life. He was an old man in his eighty-fifth year, universally venerated when the final volume was published. During these latter years, the poet lived a retired and peaceful life, impelled thereto by delicate health and the natural shyness of his disposition. Yet he never lost interest in public affairs or his active sympathy with the ultimate results of that cause which had enlisted his energies in youth. The education of the freedmen in the South, the assistance of individuals who had made their way to the North, were matters of vital interest to him. He continued to make his home in Amesbury, but visited with friends in Hampton Falls or with relatives at Oak Knoll in Danvers. There was a quiet corner in the White Mountains where he loved to sojourn for a few weeks in the heat of summer, and the artistic home of Celia Thaxter at the Isles of Shoals was also a favorite retreat. Whittier was the only one of this group of New England writers who never went abroad. Indeed, after the poet settled in the home at Amesbury, he seldom ventured far from his own fireside. The society of his kindred and of a few intimate friends he dearly loved, but he was too diffident to enjoy large companies, and he shrank from all publicity. The farmer of East Haverhill was most at home with common folks, understanding them perfectly and talking with them in a language they could understand. He used the pronoun the, the Quaker form of address, and always remained heartily loyal to the simple manners of the friends. The militant spirit of his anti-slavery poems wholly disappeared with the war, and only gentleness, universal good will, and a beautiful simplicity of religious faith characterized his later verse. The popularity of Whittier increased among all classes of readers. His birthday, like that of Longfellow, was observed with noteworthy tributes of esteem. Upon his eightieth anniversary, the governor of Massachusetts, with other distinguished citizens, visited the poet at Oak Knoll to present the congratulations of his native state. Upon one of these anniversary occasions, Whittier was deeply touched by a telegram sent by the Southern Forestry Congress, assembled in Florida. In remembrance of your birthday, we have planted a live oak tree to your memory, which, like the leaves of the tree, will be forever green. Together with his gentle dignity of bearing and his modest shyness of manner, Whittier possessed a keen sense of humor, and had a homely wit that flashed out in conversation with his friends. Among these there were a number of distinguished women. Mrs. Stowe, Lucy Larkham, Alice and Phoebe Carey, Sarah Orne Jewett, Celia Thaxter, and Mrs. James T. Fields. With Longfellow, Emerson, and Holmes, Whittier had a pleasant but not an intimate acquaintance. In personal appearance, the poet was tall and spare. His eyes were unusually brilliant, large and dark. His smile was wonderfully benignant. Although he suffered much from ill health, he was patient, cheerful, and sweet-tempered. 
His final illness was brief. He died at Hampton, September 7th, 1892. Almost his last words were, Love, love to all the world. The funeral services were held in the little garden of the home at Amesbury, and the poet was buried in the village cemetery in the family lot. In comparison with our other American poets, Whittier must be recognized as essentially provincial. Aside from the fact that a large body of his verse, the anti-slavery poems, was necessarily of temporary value, we must remember also that the best portion of his work belongs wholly to New England. It is nevertheless true that while this circumstance places a limitation upon its scope, it does not detract from the strength and value of his poetry. While the poet has never received, like Longfellow and Poe, the recognition of other peoples than our own, this restriction of his field, with the fidelity and vividness of his interpretation, is precisely what gives to Whittier his chief distinction here at home. Nor was he, in the larger sense, a great poet. No one recognized the technical faults of his verse more frankly than Whittier himself. I should be hung from my bad rhymes anywhere south of Mason and Dixon's line, he wrote to Mr. Fields. That he did not hold a place with the men of profound insight, the seers, he knew equally well. His own modest estimate of his poetic gifts he has expressed in stanzas of unusual beauty, which to some extent are themselves a contradiction of the statement. The rigor of a frozen clime, the harshness of an untaught ear, the jarring words of one whose rhyme beat often labors, hurried time, or duty's rugged march through storm and strife, are here. Of mystic beauty, dreamy grace, no rounded art the lack supplies, unskilled the subtle lines to trace, or softer shades of nature's face. I view her common forms with unanointed eyes. Nor mine the seer-like power to show the secrets of the heart and mind, to drop the plummet line below our common world of joy and woe, a more intense despair or brighter hope to find. The fine artistic taste of Longfellow Whittier lacked, as he lacked the culture of broad reading and of travel, but he possessed the genuine love of nature and humanity. He had the virility of a strong character, free from all artificiality, the ardor of the truest patriotism, and, at the outset of his career, the inestimable advantage of consecration to an uplifting cause. The student will read, of course, the more noted of the anti-slavery poems, including those mentioned in the preceding paragraphs. The shoemakers and the huskers will serve as good examples of the songs of labor. The group of personal poems contains Ichabod and the Lost Occasion, the two impressive compositions based upon the career of Daniel Webster, and also noteworthy tributes to his friends and associates, Garrison and Sumner. Here, likewise, are interesting verses inscribed to fellow poets, Bryant, Halleck, Bayard Taylor, Longfellow, the poet and the children, Lowell, and Holmes. Most happy of all, the poem entitled Burns. Among the narratives and legendary poems are some of the most familiar of Whittier's compositions. The Vaudois Teacher, Barclay of Uri, one of several which deal with Quaker themes, The Angels of Buena Vista, Maud Muller, Skipper, Ireson's Ride, Telling the Bees, My Playmate, and Among the Hills. The poems of nature deserve some study in detail, and should be compared with those of Longfellow and Bryant. Here we find descriptive passages of simple yet compelling beauty. Such is this stanza from Sunset on the Bear Camp. Touched by a light that hath no name, a glory never sung, aloft on sky and mountain wall are God's great pictures hung. How changed the summits vast and old, no longer granite Browed, they melt in rosy mist. The rock is softer than the cloud. The valley holds its breath. No leaf of all its elms is twirled 
the silence of eternity seems falling on the world the following afford good illustrations of the poet's descriptive power april summer by the lakeside the last walk in autumn the river path and the trailing arbutus it will be quickly noted that whittier is always the subjective the reflective poet that like bryant he reads a lesson in the scene thus when wandering in the dusk of twilight along the river path he comes upon a sudden opening in the hills through whose green gates streams the long slant splendor of the setting sun bridging the shaded stream with gold he thinks of the river of death the river dark and prays so let the hills of doubt divide so bridge with faith the sunless tide and when under dead boughs amid dry leaves and moss he finds the perfumed arbutus he says as pausing o'er the lonely flower i bent i thought of lives thus lowly clogged and pent which yet find room through care and cumber coldness and decay to lend a sweetness to the ungenial day and make the sad earth happier for their bloom of the religious poems one stands forth preeminent no other american poem has ever touched with its message of trustfulness the hearts of devout christians more universally than the eternal goodness i know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air i only know i cannot drift beyond his love and care the poem our master is also full of the deep religious feeling so characteristic of the quaker poet and from its stanzas have been arranged five of whittier's best-known hymns special attention should be given to a few of the poems classified as subjective and reminiscent here we find the barefoot boy in school days and memories poems which besides affording intimate glimpses of the poet's child life are to be recognized as among his best compositions to these must finally be added snowbound most intimately personal of all his works and yet artistically his masterpiece the more this little classic is read the more its reader is impressed with its simple strength and beauty the apt phrasing the vivid portraiture the happy touch of local coloring the easy movement of its simple measures its idyllic atmosphere of domestic affection of serene and untroubled faith these are the qualities which give the poem its place with the best in our literature the complete works of whittier are published in seven volumes by houghton mifflin company also the cambridge edition of the poems in one volume snowbound and the tent on the beach together with other poems are published in two numbers of the riverside literature series the life and letters of john g whittier two volumes by samuel t pickard is the standard biography the best brief biography is the whittier in the american men of letters series by g r carpenter the little book whittier notes of his life and of his friendships by mrs annie fields is a charming study of the man whittier land by s t pickard is also valuable in criticism consult stedman's poets of america vincent's american literary masters and the histories of american literature by richardson and trent john greenleaf whittier by bliss perry a brief study of the poet and whittier for today by the same writer in the atlantic monthly for december nineteen o seven are appreciative memorials of the hundredth anniversary of the poet's birth end of part two of chapter five